arrested on suspicion of using a counterfeit bill. Bystanders filmed that incident, showing then-officer Chauvin pinning George Floyd beneath him. Everyone knows that video kneeling on his neck for what prosecutors say was nearly nine and a half minutes. Chauvin and three other officers involved in the incident were fired from the department. The outrage that followed George Floyd's death, I don't have to tell you, ignited nationwide, even global racial unrest, protests over police use of force. In the past three weeks, the jury has heard from a total of 45 witnesses, with the most crucial testimony really coming from those at odds over exactly what caused George Floyd's death, if drugs were a factor, and if Jer Derek Chauvin violated policy with his actions that day. Now the prosecution and defense have one last chance to make their case before jurors are sequestered for deliberations. So those closing arguments are set to begin shortly. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has been following the trial all along. He joins us from outside the Hennepin County Courthouse. Those closing arguments, Gabe, set to get underway very soon. Uh, yeah, that's right, Kate. And this is a city on edge. Behind me, you can see this military, military vehicle that has been here for weeks. Now, more and more National Guard troops have been seen in and around Minneapolis. Some 300,000 troops have been activated in this region, some sooner than expected because of the shooting uh, nearby just a few days ago in Brooklyn Center. Now, all eyes are on the courthouse behind me, though, because in just a few minutes, closing arguments are set to begin. We're expecting the prosecution to get its closing arguments, potentially play some short video clips, and ask jurors, as they did during opening statements, to believe their eyes. The prosecution saying that George Floyd died due to the actions of Derek Chauvin. Now, the defense is expected to come after. The defense has been arguing during this trial and calling seven witnesses to do so that George Floyd died from a variety of factors, not Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck, but rather uh, underlying health conditions as well as drug use and that the officers were distracted by bystanders at the scene. After the defense give its closing arguments uh, today, Kate, then the prosecution is expected to give a rebuttal and then the judge will give the jury its instructions. As you mentioned, Chauvin facing three charges. It's possible, Kate, that the jury could get the case within the next few hours and then jurors will be sequestered. Kate. Yeah, Gabe, thank you. I know you've been reporting that this could all happen very quickly this morning or not. We just don't know. NBC News legal analyst Joyce Vance is a former U.S. attorney. She's a professor at the University of Alabama School of Law and also an NBC News contributor. Let me go to you next about the prosecution. We mentioned all the witnesses. When you look at the split, the prosecution called 38 of those witnesses and set up a pretty dramatic case. What do you think they need to do today? So we won't see high drama here. This won't be like television closings. The prosecution needs to be good technicians of the evidence today. This is their chance to remind the jury of all of the evidence, to encourage them to not be led astray as the defense tries to single out individual pieces of evidence and argue that that one piece of evidence might be weak, and to tell the jury that if they look at all of the evidence as a whole, from the early witnesses on the scene, the bystanders, to the medical experts that this is a rock solid case uh, of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And of course, the jury will consider three charges, murder second degree, murder third degree, and manslaughter in the second degree. I suspect the prosecution is really focusing on, on murder three here, but police cases are tough to convict in. Any conviction here will, will be a, a victory for justice. Joyce, just quickly on that, for those who haven't followed this so intimately, can you explain there are these three charges and potentially the jury could find individually guilt on e any or all of those charges or none, right? That's right. It's a little bit confusing. The judge will ask the jury to consider each of the three charges separately and return a separate uh, verdict. So they could convict, acquit, or what's called hanging, be unable to reach a, a unanimous decision on each of those three charges. All right, Joyce Vance, stay with us. Thank you. Let's turn to criminal defense attorney and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savallo, who's with us as well. Danny, the defense didn't call quite as many witnesses. What did they need to do to convince at least one juror that there's reasonable doubt? 
The defense routinely will not call as many witnesses. There are many defense attorneys, me included, who have simply rested their case after the prosecution rests, calling no witnesses or evidence at all. And the reason for that is that the burden is always with the prosecution. It never changes. It stays with them throughout the case. And the defendant, my client, is cloaked in the presumption of innocence. And that's why you typically see a prosecution uh, sometimes engage in overkill, but often put on as many witnesses as they can without being cumulative, and the defense putting on less witnesses so that they don't do anything to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory if they're already ahead. Now, strategy-wise, what the defense needs to do is push its two major themes. Number one, causation. The neck compression and subdual restraint did not cause uh, George Floyd's death. It was his poor health. It was his methamphetamine use and his fentanyl use. Uh, and central to that is going to be the testimony of Dr. Baker. Yes, that was the prosecution's witness, but he had some good tidbits for the defense to seize upon. Yeah, it, then you move on to the, uh, the restraint itself. Was it justified? The defense needs to push that. They need to argue not only was it justified, it was certainly not a felony. It was not imminently dangerous because, they will argue, it was taught to police. It's something that, yes, you may have heard Chauvin's colleagues say, well, we don't like what we saw, but we called an expert that said this is something that was acceptable given the situation at that time and looking at all circumstances contextually. All right, Danny, stay with us as well. I, I want to bring in Eugene Robinson in a moment just to, to reset where we are right now. We're waiting uh, for this courtroom in Minneapolis, Hennepin County, to begin closing arguments today in the trial of Derek Chauvin. As we wait, let's bring in Washington Post columnist, NBC News political analyst Eugene Robinson. Eugene, I, I look at an op-ed that you wrote recently. You titled it Chauvin's Despicable Defense. Uh, you, you clearly you have a stance here, and I wonder what your take is on what today could mean for the larger community. Well, look, the whole world is watching uh, this trial. The whole world is is waiting for the outcome. Uh, and, um, you know, it, 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 to say something is potentially explosive, potentially a watershed moment, um, those sorts of phrases are, are overused. I don't think they um, uh, would be uh, would be going too far in this case. Um, the George Floyd uh, uh, George Floyd's killing um, resounded throughout the country and across the world. And was um, uh, one of the sort of signpost Eugene, events of our time. Eugene, I'm going to interrupt. I'm sorry. We're listening to the judge now here in Hennepin County. So, members of the jury, I instruct you as follows It is your duty to decide the questions of fact in this case. It is my duty to give you the rules of law that you must apply in arriving at your verdict. You have now heard the evidence, and soon you'll hear the arguments of counsel. At, that, at this time, I will instruct you in the law applicable to this case. You must follow and apply the rules of law as I give them to you, even if you believe the law is or should be different. You have each been given a copy of these instructions to follow along as I read, and you may take your copy with you when you retire to the jury room. Nevertheless, you should listen carefully and attentively as I read them to you now. Please note that the titles of the individual sections of these instructions are not a part of the instructions, but merely placed as headings to assist you in finding a topic. Deciding questions of fact is your exclusive responsibility. In doing so, you must consider all the evidence you have heard and seen in this trial, and you must disregard anything that you may have heard or seen elsewhere about this case. I have not, by these instructions, nor by any ruling or expression during the trial, intended to indicate my opinion regarding the facts or the outcome of this case. If I have said or done anything that would seem to indicate such an opinion, you are to disregard it. You must consider these instructions as a whole and regard each instruction in light of all the others. The order in which the instructions are given is of no significance. You are free to consider the issues in any order you wish. The defendant is presumed innocent of the charges made. This presumption remains with the defendant unless and until he has been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The, defendant has, the fact that the defendant has been brought before the court by the ordinary processes of the law and is on trial should not be considered by you in any way 
suggesting guilt. The burden of proving guilt is on the state. The defendant does not have to prove his innocence. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is such proof as ordinarily prudent men and women would act upon in their most important affairs. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It does not mean a fanciful or capricious doubt, nor does it mean beyond all possibility of doubt. A fact may be proven by either direct or circumstantial evidence or by both. The law does not prefer one form of evidence over the other. A fact is proven by direct evidence when, for example, it is proven by witnesses who testify as to what they saw, heard, or experienced, or by physical evidence of the fact itself. A fact is proven by circumstantial evidence when its existence can be reasonably inferred from other facts proven in the case. For example, if a person watches deer crossing a snow-covered field, the person has direct evidence of deer walking in the field because the person sees it. If the person does not see deer but finds deer tracks in the snow, the deer tracks are circumstantial evidence that deer walked in the field because that factual conclusion can reasonably be inferred from the tracks found in the snow. Now, attorneys are officers of the court. It is their duty to make objections they think proper and to argue their client's cause. However, the arguments or other remarks of an attorney are not evidence. If the attorneys or I have made or should make any statement as to what the evidence is that differs from your recollection of the evidence, you should disregard the statement and rely solely on your own memory. If an attorney's argument contains any statement of the law that differs from the law I give you, disregard the attorney's statement. The state has brought three charges or counts against the defendant. Each count charges a separate and distinct offense. You must consider the evidence applicable to each count as though it were the only accusation before you for consideration. And you must state your findings as to each count in a separate verdict, uninfluenced by the fact that your verdict as to any other count or counts is in favor of or against the defendant. The defendant may be found guilty or not guilty of any or all of the offenses charged depending on the evidence and the weight you give it under the court's instructions. I'm about to instruct you on the law that you are to apply to the charges in the defense, but before doing so, I am going to define a few words and phrases that appear more than once in the elements of the charges and the defense that follow. The words and phrases being defined are bolded in the written copy of the instructions you will be receiving. You should use these definitions for these words and phrases in your deliberation. Attempted means that the defendant did an act which was a substantial step toward and more than mere preparation for causing the result, and that the defendant did that act with intent to cause that result. There are several forms of bodily harm relevant to some of the charges or the defense. Bodily harm means physical pain or injury, illness, or any impairment of a person's physical condition. Substantial bodily harm means bodily harm that involves a temporary but substantial disfigurement, that causes a temporary but substantial loss or impairment of the function of any bodily member or organ, or that causes a fracture of any bodily member. Great bodily harm means bodily injury that creates a high probability of death, that causes serious permanent disfigurement, or that causes a permanent or protracted loss or impairment of the function of any bodily member or organ, or other serious bodily harm. To cause death, causing death, or caused the death, means that the defendant's act or acts were a substantial causal factor in causing the death of George Floyd. The defendant is criminally liable for all the consequences of his actions that occur in the ordinary and natural course of events, including those consequences brought about by one or more intervening causes, if such intervening causes were the natural result of the defendant's acts. The fact that other causes contribute to the, de to the death does not relieve the defendant of criminal liability. However, the defendant is not criminally liable if a superseding cause caused the death. A superseding cause is a cause that comes after the defendant's acts, alters the natural sequence of events, and is the sole cause of a result that would not otherwise have occurred. To know, to have knowledge, or knew requires only that the defendant believes that the specified facts exist. Intentionally or intentional, 
means that the defendant either has a purpose to do the thing or cause the result specified, or believes that the act performed if successful will cause the result. In addition, the defendant must have knowledge of those facts that are necessary to make his conduct criminal and that are set forth after the word intentionally or intentional. With intent that, with intent to or intended, means that the defendant either has a purpose to do the thing or cause the result specified, or believes that the act performed, if successful, will cause that result. It is not necessary that the defendant have this intent in advance. The necessary intent can develop during the commission of the act. Police officer means an employee of a law enforcement agency who is licensed by the Board of Peace Officer Standards and Training charged with the prevention and detection of crime and the enforcement of the general criminal laws of the state of Minnesota and who has the full power of arrest. A law enforcement agency is a unit of state or local government that is authorized by law to grant full powers of arrest and to charge a person with the duties of preventing and detecting crime and enforcing the general criminal laws of the state of Minnesota. The Minneapolis Police Department is a law enforcement agency for these purposes. The definition of any word or phrase with a specific legal meaning that appears only once in the elements or the defenses will be defined where it appears later in these instructions. The defendant is charged in count one with murder in the second degree in connection with the death of George Floyd. Under Minnesota law, under Minnesota law a person causing the death, death of another without intent to cause the death of any person while committing or attempting to commit a felony offense is guilty of the crime of murder in the second degree. The defendant is charged with committing this crime or intentionally aiding the commission of this crime. The elements of the crime of murder in the second degree while committing a felony are, first element, the death of George Floyd must be proven. Second element, the defendant caused the death of George Floyd. Third element, the defendant at the time of causing the death of George Floyd was committing or attempting to commit the felony offense of assault in the third degree. It is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to kill George Floyd, but it must prove that the defendant committed or attempted to commit the underlying felony of assault in the third degree. There are two elements of assault in the third degree. First, defendant assaulted George Floyd. Assault is the intentional infliction of bodily harm upon another or the attempt to inflict bodily harm upon another. The intentional infliction of bodily harm requires proof that the defendant intentionally applied unlawful force to another person without that person's consent and that this act resulted in bodily harm. Second, defendant inflicted substantial bodily harm on George Floyd. It is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant intended to inflict substantial bodily harm or knew that his actions would inflict substantial bodily harm. Only that the defendant intended to commit the assault and that George Floyd sub sustained substantial bodily harm as a result of the assault. Fourth element, the defendant's act took place on or about May 25, 2020 in Hennepin County. If you find that each of these elements has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant is guilty of this charge. If you find that any of the elements have not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant is not guilty of this charge, unless you find the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is liable for this crime committed by another person or persons according to the instructions below that are listed on page 8 under the heading liability for crimes of another. The defendant is charged in count 2 with murder in the third degree in connection with the death of George Floyd. Under Minnesota law, a person causing the death of another by perpetrating an act eminently dangerous to others and evincing a depraved mind without regard for human life but without intent to cause the death of any person, is guilty of murder in the third degree. The defendant is charged with committing this crime or intentionally aiding the commission of this crime. The elements of the crime of murder in the third degree are, first element, the death of George Floyd must be proven. Second element, the defendant caused the death of George Floyd. Third element, the defendant caused the death of George Floyd by an intentional act that was eminently dangerous to other persons. A person commits an act eminently dangerous to others when the act is highly likely to cause death. Fourth element, defendant acted with a mental state consisting of reckless disregard for human life. The defendant's act may not have been specifically intended to cause death, 
It may not have been specifically directed at the particular person whose death occurred, but it must have been committed with a conscious indifference to the loss of life that the eminently dangerous act could cause. Fifth element, the defendant's act took place on or about May 25th, 2020 in Hennepin County. If you find that each of these elements has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant is guilty of this charge. If you find that any of these elements has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant is not guilty of this charge, unless you find the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is liable for this crime committed by another person or persons, according to the instructions that are listed on page eight, under the heading liability for crimes of another. The defendant is charged in count three with manslaughter in the second degree in connection with the death of George Floyd. Under Minnesota law, whoever by culpable negligence, whereby he creates an unreasonable risk and consciously takes the chance of causing death or great bodily harm to another person, causes the death of another, is guilty of, murder, of manslaughter in the second degree. The defendant is charged with committing this crime or intentionally aiding the commission of this crime. The elements of manslaughter in the second degree are first element, the death of George Floyd must be proven. Second element, the defendant caused the death of George Floyd by culpable negligence, whereby the defendant created an unreasonable risk and consciously took a chance of causing death or great bodily harm. Culpable negligence is intentional conduct that the defendant may not have intended to be harmful, but that an ordinary and reasonably prudent person would recognize as involving a strong probability of injury to others. Third element, the defendant's act took place on or about May 25th, 2020 in Hennepin County. If you find that each of these elements has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant is guilty of this charge. If you find that any of these elements has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant is not guilty of this charge, unless you find the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is liable for this crime committed by another person or persons according to the following instruction on liability for crimes of another. The following instructions apply to all three of the charges I've just given you. The defendant is guilty of a crime committed by another person or persons only if the defendant has played an intentional role in aiding the commission of that crime and made no reasonable effort to prevent the crime before it was committed. Intentional role includes intentionally aiding, advising, hiring, counseling, conspiring with, or procuring another to commit the crime. The defendant's presence or actions constitute intentionally aiding only if first the defendant knew another person or persons were going to commit or were committing a crime. Second, the defendant intended that his presence or actions aid the commission of that crime. If the defendant intentionally aided another person or persons in committing a crime, or intentionally advised, hired, counseled, conspired with, or otherwise procured the other person or persons to commit it, the defendant is also guilty of any other crime the other person or persons commit while trying to commit the intended crime, if that other crime was reasonably foreseeable to the defendant as a probable consequence of trying to commit the intended crime. The defendant is guilty of the crime under this theory of intentionally aiding in the commission of a crime by another person or persons only if the other person or persons commit the crime. The defendant is not guilty for aiding, advising, hiring, counseling, conspiring, or otherwise procuring the commission of one of the charged crimes unless that crime is actually committed. The defendant, or the state rather, the state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intentionally aided another person in committing the charged crime. No crime is committed if a police officer's actions were justified by the police officer's use of reasonable force in the line of duty in effecting a lawful arrest or preventing an escape from custody. The, the kind and degree of force a police officer may lawfully use in executing his duties is limited by what a reasonable police officer in the same situation would believe to be necessary. Any use of force beyond that is not reasonable. To determine if the actions of the police officer were reasonable, you must look at those facts which a reasonable officer in the same situation would have known at the precise moment the officer acted with force. You must decide whether the officer's actions were objectively reasonable in light of the totality of the facts and circumstances confronting the officer and without regard to the officer's own subjective state of mind, intentions, or motivations. The defendant is not guilty of a crime if he used force 
as authorized by law. To prove guilt, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's use of force was not authorized by law. You are the sole judges of whether a witness is to be believed and of the weight to be given a witness's testimony. There are no hard and fast rules to guide you in this respect. In determining believability and weight of testimony, you may take into consideration the witness's interest or lack of interest in the outcome of the All right, well, we lost our feed there from Hennepin County in Minneapolis. You've been listening to the judge, Peter Cahill, describing to the jury what task is in front of them. Uh, we are awaiting closing arguments today from the prosecution, then from the defense, and then a rebuttal from the prosecution would be the third thing before the jury presumably would get more instructions and then be sent off to deliberate. Of course, we're talking about the trial of Derek Chauvin accused of killing George Floyd. Uh, let me bring in Joyce Vance. She's a former U.S. attorney. She's been with us all morning. She's been with us for weeks on this trial. Uh, Joyce, we just heard very detailed explanations of what the three charges are uh, against this former police officer. I wonder if we could talk about the sentencing guidelines, too. Uh, we, we had shown on screen the maximum sentencing guidelines, but if the jury were to find, for example, in favor of murder, uh, second-degree murder, it's, it's unlikely they would necessarily go for that maximum penalty, correct? Sentencing is always a little bit confusing. Typically, there are statutory maximums that are set in the statute and in state law, but most states in the federal system have adopted guidelines for sentences. It gives the judge a range in which he or she can sentence, and it is typically, as it is in this case, much lower, although still very substantial. One complicating factor that makes it hard to assess what the sentences here might look like is that the prosecution will likely seek to enhance sentencing based on some of the factual conduct involved in, in this case. And it typically you would have a jury make those factual findings after they rendered a guilty verdict. But it might be the case here that Chauvin would, would waive that right to have the jury make those decisions and let the judge do it if the jury has already found him guilty. So lots of uncertainty here. All right, Joyce, thank you. Let's During go back to the courtroom and listen in on the judge again. Parties introduced demonstrative exhibits in the form of charts, summaries, and animated videos. This information was presented to assist you as an aid in your understanding of the witness's testimony and to help explain the facts disclosed uh, by the records, other documents, testimony, and other evidence that was received during the trial. If any chart, summary, or animated video is not consistent with the facts or figures shown by evidence in the case as you find them, you should disregard the chart or summary or animated video and determine the facts from the underlying evidence. Earlier during these instructions, I defined certain words and phrases, and you are to use those definitions in your deliberations. If I have not defined a word or phrase, you should apply the common, ordinary meaning of that word or phrase. During this trial, I have ruled on objections to certain testimony and exhibits. You must not concern yourself with the reasons for the rulings, since they are controlled by rules of evidence. By admitting into evidence testimony and exhibits as to which objection was made, I did not intend to indicate the weight to be given such testimony and evidence. You are not to speculate as to possible answers to questions I did not require to be answered. You are to disregard all evidence and statements of attorneys that I have ordered stricken or have told you to disregard. And with that, I'd ask you to put your instructions under your chair as we listen to the closing arguments of counsel. Is the state ready to proceed with closing? Yes, sir. Mr. Slisher, you may proceed.
May it please the court, counsel, members of the jury. His name was George Perry Floyd Jr. and he was born on October 14, 1973 in Fayetteville, North Carolina. To his parents, George Floyd Sr. and Larcinia Jones Floyd, sissy, uh, the matriarch. Now you met George Floyd's brother, Philonis, and you heard all about Sissy Floyd. She was George Floyd's mom. She was the mom of the house. She was the mom of the neighborhood. And you heard about the special bond that she and George Floyd shared during his life. You heard about their relationship, how he would always take time, special attention to be with his mother, how he would still cuddle with her in the fetal position. You heard that. And from George Floyd's brother, you learned all about uh, George's childhood. And during his time growing up in that house, George Floyd was surrounded by people, by people he knew, people who knew him, people he recognized a familiar face to pick out in the crowd. People need that. George Floyd was surrounded by people he cared about and who cared about him throughout his life, throughout his childhood in that house, through his adolescence, into his adulthood. On May 25, 2020, George Floyd died. Face down on the pavement, right on 38th and Chicago in Minneapolis. Nine minutes and 29 seconds. Nine minutes and 29 seconds. During this time, George Floyd struggled, desperate to, to breathe, to make enough room in his chest to breathe. But the force was too much. He was, he was trapped. He was trapped with the unyielding pavement underneath him, as unyielding as the men who held him down, pushing him a knee to the neck, a knee to the back, twisting his fingers, holding his legs for nine minutes and 29 seconds, the defendant's weight on him. The lungs in his chest unable to expand because there wasn't enough room to breathe. George Floyd tried. He pushed his bare shoulder against the pavement to lift himself, to give his chest, to give his lungs enough room in his chest to breathe with the pavement tearing into his bare skin. As he desperately pushed with his knuckles to make space so he'd have room to breathe, the pavement lacerating, lacerating his knuckles. The defendant stayed on top of him for nine minutes and 29 seconds. So desperate to breathe, he pushed with his face with his face to lift himself, to open his chest, to give his lungs room to breathe. The pavement tearing into his skin, George Floyd losing strength, not superhuman strength. There was no superhuman strength that day. There's no superhuman strength because there's no such thing as a superhuman. Those exist in comic books. And 38th in Chicago is a very real place. Not superhumans, only humans. 
just a human, just a man, lying on the pavement, being pressed upon, desperately crying out. A grown man crying out for his mother. A human being. And in that time and in that place, while he was surrounded in life by people he knew him, faces he could pick out, there was no one there he knew. He was surrounded by strangers. Strangers, all of them. Nine minutes and 29 seconds. He's surrounded by strangers, not a familiar face to say his final words. But he did say them to someone. He said them to someone who he did not know by name, but he knew him from the uniform he wore and the badge he wore. And he called him Mr. Officer. That's what he called him, Mr. Officer. Mr. Officer would help. We call the police when we need help. And he pleaded with Mr. Officer. George Floyd's final words on May 25, 2020 were, please, I can't breathe. And he said those words to Mr. Officer. He said those words to the defendant. He asked for help with his very last breath. But Mr. Officer did not help. The defendant did not help. He stayed on top of him, continued to push him down, to grind his knees, to twist his hand, to twist his fingers into the handcuffs that bound him, looking at him, staring, staring down at times the horrified bystanders who had gathered and watched this unfold. The motto of the Minneapolis Police Department is to protect with courage and to serve with compassion. But George Floyd was not a threat to anyone. He wasn't trying to hurt anyone. He wasn't trying to do anything to anyone. Facing George Floyd that day, that did not require one ounce of courage and none was shown on that day. No courage was required. All that was required was a little compassion. And none was shown on that day. George Floyd said, I'm not trying to win. This was a call about a counterfeit $20 bill. All that was required was some compassion. Humans need that. People need that. But more fundamental than that, and more practical at that time, in that place, what George Floyd needed was some oxygen. That's what he needed. He needed to breathe. Because people need that. Humans need that. To breathe. And he said that. And the defendant heard him say that over and over. He heard him, but he just didn't listen. He continued to push him down, to grind into him, to shimmy, to twist his hand for nine minutes and 29 seconds. He begged, George Floyd begged until he could speak no more, and the defendant continued this assault. When he was unable to speak, the defendant continued. When he was unable to breathe, the defendant continued beyond the point that he had a pulse. Beyond the point that he had a pulse, the defendant continued this assault. Nine minutes and 29 seconds. When the ambulance arrived, the ambulance was here. And the defendant continued. He stayed on top of him. He would not get up. He would not let up. He stayed on him, grinding into him, continuing to twist his fingers, to hold him down. He had no pulse. He was not breathing. 
He was not responsive, and the defendant had to know what was right beneath him. Right beneath him. You saw the video. You saw the point when uh, the ambulance arrived, and finally, after a paramedic got out, and the defendant still did not get up, and the paramedic tapped him, and finally the defendant got up, and they lifted Mr. Floyd onto that gurney, and you saw the way he, he was not, there was nothing there. His head had to be held to prevent it from falling to the ground. He was completely limp. The defendant had to know that. He was there. He was on top of him. And he was on top of him. On top of him. Sometimes you ask for the truth, sometimes you insist on the truth. And the truth is the defendant was on top of him for nine minutes and 29 seconds. And he had to know. He had to know. The medical examiner would find the cause of George Floyd's death to be cardiopulmonary arrest complicating law enforcement subdual restraint and neck compression. Well, what you saw the defendant and the other officers doing to George Floyd caused his death. The medical examiner ruled the death a homicide, death at the hands of another. What the defendant did to George Floyd killed him. It was ruled a homicide. The defendant is charged with murder. He's charged with murder and he's charged with manslaughter. The defendant at the time was a police officer. Okay. Uh, it may be hard, it may be hard for any of you to imagine a police officer doing something like this. Remember, in jury selection, and we talked about bias, and we talked about setting biases and preconceived notions behind. Well, imagining a police officer committing a crime might be the most difficult thing you have to set aside, because that's just not the way we think of police officers. We trust the police. We trust the police to help us. We believe the police are going to respond to our call for help. We believe they're going to listen to us. And, and this is strong, this runs deep. I'd say it's difficult to set this aside. I want you to consider that uh, even after, with the bystanders, after they saw what they saw, after they saw this shocking display of abuse of police power and a man murdered in front of them, Genevieve Hansen, she called the police. Donald Williams, he saw this, you heard him, he testified. He called the police. A nine-year-old, Judea, what did she suggest? We need to call the police on the police. That's our expectation, even after seeing this, even after witnessing this, our expectation is that the police are gonna help. And, and, with, and with reason, and with good reason, right? Because policing is a most noble profession, it is. It is, and to be very clear, this case, this case is called the State of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. This case is not called the State of Minnesota versus the police. It is not. Policing is a noble profession, and it is a profession. You met several Minneapolis police officers during this trial. You met them, they took the stand, they testified. Make no mistake, this is not a prosecution of the police. It is a prosecution of the defendant. And there's nothing worse for a good police than a bad police who doesn't follow the rules, who doesn't follow procedure, who doesn't follow training, who ignores the policies of the department, the motto of the department, to protect with courage, to serve with compassion. Chief Arredondo 
the chief of police, the Minneapolis Police Department, he took the stand and he testified and he told you what that badge that he wears over his heart means. It's a public service. It's a public trust. They're there to help us. It's a professional organization. There are standards. There are rules. There's a code of conduct. There's a use of force policy. There's extensive training. The police are first responders. They're who we call for help, and they help us. They have CPR training. If there's more, more training than simply use of force. There's more to policing than putting handcuffs on people and hauling them away, to be true. Right? There's other kinds of training. There's procedural justice. There's crisis intervention training. There's medical training. And there's defensive tactics. And there's de-escalation. All of this training. Hundreds, hundreds of hours of training. You met the people who staffed the training center, and they told you, we don't train this. They told you that. The sanctity of life and the protection of the public, those are the cornerstones of Minneapolis Police Department's use of force policy protection of the public, all of the public, all of the human beings that make up the public. The defendant, he didn't do that because that day his badge just wasn't in the right place. The defendant was a police officer. He was. And again, you need to set aside the notion that it's impossible for a police officer to do something like this. The defendant is on trial not for being a police officer. It's not the state versus the police. He's not on trial for who he was. He's on trial for what he did. That is what he did. That is what he did on that day. Nine minutes and 29 seconds. That is what he did. He didn't follow training, those hundreds of hours of training that he had. He did not follow the department's use of force rules. He did not perform CPR. He knew better. He just didn't do better. He just didn't do better. Remember during opening statement? During opening statement, counsel said that the defendant followed the rules and followed his training. Did you hear evidence of that? Did you hear evidence of that from the stand? Or did you hear something quite different? The ch chief of police testified. He violated their use of force policy. He violated their de-escalation policy. He violated the duty to render emergency aid. No. You heard the trainer, Lieutenant Mercil. We don't train this. This is, this is not who we are. That representation was simply wrong. That's just a story. What the defendant did was not policing. What the defendant did was an assault. I'm going to discuss the law with you in a bit here and, uh, and explain. Uh, the court's already provided you some instructions on second degree murder, and you know that in the laws of this state, if you commit in a certain level of assault, a felony level assault, and a person dies, as a result of your assault, you're guilty of murder. It's as simple as that. And what the defendant did here was a straight up felony assault. This was not policing. It was unnecessary. It was gratuitous. It was disproportionate. And he did it on purpose. No question. This was not an accident. He did not trip and fall and find himself upon George Floyd's knee and neck. He did what he did on purpose. And it killed George Floyd. That force for nine minutes and 29 seconds, that killed George Floyd. He betrayed the badge and everything it stood for. It's not how they're trained. It's not following the rules. This is not an anti-police prosecution. It's a pro-police prosecution. The 
defendant abandoned his values, abandoned the training, and killed a man, and why? Right out in the public, right out in broad daylight, in front of several bystanders as they looked in, in shock and in horror, and why? Well, this all started over a call of an alleged counterfeit $20 bill. But George Floyd's life was taken for something worth far, far less, far less. You saw the photo, you saw the body language. You can learn a lot about someone by looking at their body language. The defendant facing down that crowd, they were pointing cameras at him recording him, telling him what to do, challenging his authority, his ego, his pride. Not the kind of pride that makes you do better, be better. The kind of ego-based pride. But the defendant was not going to be told what to do. He was not going to let these bystanders tell him what to do. He was going to do what he wanted, how he wanted, for as long as he wanted. And there was nothing Nothing they could do about it because he had the authority. He had the power of the badge and the other officers. And the bystanders were powerless. They were powerless to do a thing. The defendant, he chose pride over policing. Charles McMillan, 61 years old, interesting man. Right? You remember when he testified, he had the glasses. If any of you in the front row, when he walked by, happened to notice his shoes, if you looked at his shoes, you probably saw your reflection in those shoes, right? Uh, he dressed uh, for court like it was the most important day of his life. Uh, interesting man. Uh, he was there. He's sort of narrating this horrific scene throughout. You hear him in the video. And he called out to George Floyd. He said, um, you can't win. You can't win. And George Floyd replied, I'm not trying to win. I'm not trying to win. I'm scared. But the defendant, the defendant was trying to win. He wasn't going to be told what to do. He wasn't going to take a challenge to his authority. He was trying to win. And George Floyd paid for it with his life. Now, also need to be clear, this is not the trial of George Floyd. George Floyd is not on trial here. You've heard some things about George Floyd, uh, that he struggled with drug addiction, that uh, he was being investigated for allegedly passing a fake $20 bill, that there was never any evidence introduced that he knew was fake in the first place. Right? But, but he is not on trial. He didn't get a trial when he was alive. And he is not on trial here. Uh, defense claims that he was non-compliant. Non-compliant. Well, let's, let's revisit what happened before the 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Before that. It's Memorial Day, right? May 25, 2020. And George Floyd is sitting in a car in the driver's seat with two friends. Now, previously he'd been in Cup Foods. He'd been in the store. He was walking. He was talking. He was breathing. As alive as any person, any human, in this room. Back to the car. He's with his friends. And there's a tap at the window. He looks to his left and a start. This is what he sees. This is what he sees. Within seconds of the approach, Officer Lane have tapped on the window. Within seconds, he pulls his gun and holds it inches from George Floyd's face and starts shouting profanities. Show me your thing hands. Show me your effing hands. Screaming it. This is within seconds. You can tell a lot about someone by looking at their body language. 
How does Mr. Floyd look in this photo? Terrified? An officer on the driver's side, an officer on the passenger side. Lane orders Floyd to put his hands on the steering wheel. He does. That's not resistance, that's compliance. Lane orders Floyd to get out of the car. He does. That's not resistance, that's compliance. They order him, they want him handcuffed. He is handcuffed. That's not resistance, that's compliance. And on the handcuffs, you recall the testimony, they weren't properly double locked. And so they continue to ratchet. They're not on correctly, they're on too tight. Throughout, and if you listen to the videos, throughout the videos, you can hear the sound of those handcuffs ratcheting tighter and tighter. Mr. Floyd is trying to explain to the police that his wrists hurt, impervious to pain, please. His wrists hurt, no one listens to him, but it continues. They tell him to go over to the dragon walk. He goes over to the dragon walk. That's not resistance, that's compliance. They ask him to sit down. He sits down. Not resistance, compliance. Not trying to escape, not trying to evade arrest, not trying to assault anybody, shoot anybody, stab anybody, punch anybody. No. Compliance. Sits down on the ground. They ask him his name. He gives his name. He spells it. That's not resistance, that's compliance. They ask him to get up, he gets up. They ask him to go across the street, he goes across the street. Right? Where's the resistance? Where's that? They take him over to the car, okay? They take him over to the car. George Floyd is a big guy, right? You can see here, I mean, he's almost as big as Officer Lane. He's a big guy. He's a big person, the back of the squad car is not. Right? That's what they wanted him to get into. And to George Floyd, that looked, he looked at that, what do you think that looked like? Like a little cage. Right? He tried to explain himself to the officers that he had anxiety, that he had claustrophobia. He explained this over and over. They wanted him to get in the back of this little car. And you know, he just wasn't able to bring himself to do it. He wasn't able to bring himself to do it. Man, I'm scared as fuck, man. If that's a breather, if that's a breather, it's gonna go off on me, man. Pull your legs in. Okay, 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 let me count the three. Let me count the three and I'm going in, please. So he's trying to work up the ability to get in the car. He's explaining himself repeatedly. And you can see this is where the defendant and Officer Tao start coming into the scene. Right? And we'll, we'll look at what they saw in a minute. But they start to come to the scene. Right? A 19-year veteran of the police force with all of the training that that involves, over 800 hours of training, 40-hour crisis intervention training course, a scenario-based training where they're taught to recognize the signs of someone who is experiencing a crisis, a crisis. You know, he couldn't bring himself to get in, and sometimes people can't bring themselves to get in, and this is not new, this is not groundbreaking. Okay. People have emotions, people have things happen to them. Uh, the police train for this. They recognize this. You, you don't get to meet the police on your best day very often. You don't call the police and say, everything's fine, just wanted you to know, right? It, that doesn't happen. Okay. No, there's a whole range of humanity out there who have a whole range of different issues. I mean, it could be anything. It could be a death in the family. Right? That can cause an extreme emotional response. You know, recall when Officer Lane approached the car, George Floyd talked about losing his mother. He'd lost her in 2018. Those, those wounds still right there on the surface. Emotion. It could involve 
uh, a divorce, finding bad financial news, right? mental illness, mental health issues, like drug and alcohol abuse. All of those things can cause someone to not resist, but just not be able to bring themselves to comply at that moment, at that time. And this is nothing new. They train for it, they plan for it, they prepare for it, they have a policy on it, right? Recognizing persons in crisis. You remember Chief Arredondo took the stand, he testified, he testified that they have 4,000 calls for service for persons in crisis every single year. This is nothing new. They're there on a $20 counterfeiting charge. They train for this. They know about this. Now, George Floyd certainly had his struggles. And you know that. The state put in evidence of that. Right? Courtney Ross testified that he struggled with an opioid addiction. You knew that. And this is nothing new. The, the difference, though, on May 25, 2020, the officers just wouldn't listen to him wouldn't look at the signs, wouldn't recognize the signs of what they had prepared for. And a reasonable officer in the defendant's place with all his training and all his experience, including that 40-hour crisis intervention course and a subsequent refresher course, should have known that and should have recognized it. Floyd was trying to get into the car. He was trying to work up the courage. He said he'd count to three, but he just couldn't do it. So the defendant arrives on the scene, he surveys the scene, he saunters up to the car, and he slips on his gloves. You can't win, bro. You can't win. I'm not trying to win. Go on, get in the car. I'll be on the ground or anything. Don't get in the car. He knows it. He know it, Mr. Officer. Y'all hear me? Don't do me like that, man. Please. Car, okay, so I have to open you, please. Yeah, so you get in this car. We can talk. I am. I'm claustrophobic. I'm, I'm hearing claustrophobic, you because you're not working with me. God, I'm claustrophobic. Get in the car. 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 Get they just shove him into the car, into that tiny back seat. You saw the look on his face. You saw the look on George Floyd's face when he glanced over into that car. It looked like he'd seen a monster looking into that car. Clearly, this trained officer should have recognized that and understood at that moment and that time, well, what is your goal? Where does this, where'd this critical thinking model go? Where'd that go? Where you take in information, you assess the information, you reassess the information, you consider what, what's the goal, what's the plan. You're there for a $20 counterfeiting charge, allegedly. Chief Arredondo <clears throat> testified they generally don't put people in custody for that. So why is it necessary to shove them in the car? They made a judgment call, they decided to shove them in the car. The predictable thing to happen, happened, right? He just couldn't be in the back of that car. And so they pull him out. They pull him out. And watch what happens. They pull him out of the car. What? Please, man. Hey, come on out. Look at you. Thank you. Thank you. Get him down the ground. Ah. Yeah, on the ground. Ah. On the ground. Ah. 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 All right, folks. They get him out of the car. He is handcuffed. He is on his knees. He is not going anywhere. There are four officers there, four officers. And what did George Floyd say once they pulled him out of the car? Thank you. Thank you. Now, a reasonable officer in the defendant's position at that time should have recognized and understood he wasn't trying to escape. He wasn't trying to punch anyone, stab anyone. Well, he wasn't trying to do that. The problem was the back of the car. Just like George Floyd tried to explain 
over and over. The problem was the back of the car. So if you can give them the benefit of the doubt that they made a bad judgment call and shoved him in the back of the car, at least when he came out in the struggle, it was over. He was on his knees. He was saying, thank you. Done. No need. It could have been over there. But what did they do? They took him from this position, handcuffed on his knees. They pushed him down onto the ground. Didn't need to. Not at all. For what? He's handcuffed. They pushed him down into what is, you now know, from watching the evidence in this case, the prone recovery position. Right? When he's down on the ground, he's initially pushed, he is literally in the prone recovery position on the side. That allows the chest to expand and provides room for the lungs to expand and take in air so they can breathe. That is a step that protects against the known danger of positional asphyxia. And they have him there. He's right there. So then what happens after? They take him incredibly out of the recovery position and prone him on the ground. For what? The prone position is a transitory position. It's a position you use to secure someone in handcuffs, and when you're done with that, you immediately roll them on their side. Right? That's the position he was in. Proning him was completely unnecessary. And this is where the excessive force begins. Right? This is where the nine minutes and 29 seconds start, because they didn't just lay him prone. They did not do that. They stayed on top of him. With a knee on the neck, and a knee on the back and the defendant's weight on Mr. Floyd, pushing down with Officer King, adding to the pressure, pushing down, holding his feet, Officer Lane holding his feet for nine minutes and 29 seconds. That's when the excessive force began. That's when the countdown began. Now, you need to we're going to pull back and take a look. You've learned a lot about policies and procedures and tactics. You have to pull back and say, uh, would but for the defendant's actions pushing him down, would George Floyd have died that day? Is it drugs? he just miraculously die of a drug overdose in that time? Uh, uh, maybe it was the tailpipe. Maybe it was his enlarged heart. Maybe not. Use your common sense. Use your common sense. Believe your eyes. What you saw, you saw. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the law. The judge has already instructed you. And uh, it's necessary to go over this a couple of times. It, you, you've learned you've gotten a got to go to medical school here as jurors. You, there's so many benefits to being a jury. You got to, you got to go to medical school. You got that free parking, uh, great lunches, fabulous pay. So now you get a, a little bit of a free law school education. The judge gave you a preview of that. We're going we're gonna to go through that again. Uh, he's going to give you a copy of those instructions. You have them. You get to keep those and, and, and use those during your jury deliberations. He told you that you, know, you, don't, you don't have to decide these issues in any order. You can do it the way you all see fit. I'll be making some suggestions as to the order I think you should, should do things. It might focus your deliberations and just make the, the conversation uh, a little easier, a little more focused. But you have these jury instructions as your guide. I think uh, it, it's important uh, for you to follow the judge's instructions to the letter, right? the words and the definitions that the judge gives you. They, they mean what the judge says they mean. And know that the state is required to prove these charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. He read this to you. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof as ordinarily prudent men and women would act upon in their most important affairs. And a reasonable doubt is based on reason and common sense, not a fanciful or capricious doubt or beyond all possibility of doubt. So reasonable doubt, it's just as the name implies. It's a doubt that's reasonable. 
a doubt based on reason and common sense. You as jurors are not required, nor should you, leave your common sense at the courthouse steps. As jurors, you must rely on your common sense. That's why you're here. We need you to apply that standard to these facts and to, to, to be a judge of the facts and apply those facts and findings of facts to the law. And so uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, it, it certainly is a high standard. It's the highest standard. It's a standard that the state is a, has met here. And the state does not need to prove its case beyond all doubt. It does not need to prove its case beyond what I'll call an unreasonable doubt. Not required to prove beyond an unreasonable doubt. An unreasonable doubt is a doubt not based on common sense, but based on nonsense. And you're not required to accept nonsense. You're not required to accept the notion that after the defendant kneeling on Mr. Floyd for nine minutes and 29 seconds in the dangerous prone position, handcuffed, restrained, pressing down on him, that after that, as he, as he was writhing in pain and suffering, that, that that's not even a use of force. Like, but there's no force there because it's not likely to produce pain. A witness testified to that. You're, you're not required to believe something that just flies in the face of common sense to believe that you would have to completely abandon all notion of common sense, not likely to produce pain. You don't have to accept someone who says that. You'd be, you'd be better off asking the nine-year-old. You're not required to accept the proposition that the car did it, that the car killed George Floyd. You're not required to accept that or to consider that it is the bystander's fault for distracting the defendant. You're not required to believe this amazing coincidence that after this nine minute and 29 second prone restraint, that at that point in time, even though he was walking and talking, even though he was breathing, interacting with people, that he chose that moment to die of heart disease to die of heart disease? Is that common sense or is that nonsense? Or that it was a, a drug overdose? You know that George Floyd struggled with drug addiction and drug use. You know that. You know he had developed a, a that requires a tolerance. You know what the toxicology report says in terms of the levels, and you know what the testimony was about that. You die of a drug overdose. That's not common sense. That's nonsense. Believe your eyes. What you saw happened, happened. It happened. The defendant pressed down on George Floyd, so his lungs did not have the room to breathe. Dr. Tobin told you that. Dr. Smock, Dr. Rich, the experts, the experts who testified, you can rely on them. Dr. Smock, Dr. Rich, Dr. Eisenschmidt. They said like that commercial, right? They, they know a thing or two because they've seen a thing or two. They know a thing or two. Dr. Tobin knows a thing or two about how this works. So um, looking at the charges, and, and this is a little bit of a different layout than you see in your printed jury instructions, and they're not uh, intended to replicate the instructions uh, completely, but uh, it's meant to be sort of a guide for you to look at the different elements in a, in a particular context. And so the, uh, the charge of murder in the second degree, murder in the third degree, manslaughter in the second degree, the, the judge read you, you know, what the law says those things are, and the law breaks down these different charges into things called elements. First element, second element, third element, fourth element. And, each of these has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt by, by the state in order for the defendant to be guilty of those charges. Now, those are the elements that are required. Those are the only elements that are required. You know, again, like other preconceived notions, you may have some ideas um, you know, from watching <coughs> TV about other cases uh, and shows and things. You, you might have some other ideas as to what uh, the law requires. 
but again, you know, just like you know, it's you know how it's lunchtime in court. And the judge tells you it's lunchtime. You know when it's time to go. The judge tells you it's time to go. Same thing. You know what the charges are. You know what the elements are because the judge tells you what the elements are. So you need to follow that. Okay. So talking about murder in the second degree. First, um, the death of George Floyd uh, must be proved. And, and then it must be proved that the defendant caused the death of George Floyd. And the fact that other causes may have contributed to George Floyd's death does not relieve the defendant of any criminal liability. It just does not. And for murder in the second degree, that the defendant at the time of causing George Floyd's death was committing or attempting to commit assault in the third degree. That's a felony level assault under the laws of Minnesota. And uh, assault, to show the defendant assaulted George Floyd, that he intentionally applied unlawful force to Mr. Floyd without Mr. Floyd's consent, resulting in bodily harm. The state has to show that. The state did show that, the assault. And that the defendant inflicted substantial bodily harm on George Floyd. And that this act took place on or about May 25, 2020 in Hennepin County. Okay, so as to the first element, that George Floyd died. Well, that was established. That was established uh, by the emergency room physician, Dr. Langenfield. George Floyd was pronounced dead at the Hennepin County Memorial Hospital on May 25, 2020. So that element is met. And, uh, and again, you can consider these elements any way you want to consider them. My suggestion is that you Consider them in the order as listed here, murder two, murder three, manslaughter in the second degree, and in order of the elements, just because you know, there's a lot here. You know, there were 38 witnesses who testified. There are a lot of exhibits that were offered, and it's easy to talk about everything at the same time. Um, it really is. But it will help focus your deliberations if you look at these different uh, elements in order to have sort of a logical way to focus your deliberation. So I encourage you to do that, but you can do it any way you want. Okay. Second element, that the defendant caused the death of George Floyd. Okay. Causation, so what does that, what does that mean? What does causation mean here? It means that the defendant's act or acts were a substantial causal factor, a substantial causal factor in causing the death. He's criminally liable for all of the consequences of his actions that naturally occur, right? including those consequences brought about by intervening causes. The fact that other causes may have contributed to George Floyd's death just does not relieve the defendant of criminal liability. What you have to find is that nine minutes and 29 seconds of compression on his knee, with his knees on his neck and on his back being held down was a substantial factor in George Floyd's death. Now, uh, if there was a superseding cause, then the defendant wouldn't be criminally liable. But the superseding cause, are, those are causes that come after the defendant's acts and alters the natural sequences of events and, and is the sole cause of death. And we don't have that here. We know how George Floyd died. This is the use of force. When we talk about use of force, that's been defined by the different witnesses who've testified, looking at what happened from the point uh, the knee went to the neck and back, right, and the unlawful restraint, the assault started, and how long it lasted, nine minutes and 29 seconds. That's what George Floyd, that's what killed George Floyd. That's why he died. You know, believe your eyes that unreasonable force pinning him to the ground, that's what killed him. This was a homicide. Now, you heard this from forensic pathologists, the, the experts, you, you, you've heard this, and the experts have weighed in, and you know, Dr. Langenfield told you that Mr. Floyd died, Dr. Baker ruled this a homicide, and told you the the cause and manner of death, the unlawful, the uh, restraint and subdual by law enforcement, what they did killed him, told you that. 
Dr. Tobin, remember Dr. Tobin, he told you specifically how it happened. He walked you through that, the asphyxia. Right? He told you how it happened. And the other uh, doctors who testified, Dr. Smock, Dr. Rich, uh, Dr. Eisenschmidt, they told you how it didn't happen. Right? It wasn't a sudden cardiac event. It wasn't a heart attack. It wasn't a drug overdose. Right? It wasn't any of those things. Right? Dr. Tobin came back and explained it wasn't carbon monoxide. Right? No. So you know how George Floyd died. And you heard this. And, but, but specifically, you know, Dr. Tobin uh, provided fairly extensive detail and was very clear that George Floyd died as a result of a low level of oxygen. This low level of oxygen caused a brain injury and a PEA arrhythmia, which caused his heart to stop. That's not a cardiac event. It's not that his heart disease, right, that, that didn't cause him to die. His, it was the low level of oxygen. It was the asphyxia that caused him to die. Right? And we know that that happened. We know that happened because they observed during the restraint at 20, 24, 21, right? What did they observe? They observed an anoxic seizure, right? a telltale sign of oxygen deprivation. Dr. Tobin told you that. Even Dr. Fowler told you that. And after Mr. Floyd experienced a seizure, he passed out. After his pulse stopped, his heart stopped. That cardiopulmonary arrest, that was the result of the police subdual and the restraint and the neck compression. We know from Dr. Tobin, George Floyd did not die primarily from a cardiac event, as has been suggested. Now, uh, George Floyd, he was not in perfect health. Sure, he had narrowed arteries high blood pressure, no question about that. He was, no question, he was experiencing stress. You know, even before, uh, the officers shoved him onto the sidewalk unnecessarily, gratuitously, disproportionately. But none of this caused George Floyd's heart to fail. It did not. His heart failed because the defendant's use of force, the 929, right, that deprived Mr. Floyd of the oxygen that he needed that humans need to live. And Dr. Tobin knows because he is a pulmonologist. He's a lung doctor. He's a lung doctor. He's also a respiratory physiologist. He's the only person who testified who's able to calculate lung capacity, lung volume. He could do that. Dr. Baker couldn't do it, didn't do it. He deferred to the pulmonologist, the pulmonologist, Dr. Tobin. Dr. Fowler couldn't do it. He said he would defer to a pulmonologist. And Dr. Tobin, who also happens to be a, a critical care physician, he spent years treating patients, treating patients in intensive care who were experiencing respiratory failure. And Dr. Tobin literally wrote the book on the subject, and he was able to tell you, right, what this looks like, what he was able to observe. What he was able to observe was oxygen deprivation. It was asphyxia. It was asphyxia. Because under the conditions that Mr. Floyd was being restrained, that the defendant put him in, okay, that cut off uh, his oxygen, it would have cut off oxygen uh, of, of someone who was perfectly healthy, of anyone. The forces that were used in this situation right, it involved multiple factors. George Floyd was handcuffed. And he had impaired arms and chest movement. He was placed prone, shoved prone on the sidewalk. The knees pushing on his neck and back downward. The pavement, the force of the pavement being unyielding. It was like he was in a vice. That he was being, you know, squeezed in a vice. And uh, he calculated, right, between uh, uh, Chauvin, the defendant, uh, Officer King, pushing down on him approximately 90 pounds of force. And the position and the force combined such that it was if it was as if George Floyd's left lung had been surgically removed. That's how much of a reduction of air capacity there was here. To the point that Mr. Floyd was desperately trying to make space to breathe, pushing his shoulder, pushing his face against the pavement to lift up. 
to give space to breathe. His lung capacity, based on Dr. Tobin's calculation, had just being in the prone position, even though you heard some studies from the defense saying, you know, the prone position isn't dangerous. Well, Dr. Tobin disagreed. He said that the lung capacity was reduced by 24% just by the prone position, 43% when you consider the additional pressure. So Dr. Tobin's opinion corroborates the police training and what the police have known for 30 years. That there's a danger to the prone position and the danger is positional asphyxia. And the danger, the worst thing that can happen with positional asphyxia is death. And it wasn't just the lungs, the, the, the pressing up against the neck. Remember when you touch that, that it reduced the capacity of airflow such that it was as if Mr. Floyd was breathing through a straw. These shallow breaths did not produce enough oxygen. Not enough oxygen could get to the lungs. And that's what killed George Floyd. And here's what didn't, right? Here's what did. This wasn't a sudden cardiac arrhythmia, right? Dr. Smock told you that, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Rich, Dr. Tobin, they agree, not a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. That's not how this looks. Dr. Baker, no medical evidence of a heart attack. Okay. We heard from Dr. Rich. Dr. Rich actually treats people who have heart attacks. And he found there was nothing on his, in his review, nothing in George Floyd's heart to suggest that the death originated from the heart. Nothing. You know, over the course of this case, you heard a lot uh, of things that, that didn't happen and hypotheticals that don't apply, right? You know why George Floyd died. You know how he died. You heard a lot about drugs. You heard about his struggle with addiction. There's some things, um, you know, George Floyd was obviously not a perfect man. Who is? No one is, right? So you heard about drugs. You heard about drugs in the car, some pills in the car. In the, in the squad car, in his car. You heard questions about, is he chewing gum? Does he have a pill in his mouth based on this free? None of that matters. Because you know what his level, the drug level was. You know that from the toxicology report. If, if, if drugs are found in the car, they're not in George Floyd's system. So there's no point in talking about those. Let's talk about what was in the system and the toxicology report. And you heard from Dr. Eisenschmidt, right? And what he testified was that George Floyd's fentanyl to norfentanyl ratio, that the metabolite norfentanyl, that was well below the ratio of people who die from a fentanyl overdose. It was even below the median. And George Floyd's methamphetamine level, that was 94% lower than the, than the group for driving, population for driving under the influence. Right? And Dr. Rich and Dr. Smock, they've treated patients who are under the influence of both fentanyl and methamphetamine, and they testified these drugs did not kill George Floyd. It didn't. We know that he had a, a tolerance because he used uh, drugs in the past, and the experts all agree, the videos show, that George Floyd did not die the way Someone who dies from a fentanyl overdose dies. His breathing, it didn't slow down. Right? He didn't fall asleep. He didn't go into a coma. Oh, this looked nothing like a fatal fentanyl overdose. Dr. Tobin, the only doctor in this case who actually calculated George Floyd's respiratory rate, and the best doctor to do so, given his training and given his experience, right? he stated that, that the fentanyl in George Floyd's system did not depress his respiration. It didn't. He did not die of a drug overdose. That's not how he died. He didn't die of excited delirium. You heard about excited delirium. Right? Dr. Smock, uh, who testified about excited delirium, told you, explained to you, he didn't, uh, George Floyd did not exhibit any of the signs of excited delirium, one of which being super, superhuman strength. Nonsense. There's no superhuman strength. There's no superhuman strength. There are no superhumans. 
impervious to pain. Nonsense. You heard him. You saw him. He was not impervious to pain. It's nonsense. Paraganglioma. Suggestion that this tumor, which is literally called an incidental tumor, relatively rare, maybe causes headaches, but that, that that caused his death? At that particular moment in time, at that time, at that place, after the restraint, after the subdual, after the nine minutes and 29 seconds, the tumor that causes headaches, that killed him? No. That's, that's just a story. And Dr. Rich specifically uh, testified that he looked in George Floyd's medical records <clears throat> and he did not find references to headaches. And you heard about carbon monoxide. Well, the car killed him. Well, Dr. Tobin came back and explained, right, this car, which had a catalytic converter that was outside, that was a hybrid, and there's no evidence was even on, right, that that, that did not kill him. Right? He explained carbon monoxide saturation level, I'm sorry, uh, oxygen saturation level, and based on his calculation of oxygen saturation level at 98%, at most, there could have been a 2% carbon monoxide, same as anybody else, same as people walking around, talking, breathing. This wasn't carbon monoxide. That's just a story. And it's simply wrong. You, you don't have to be Dr. Tobin to recognize this. It's probably nice to be Dr. Tobin. But you don't have to be Dr. Tobin to recognize this. You can see this with your own eyes, you could see what happened, that he couldn't breathe. He said he couldn't breathe. The defendant was on top of him, on his, on his back, on his neck, with his knees pressing down. Of course, you saw how his body just sort of deflated into the ground, past the point of consciousness. There were multiple moments in time, ladies and gentlemen, multiple moments in time, that things could have gone different and George Floyd would have lived, CPR. If he would have left him in the side recovery position in the first place, or just placed him in the side recovery position you know, shortly after the restraint, he wouldn't have died. Their own force witness testified that putting somebody in the side recovery position is pretty fast, pretty easy thing to do, not complicated. Professor Stoughton said, so you just rotate them 90 degrees, quick. Could have done that. Relieve the pressure. Could have done CPR, chest compressions. Was supposed to, had a policy, had a policy he was supposed to follow. Right? A duty to provide medical aid. You're not just supposed to phone that in. You're actually supposed to use your training, provide the medical aid. Even Dr. Fowler was critical. No one starting CPR said so that should have been done. Defendant knew how to do it. He had the training. He knew better. He just didn't do better. George Floyd didn't have to die that day, shouldn't have died that day. But for the fact the defendant decided not to get up and not to let up, George Floyd died. And these actions were a substantial factor in George Floyd's death. And these actions, make no mistake, these actions were not policing. These actions were an assault. So as the judge instructed you, for second degree murder, and it's, it's actually very simple, if you find that the defendant committed this third degree assault, while committing the assault, he caused George Floyd's death, the defendant's guilty of murder. That's the way felony murder works in Minnesota. So there are two elements, right? That the defendant assaulted George Floyd. And what does that mean? Assault is the intentional infliction of bodily harm upon another or the attempt to do so. Intentional infliction of bodily harm, that requires proof that the defendant intentionally applied unlawful force to another person without that person's consent and that the act resulted in bodily harm. 
intentional. He did it on purpose. He did the thing on purpose. Bodily harm, physical pain, illness, or impairment of a person's physical condition. So again, to be very, very clear, state does not have to prove that the defendant had an intent to kill George Floyd. This was uh, an intentional act that you see before you. He, he did this on purpose. And that's clear. He didn't, again, trip and fall and find himself there. And this was also unlawful force. Officers are only authorized by law to use reasonable force. And this was not reasonable force, as I'll explain. And, and George Floyd clearly did not consent to having the defendant's knee on top of him for nine minutes and 29 seconds. When you hear someone gasping for breath, calling for their mother, begging you to get off, what, what how could you think anything else that he did not consent to this? Now, the state does not have to prove what we don't have to prove about intent. We don't have to show that the defendant intended to cause George Floyd harm. We don't have to show that. You don't need to find that the defendant was trying to cause harm or had the purpose to cause harm to conclude that this was an assault. You do not. State doesn't have to show that the defendant intended to violate the law. We don't have to show that. We don't have to show that the defendant intended to kill him. The only thing that the, the, the only thing about defendant's intent that we have to prove is that he applied force to George Floyd on purpose, that this wasn't an accident, and it's pretty simple. You know, if you're doing something that hurts somebody and you know it and you keep doing it, you're doing it on purpose. Somebody's telling you they can't breathe and you keep doing it, you're doing it on purpose. What else is going to happen when you push somebody down on the pavement? Everybody knows this. Everybody knows what happens when you push somebody against the pavement. You learn this pretty early on. We learn this pretty early on. Assault in the third degree uh, requires that the defendant inflicted substantial bodily harm on George Floyd. Right? Substantial bodily harm meaning a temporary but substantial uh, loss or impairment of the function of a bodily member or organ. Organs, the lungs, the heart. Temporary loss of consciousness qualifies as substantial bodily harm. Certainly a permanent loss of consciousness would constitute substantial bodily harm. You look at this point in the restraint and you see the absence of expression, the absence of mus muscle tension. He's unconscious. He's lost consciousness. That's substantial bodily harm. He did that. That's his knee. So when you consider the charge of second degree murder, try to break it down into parts and find an order. The defendant caused George Floyd's death. He did. The state proved that beyond a reasonable doubt. And at the time of causing the death, the defendant committed or was attempting an assault in the third degree. And that's been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. With those being proved in the venue, right, second degree felony murder, the defendant is guilty. So um, going back and talking about murder in the third degree, you can see that uh, there's some elements in common. Right? There, there's some differences. Uh, we've already discussed the first element of the death of George Floyd, the substantial causal factor with the second element, and then the fifth element about the, uh, the venue element, I'll call it, May 25, 2020 in, H in Hennepin County. 
So for third degree murder, the difference for third degree murder is that the defendant had to cause George Floyd's death by committing an act that was eminently dangerous and performed without regard for human life. And again, the state is not required for this charge either to show that the defendant intended to kill George Floyd, that he committed an act that was eminently dangerous and performed without regard for human life. And it, and it must prove, the state must prove that uh, the act was highly likely to cause death, that the defendant acted with a reckless disregard for human life, that this was a, he was consciously indifferent, consciously indifferent to loss of life that his actions could cause. The defendant's act was eminently dangerous to others. It was likely to cause death to Mr. Floyd. And as if common sense in and of itself would not suffice, the dangers of prone restraint of positional asphyxia has been known in the law enforcement community for about 30 years, right? This is known, if common sense wasn't enough. Defendant's own use of force witness admits that. And again, when we talk about danger, what is the danger? What's the potential danger of positional asphyxia? It's death, right? The medical experts who know a few things, who know a thing or two, right? Dr. Tobin, Dr. Smock, Dr. Rich, they agreed. The defendant's actions created a high risk of death. And the defendant consciously disregarded the loss of life that his actions could cause in, and did cause. He knew the risks of positional asphyxia due to this position. Everybody in law enforcement knows that. But he had other warnings, not just from his training. He had other warnings from people. He's ready to resist an arrest right now, bro. That's what I'm saying. He's ground. breathing right now, bro. You think that's cool? You think that's cool, though, right? What's your what's your oh, oh, man? What's your badge number, bro? You think that's cool right now, bro? You think that's cool, though, bro? You're a bum, bro. You're you're a bum for that. You're a bum for that, bro. You can you get mad? You just sitting here stopping his breathing right now. The dude about to go out right now, bro. Right. It was plain and apparent to everyone who was there what was happening. He's going unresponsive. He's passed out. He's not talking. What are you doing? Now, we know that the defendant chose not to listen to bystanders, not to these bystanders, but how about to fellow officers on the scene? You roll them on the side? Roll him on his side, staying put where we got him. That's what the defendant said. He's staying put where we got him. Roll him on his side means roll him into the side recovery position. He could have listened to the bystanders. He could have listened to fellow officers. He could have listened to his own training. He knew better. He just didn't do better. He knew that kneeling on somebody's neck, in addition to the positional asphyxia, just the pressure, is dangerous. Anyone can tell you that. A nine-year-old can tell you that, did tell you that. Conscious indifference? Indifference? Do you want to know what indifference is and sounds like? I'm through. 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 Uh-huh. Everything hurt. Ah, there's water or something. Please. Please. Ah, I can't breathe. Ah. Hey, don't ah. talk talking. A lot of yelling. Hey, will me. Hey, will kill me, man. Ah. Takes a heck of a lot of oxygen, though. Come on, man. Indifference. leisurely picking rocks out of the tire, commenting about the smell of the man's feet who you're pressing down, grinding on, as his voice slows and fades as he tells you, you're gonna kill me. 
I can't breathe. My stomach hurts. Uh huh. My neck hurts. Uh huh. Everything hurts. It takes a lot of oxygen to complain about it. Indifference. Did the defendant ever listen? Ever consider medical attention? No one defended that decision, the, the failure to give CPR, not even Dr. Fowler. This isn't protection. This isn't courage. And it certainly, certainly is not and was not compassion. It was the opposite of that. So back to the instructions and the elements of third degree murder. When you're deliberating, ask yourselves, did the defendant cause the death of George Floyd by an intentional act that was imminently dangerous to others? Absolutely. The state proved that. Did the defendant act with a mental state consisting of reckless disregard for human life, a conscious indifference to the loss of life that the dangerous, that the eminently dangerous act could cause? Yes, he did. And you will find, based on that, that the state has proved the defendant is guilty of third degree murder as charged. So back to the charges, let's talk about manslaughter in the second degree. And again, you can see that there's some elements in common. The first, the third is in common with the other charges. So what's different about manslaughter in the second degree is that the defendant caused the death of George Floyd by culpable negligence. Culpable negligence, where created an unreasonable risk and consciously uh, took a chance of causing death or great bodily harm. And again, we do not need to prove, the state does not need to prove that he uh, intended to, uh, that he intended to kill George Floyd. Culpable neg negligence, intentional conduct, that the defendant may not have even intended to be harmful, but that an ordinary and prudent, reasonably prudent person would recognize as involving a strong probability of injuries to others. You can look for yourself and you can see exactly what was happening. The bystanders who were at the scene looked for themselves and it was plain to them. They took video, you saw it, it was plain to you. Strong probability of injury. And with the defendant, his specialized knowledge about the dangers of positional asphyxia and the common sense that if you put your knee on somebody's neck, there's a strong probability of injury he knew that too. Great bodily harm, bodily injury that creates a high probability of death. Permanent or protracted loss or impairment of the function of a bodily member or organ. The heart, the lungs, the loss of consciousness. Would an ordinary and reasonably pers prudent person know that this is dangerous? Everybody who watched knew it was dangerous. A nine-year-old saw that it was dangerous. And the defendant knew exactly what he was doing because he was right on top. He was right on top of him. But his negligence goes beyond his intentional assault of Mr. Floyd. His negligence includes his failure to act in your custody means in your care. In your custody means in your care. There is a duty to provide medical assistance. That duty includes not only calling the ambulance for somebody else to do, it means that you have to use your knowledge, your training as a first responder. You're required to perform CPR. It's a requirement. He failed to do it. He had the training. He knew how to do it. You've seen his training records. It's Exhibit 119. You can take a look at all of the in-services, all of the hours. Right? 
He knew what to do. He just didn't do it. He knew better. He didn't do better. He wouldn't even let Genevieve Hansen, the off-duty firefighter, do it. If he wasn't going to do it himself, he would let somebody else do it. But he didn't. He had the knowledge, he had the tools, he just ignored it. So when you consider this charge, that the defendant caused George Floyd's death by culpable negligence, where he took an unreasonable risk and consciously took a chance of causing death or great bodily harm, you will find that element has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, that he is guilty of second-degree manslaughter, guilty of all three charges. So after all of this, you have another question you have to address. After seeing all of this, finding the assault, finding the murder was committed, the manslaughter was committed, you have another thing to consider. And that is, was this just okay? Was this fine? Is this okay because the defendant was a police officer? Was this an authorized use of force? Was it justified? Was it justified? It was not. Let's look at the instruction of the kind and degree of force a police officer may lawfully use in executing his duties. It's limited by what a reasonable police officer in the same situation would believe to be necessary, and force beyond that is just not reasonable. You look at the facts that a reasonable police officer in the same situation would have known at the precise moment that the officer acted with force. Right? Looking at the foul, the totality of the facts and circumstances to see whether these actions, the defendant's actions, were objectively reasonable. Was this objectively reasonable? No. We just saw the instruction that the law does not provide uh, an excuse for police abuse, it does not. Let's let's start with the most basic of premises, because that's very important. That restraining George Floyd in this manner, on the ground, prone, handcuff, knee on the neck, knee on the back, body weight on top of him, start with the premise that that in fact was a use of force. The defense called a witness who actually testified that that was not a use of force because that is not likely to produce pain. No. No. Not true. Likely to produce pain, actually produced pain. You know, the problem with terms like superhuman, superhuman strength, you forget that those people don't exist. Humans feel pain. Human beings feel pain. Human beings need to breathe. Don't accept any notion to the contrary. You need to reject that testimony. You need to reject it. And let's discuss the standard. What would a reasonable police officer do? Okay. What would a reasonable police officer do? You don't look at this from George Floyd's perspective. Okay, It's not what a reasonable victim would do. You don't look at it from the bystander's perspective. What would a reasonable bystander do? But under the law, you don't look at it from the defendant's perspective. over and over that the defendant is not that officer because he did not act as a reasonable officer would. Okay. Oh. Remember Charles McMillan? Okay. Well, the defendant explained his actions. He explained the basis of his actions to Charles McMillan. You recall that. Here's what he said. That was his justification for using this level of force. He's a big guy. He's a sizable guy. He might be on something. We have to control him. Control is the restraint. So that's the force. Okay. His two justifications were that George Floyd was big and that he might be on something. Well, you know the standards. 
You've heard the standards many times. You know the difference between a risk and a threat. Officers are authorized to use force to respond to a threat. They're not authorized to use force to respond to a risk. Anybody poses a potential risk, big, small, in between. Everybody's a risk. Not everybody's a threat. Being large, the act of being large, it's not a crime. It's not a risk. Sorry, it's not a threat. It's merely a risk. Being on something, being on something, it's not a threat. It may be a risk, but it's not a threat. And force is not authorized against someone merely because they're on something. And when questioned, their force expert witness conceded that the combination of the two, being large and being on something, is not a justification for the use of force. It just isn't. That's not what they get to do. Right? So the defendant's entire basis, his explanation to Charles McMillan at the time, at the scene, right afterwards, after he got up off of Mr. Floyd and tossed him on that gurney and walked away like it was nothing. That was his explanation. It's not good enough. It's not procedure. It's not the use of force policy. It's not following the rules. Now, we talked a lot about things that might have happened, could have happened, potentials, hypotheticals. Talked about a lot of stuff that didn't happen. You need to focus on what did happen. What did happen. George Floyd was not a threat. He never was. He wasn't resisting. He just wasn't able to comply. They should have recognized that. They should have recognized that. They do it all the time. They had him handcuffed. They had plenty of resources. They had four officers. They had a fifth one off in the distance. He was handcuffed behind his back. He wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't doing anything. He didn't need to be put in the prone position. That's a temporary position to facilitate handcuffing. But the defendant was on top of him, stayed on top of him, grinding his knees into him, pressing down on him, continuing to twist his arm, twist his wrist, that would buck up against the handcuff. A pain compliance technique without the opportunity to comply is simply the infliction of pain, not a reasonable use of force. And it's not authorized by the Minneapolis Police Department. Kneeling on top of someone on their neck and their back, effectively they were using a maximal restraint technique. Effectively, Remember the hobble, the rip hobble? You heard about that? They considered using it. They thought about using it. Decided not to. They didn't need to. Right? Because it wasn't doing anything that would warrant it. But if you're going to restrain someone like that, completely holding them down, the policy authorizes the use of the hobble, the rip hobble. Right? They didn't do that. The policy about applying the rip hobble is, again, you have to put the person immediately in the side recovery position. No. Why didn't they do that? The conduct didn't warrant it. They knew it. They didn't want to get a sergeant, have to get a sergeant down there to do a force review. It's Memorial Day. You heard that comment. They talked about that. So they just held him in this dangerous position against policy. A reasonable officer wouldn't do that. A reasonable officer follows the rules. A reasonable officer follows the training. Force that carries a risk of death is deadly force. And you recall the MPD defense uh, tactics and control guide. Like deadly force is just not authorized in this situation. No force when someone is passed out, on the ground, unresponsive. No. You really can't even claim that Mr. Floyd was engaged in passive resistance. At this point, remember Charles McMillan? He kept saying, get up and get in the car. Get up and get in the car. And George Floyd said, I will. I can't. He doesn't even have the opportunity. He's saying he'll get up and get in the car. He isn't given the opportunity to do that. That's not resistance. That's compliance. 
at least an attempt to comply. Force must be reasonable. It must be reasonable at the point it starts, at the point it ends, and all points in between, officers are required to reassess the situation, to reevaluate the situation, to take in the information and react to it. The defendant didn't do it. The defense has made the argument that the crowd justified defendant's use of force, like the blame should fall on the bystanders for displaying concern over a man's life? What? But this was a distraction and there was some concern. Uh, the defendant doesn't appear too concerned. It wasn't the bystander's fault. A 19-year police veteran, a field training officer, with over 800 hours of training, should not be distracted by the comments of a 17-year-old or being filmed by some civilians. There's a policy about filming. They understand that civilians can film them. Right? They know that. It's right there. This isn't something new or earth-shattering or, or even particularly uh, noteworthy. Um, Sergeant St uh, Steiger, you recall him from LAPD, he used to patrol on Skid Row. He talked about people throwing rocks and bottles. Now this is, they have a phone, they have phones. They're expressing concern. They're not doing anything. This is not a justification for, for an assault, for murder. Defense suggested in their cross-examination that reasonable minds can disagree, uh, or that some of the witnesses don't line up exactly where the force began or what exactly should be done, but don't get caught up in that. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Consider the testimony as a whole. Officer after officer after officer got on that stand, raised their hand, and told you, the chief of police, right, that this conduct, the 929, violates the use of force policy, violates the department's core values. He violated his duty of care. He failed to render aid. Remember Commander, now Inspector Katie Blackwell, who, who was in charge of all training, looked at this and said, I don't even know what this is. I don't know what this modification is. This isn't how they train. This, these aren't the rules. Okay. Lieutenant Mercer looked at this and he said, without equivocation, not an MPD trained tactic. It is not. We don't train our people to do this. You can present a thousand hypothetical situations. You can talk about what didn't happen all day long into next week. But when you talk about what did happen on that day, at that time, that's what they said. Use of force, unreasonable. Supervisor, Sergeant Pluger, the force should have ended right after Mr. Floyd was on the ground. His supervisor said that. Lieutenant Zimmerman, the oldest serving, or I should say the most years of service on the Minneapolis Police Department, longest serving, correct myself, longest serving member of the department. What did he say? He looked at this. He said this was totally unnecessary, totally unnecessary, a use of deadly force, not reasonable. Only reasonable force is authorized. Sergeant Steiger, expert witness, Los Angeles Police Department. He's trained thousands of police officers. He looked at this. This is objectively unreasonable force. Professor Stoughton, Professor Stoughton, former police officer, University of South Carolina Law School professor. This use of force was unreasonable, it was disproportionate, and it violates national standards. The experts agree. Because the force has to be reasonable when it starts, it has to be reasonable when it ends, and what is happening? If you look at the bottom, George Floyd is handcuffed and on the ground. Right? What is he saying? He's saying, 
I can't breathe 27 times within the first four minutes and 45 seconds of this encounter. He's saying that. And the defendant continues to kneel on his back and neck, continue the dangerous restraint. George Floyd says, into the restraint at 822.24, my stomach hurts, my neck hurts, anything, everything hurts. Defendant heard that, he heard those words. Was George Floyd resisting when he was trying to breathe? No, no. And the defendant heard it and he acknowledged it and all he did was mock him. Uh-huh. It takes a lot of oxygen to complain. That's what he said. It takes a lot of oxygen to say that. When George Floyd gave his final words to the defendant, please, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Crying out for help by the man in, for the man in uniform. <laughs> the defendant stayed right on top of him, ignored it. Continued doing what he was doing, facing the crowd, grinding his knee, twisting his hand. I think he's passing out, Officer Lane says. Officer King can't find a pulse. Now, the greatest skeptic of this case among you, how can you justify the continued force on this man when he has no pulse? No pulse. Continued. The restraint continued grinding and twisting and pushing him down and crushing the very life out of him. It wasn't too late. He could have rolled him over, performed CPR. No, he continued past the point of finding a pulse, past the point where the ambulance arrives, past the point where the EMTs get out of the ambulance. What's the goal? What's the plan here? What are we trying to accomplish? This was a counterfeit $20 bill, allegedly. <laughs> what is going on? Why? Why hold him that long, past that point, past that line that was crossed? No. Oh. Unreasonable force. Unreasonable. Not proportional. Excessive. It violated policy, it violated the law, it violated everything that the Minneapolis Police Department stood for. It is not lawful. I use that phrase, awful but lawful. Right? But force that is not lawful, it's, it's just awful. So the defendant is guilty of second degree murder. He's guilty of third degree murder. He's guilty of second degree manslaughter. All of them. Because this was not a justified use of force. You cannot justify this use of force. It's impossible. Not if you apply the rules, not if you apply the standards. That a sworn officer to protect and serve. That a sworn officer, that oath that they take. You know, at the beginning of my comments, I talked about George Floyd's life, how he was surrounded by people who cared about him, uh, surrounded by familiar faces, people he could look out to in the crowd. But at his death, he was surrounded by strangers. Um, they were strangers, but you can't say they didn't care. You can't say that. These people were randomly chosen from the community, people from the community randomly chosen by fate. And they were coming from different places and they were going to different places and they had different purposes, all of them. Random members of the community, all converged by fate at one single moment in time to witness something, to witness nine minutes and 29 seconds of shocking abuse of authority to watch a man die. And there was nothing they could do about it because they were powerless. They were utterly powerless because even they respected the badge. Even seeing this happening, they tried 
they cried out at first, pointed out, hey, you can get up off him. It became more and more desperate as they watched us go on and on and on, and there was nothing. There was nothing they could do. All they could do, all they could do was watch and gather what they could, gather their memories, gather their thoughts and impressions, gather those precious recordings. And they gathered those up and they brought them here and they brought them here and they got up on a stand and they testified and they bore witness to what they saw. They bore witness to this outrageous act and they told you about it and they gave you what they had, their thoughts, their impressions, their memories. They gave you those precious recordings so you can see this. You can see this from every single angle. They gave that to you. They were powerless to do anything but that. They gave it to you. Randomly selected people from the community. You got a summons in the mail. And here you are. All converged on one spot. Now, our system, uh, we have power. Uh, the power actually belongs to us, the people. And we give it to the government in trust for us to hold and to use appropriately. But sometimes we take it back. Sometimes when something is really important, we reserve those decisions for ourselves. The state, we have power. We cannot convict the defendant. The judge has power but he cannot convict the defendant. That power, that power belongs to you. You have that power, and only you have the power to convict the defendant of these crimes. And in so doing, and in so doing, declare that this use of force was unreasonable. It was excessive. It was grossly disproportionate. It is not an excuse for the shocking abuse that you saw with your own eyes. And you can believe your own eyes. This case is exactly what you thought when you saw it first, when you saw that video. It is exactly that. You can believe your eyes. It's exactly what you believed. It's exactly what you saw with your eyes. It's exactly what you knew. It's what you felt in your gut. It's what you now know in your heart. This wasn't policing. This was murder. The defendant is guilty of all three counts. All of them. And there's no excuse. Thank you. Members of the jury, we're going to take a 20-minute break. And just for your information, we'll also take a 20-minute break after the defense uh, argument before the state's rebuttal and the final instructions. All right, you have been listening to Hennepin County Court. We've been listening to closing arguments in the case of Derek Chauvin, the man, the former police officer accused of killing George Floyd. Uh, let's recap some of this. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Joyce Vance. She's a former U.S. attorney. She's a professor at the University of Alabama Law School, and she's been watching all of this with us. Um, several things I found notable. I mean, essentially, this was the prosecution saying, believe your eyes. You saw the tape. What happened there was that George Floyd died from a lack of oxygen. I also thought it was really interesting how many times the prosecution said this is not about policing. This is not about the police force. This is about one man's actions. He said he's not on trial for being an officer. He's on trial for what he did. Uh, that is a strategic argument. Uh, that's absolutely right. The prosecution wants to avoid any possibility of a member of the jury thinking that they're targeting policing written large. And so the prosecutor was careful to say, you know, this is the state of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin, not versus the Minneapolis Police Department. 
And he closed by saying very powerfully, this wasn't policing, this was murder, encouraging the jury to draw that distinction. And, and talk briefly, Joyce, about what this jury is going to have in front of them. Next, we'll hear from the defense, and then there will be a rebuttal. But eventually, this will go to the jury. It will, and with them, they'll have access to evidence, to videotapes. Very importantly, they'll have access to the judge's jury instructions, which explain the law that they're supposed to use in evaluating the facts. You know, this is a difficult process, and I think for those who stuck through this entire closing argument by the prosecution, you get a sense of just how much evidence there is here that has to be considered and that has to be reconciled because all of it's not consistent. Even sometimes prosecution witnesses uh, have different ways of saying things. So the prosecution closing argument is their first shot to talk with the jury about what the evidence means. Up until this point, the jury has been hearing the evidence as it comes in on direct examination, on cross-examination, and now the prosecutor looks the jury in the eye and tells them, here's the law that the judge has explained to you. Here's why our evidence establishes guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And the jury can review that evidence, and I suspect that they will very carefully as they deliberate before they reach a verdict on each of the three charges against Derek Chauvin. All right, stand by. Let me go to NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. He's been following this trial all along. He joins us from outside the Hennepin County Courthouse, where those arguments have just been, been underway from the prosecution. Uh, Gabe, I wonder if you can walk us through what's going to happen the rest of today, but, but, but also the significance of this trial and this moment. It goes far beyond Minneapolis. It, it, it's going to affect the whole country. Uh, yeah, that, Kate, that's exactly right. And as Joyce mentioned, the prosecution went through great pains just now to talk about how this is not an anti-police prosecution, but that it is a prosecution on the actions of one man, Derek Chauvin. But what is significant, Kate, and we'll be here, we, what we've been hearing really from across the country is how significant this trial in how police officers testified against one of their own. We saw cop after cop take the witness stand, including the police chief of Minneapolis, and talk about how Derek Chauvin went too far. And the prosecution brought that up in its closing argument. You saw one graphic, a prosecution exhibit, that had seven police officers all saying in various degrees how Derek Chauvin not only violated policy, but in the prosecution's view, violated the law. This is something that will be closely watched really across the country, even as protests are unfolding, not far from here in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, but also in Chicago and in communities across this country as all eyes are on Minneapolis. There has been a lot of attention paid to the so-called blue wall of silence, how many police officers do not testify against their own, and that so-called blue wall seemed to be crumbling during this trial. But, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton and the Floyd family at the beginning of this trial, right before jury selection, talked about how the American policing system was on trial, although both the prosecution and the defense have really stressed that this is really about Derek Chauvin and his actions. But talking about what we expect to see for the rest of the day, uh, as you said, after this break, the defense will come in and give its closing arguments. Then we expect the prosecution to give the rebuttal. It is possible as well that the judge can give a few more brief jury instructions before this is handed off to the jury. The jury will then be sequestered while it discusses and debates among themselves the charges against Derek Chauvin case. And Gabe, what do we know about this jury? You know, who, who are they? Right. Well, right now there are 14 members of this jury. Uh, two of them will be dismissed. There will be two uh, alternates. Um, as of now, I believe uh, that there are eight white jurors, uh, four black jurors, two of mixed race. And they went through a very extensive uh, jury selection process, Kate. And one of the main questions in their jury questionnaire was their views on Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. This was a, a theme that really has been um, uh, you know, brought up very much during this trial from the very beginning. 
both the prosecution and the defense wanted to get jurors' thoughts on how they felt uh, about those two movements. Um, I was in the courtroom last week and was able to see these jurors in person. Of course, they are um, not uh, on camera uh, and they will remain anonymous during these entire proceedings. But I was able to gauge their reactions. It's difficult because of COVID protocols. Uh, they have masks on, so you can't see their reactions, for example, when a witness is testifying. But I did notice that they all seem extremely engaged during uh, the witness that I saw, a cardiologist, during certain parts of the testimony, many of them, al almost all of them, would uh, go and take notes and seem very engaged for even technical medical terminology. So uh, they, you know, it's hard to get into their minds. They, they at least seem to know the, the, the weight of this moment, the weight of this trial, and seem to be paying extremely close attention. Of course, the question uh, will be how long will this deliberations take? That's impossible to predict in a trial like this. Um, but again, there are 14 jurors right now. Two of them will be dismissed uh, as alternates, and they will begin deliberations, presumably, uh, within the next few hours, Kate. All right, Gabe, thank you. And they must know that the eyes of the world are, are on them right now. I, I want to go to former Seattle police chief, NBC News law enforcement analyst Carmen Best is with us as well. Picking up on, on what we were just talking about with Gabe and, and the question of use of force, appropriate use of force. Gabe mentioned all the officers, including the chief of police in Minneapolis, who, who testified for the prosecution, um, describing the use of force by Derek Chauvin as excessive, as inappropriate. What do you think of that argument that you just heard in, in the prosecution's closing argument? I think the prosecution did a really good job of highlighting the fact that they have to utilize the reasonable officer standard. And there were multiple officers, up to and including the police chief, that said this simply was not reasonable what he did. Uh, leaving his knee on the neck and back of George Floyd for over nine minutes was excessive. It was outside of policy and it was not reasonable. And that point needed to be driven home and made very clear. I thought it was made exceptionally clear uh, by all the people who uh, came forward to talk about the policies, the training, the practices. And clearly, uh, no one trains people to leave someone in uh, duress like that for over nine minutes um, without doing anything to uh, safeguard their safety, without putting them into the recovery position. And I'm sure that as the officers and the chief are watching this, you know, that they are glad that they came forward in the manner that they did and very concerned, even though policing itself is not on trial we do know, as you've noted, that um, the world is watching and that people will be wanting to see justice served here. Uh, and if not, certainly, um, you know, they're going to be really concerned about, you know, uh, the aftermath uh, once the verdict is reached. So I know that's what I would be thinking of if I was the police chief there. And I've been a chief, but I know these right. are the concerns that you have. How are you going to maintain public safety when you are right now the focus of uh, such a volatile, potentially volatile situation? Yeah, and, and Gabe mentioned preparations underway in Minneapolis and many cities across the country right now, just in case. Yeah, that is correct. Um, you know, there have been situations. This has been a really tough week for law enforcement. It seems like every day we have seen something that took us to a new low. And now we have this case uh, that is so critically important with national, international attention. And absolutely, uh, law enforcement and officers all across the country are going to be really uh, trying to prepare uh, for what might occur. Obviously, none of us is clairvoyant and knows what the outcome is. Everyone's hoping for justice to be served. Um, but then they have to also uh, consider, as we did in Seattle, you know, protecting facilities, protecting the officers. You have a responsibility to do that as well, protecting community and property and life safety, uh, which means that you have to be prepared with as many resources as possible. Uh, you know, it doesn't look pretty, um, but it, also those things have to be taken into consideration. All right, Carmen Best, stay with us. Thank you. Uh, just to recap, and if you're just joining us, we are in a brief break right now in the Derek Chauvin trial in Minneapolis. Uh, that's, of course, the officer, the former police officer accused of killing George Floyd. We heard from the prosecution uh, more than an hour and a half closing argument from the prosecution. Uh, Steve Schleicher presenting their case. What we expect to happen after a 20-minute break, and we're maybe about 
10 minutes or so into that right now. We expect to then hear uh, from the defense. The defense will have their opportunity to present their closing arguments. And then after that, a rebuttal from the prosecution. And at that point, the jury uh, would be instructed by the judge and would get this case and start their deliberations potentially today, although we don't know what the timing is for, for all these arguments. Uh, let's turn to criminal defense attorney, NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, who's been watching along with us as well. Danny, given what the prosecution just did in that hour and a half, what does the defense need to do next? Look for the defense to take a calm, measured approach, a lot like the prosecution, and ideally have some demonstrative exhibits like that very effective chart that the prosecution had, and hammering home their themes. No surprises in the prosecution's closing. They should stick to the plan, and the plan is attack on causation and attack on the idea that the neck compression and restraint was not only not eminently dangerous, not a felony, but it's something that was taught and acceptable and rely on your own use of force expert, the defense's expert, uh, who said that this was something that was acceptable. Uh, really stress your own medical expert, your own scientific expert who uh, attacked causation for the prosecution. But more than that, rely on Dr. Baker, the prosecution's own expert, the medical examiner, who not surprisingly, the prosecution sandwiched between a bunch of other experts that gave the prosecution evidence they liked better. And the reason for that was the actual medical examiner, the only person to put hands on George Floyd, gave some testimony that was good for the defense. Expect him to feature prominently in the defense's closing, but they will stick to the plan. They will hammer home causation. Uh, they will say the state has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin's knee was a substantial factor in George Floyd's death. Then they will go to the training and uh, argue that the restraint, as it was, was not eminently dangerous, was not a felony. Uh, there's nothing much to change in the plan, but look for the prosecution as calm as they were in the beginning. Because they get that final word, that's when the prosecution might start breathing fire and brimstone uh, and be a lot more animated. Look for that at the very end after the defense is closing. Hmm. And I'm sorry, I was trying to jump in because I wondered about what we were just talking about with, with Carmen Best, with the former Seattle police chief, the, the, the wall of blue, the, the fact that you had the chief of police and, and several officers testify that it was inappropriate to use that much force. How does the defense counter that right now for the jury? I mean, what do they say about that? All they can really do is make some paper cuts there. And by that, I mean point out that, for example, the chief hasn't arrested anyone in so many years, for example, or that they were not physically present, weren't there in the scene. They can't take into account all the other contextual features that even the video doesn't capture. Uh, that's what the defense will have to argue. Look, the video is the strongest piece of the prosecution's evidence. The defense's challenge is to get the jury's attention away from the video and start thinking about what's not on the video, which is, you know, Blood, blood levels of fentanyl, uh, methamphetamine, and George Floyd's poor health, most of which you can't see from the video. The defense needs to make that clear, uh, either through their experts or through other scientific evidence. Look for them to push that and not rely on video at all, because most of the video is bad for the defense. And Danny, in terms of the charges, you saw the prosecution with their chart trying to guide the jury and say, you know, check this box, check, the, check this box. They've, they've fulfilled, the prosecution argues, every element needed to convict on all three charges. What will the defense argument be about how to, you know, how will they blow holes in, in those particulars? First, that's always really effective for prosecutors to walk jurors through, almost like you're building a model airplane, because you know that when jurors get in that room and the door shuts and they're finally allowed to talk about the case, there's always an element of, well, what do we do now? And sitting down and essentially talking them through that, giving them a, a guide for going through the jury instructions is very effective. And it's even more so. Plenty of studies have shown that visual aids, walking jurors through those, uh, those essentially PowerPoints, can be very, very effective. So the defense sees that and they know that they really, their duty isn't to build a case the way the prosecution does, but chop away at particular elements. There's some elements that the defense can't dispute, uh, that a death happened, for example, or that it happened in Hennepin County. But obviously they're going to attack one or two elements that they think they have the strongest case against. And of course, causation hits all of those crimes and also justification that the uh, neck compression 
and subdual restraint was somehow justified. And you saw the prosecution anticipate that and try to nip that in the bud before the defense gets up. But the defense has to has to stress those two major points, because uh, if the jury believes that Derek Chauvin did not legally cause the death, yet that is to say he did not set facts in motion that caused the death, he wasn't a substantial factor, that's a defense, for example, to all charges, as is justification on the use of force, a defense to all charges. So look for the defense maybe not to use such a an explicit demonstrative exhibit and go through each and every element, but instead to think broader, big, you know, big picture. Causation is a defense to absolutely everything. Uh, if you find he didn't cause death legally, that is, then you must acquit. Similarly, if the force was authorized or justified or at least not a felony and not imminently dangerous, then you must acquit as to these charges. He'll still walk them through uh, the elements, but maybe in a less meticulous manner because that's not the defense's burden. All right, Danny, thank you. Stand by for us. I, I want to just recap the prosecution's closing arguments. If you're just joining us, it was more than an hour and a half that attorney Steve Schleicher got very personal in visceral detail, described George Floyd's anguished final moments. Just a human, just a man lying on the pavement, being pressed upon, desperately crying out, a grown man crying out for his mother, a human being. Mary Moriarty is the former chief public defender for Hennepin County, Minnesota. That's the Minneapolis area. That's the area where this courtroom is. Uh, Mary, you've been watching all of this. You know, I'm sure, all of the players involved here. What were your thoughts on the prosecution's closing argument? He started out by saying his name was George Perry Floyd. And I think that centered all of us into what this case is really about. So it was a really effective opening uh, line. And he went on to talk about George Floyd being surrounded by family all of the time. And he ended by talking about uh, him being surrounded by people who bore witness to what happened to him. So he started out really well. He ended really well. I think it bogged down a little bit in the middle. It was a little too long. But I understand there's a lot of information he was trying to get out. There were themes he mentioned over and over. Um, you can believe your eyes. He knew better, but he didn't do better. Uh, so I think it was pretty strong. It covered the bases. They also got really favorable jury instructions from the judge. And I think those are going to make a, a big difference. And one example of that is that the defense asked, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, how do you mean? Uh, because for, 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 for us, for non-lawyers, <laughs> there were a lot of instructions to the jury, a lot of detail. How do you mean it was favorable? Uh, one of them was that the defense had asked for the 2020 hindsight instruction, which other judges have given in police officer shootings. Uh, for instance, in the Yanez case with Philando Castile. And what that instruction says is that you look at it from a reasonable police officer's point of view without uh, 2020 hindsight. Um, and so the 2020 hindsight instruction, I think, puts the jury in a bit of a, a box in that they don't want to say second guess officers um, because they weren't there. And we've heard the defense try to argue that throughout the case, but they will not get that instruction. Uh, the defense also asked for a different instruction on causation. Uh, they asked for the judge to instruct the jurors that George Floyd's heart, the drug use, that sort of thing was a superseding cause. He did not do that. In fact, he kind of went the opposite and said that uh, superseding causes had to be the cause of death. And so the, the jury would have to find that the heart, uh, anything else that the defense raised was the cause of death, whereas the state simply has to prove that Chauvin's actions were a substantial cause of death or started the chain reaction that led to his death. So the specific instructions they got were very favorable for the state. All right. Mary Moriarty, uh, former chief public defender right there in Hennepin County, she'll stay with us as well. Uh, I do want to let people know that we're about 
a minute or two away from the end of the 20 minutes that the judge had said they would take. He had said they would break for 20 minutes and then come back for the defense presentation of their closing arguments. We are continuing to monitor the courtroom, obviously, and as soon as we see activity, we'll go back to that. But for the moment, let me bring in civil rights lawyer and former prosecutor David Henderson, who's with us. Uh, let's talk about the video that we saw. The prosecution really did rely on showing pictures and, and frankly, very disturbing video. We've all seen it. Um, but, you know, this is it's it's difficult to watch again. Do you think that was effective? Kate, I do believe that's effective because that's a primary vehicle that's driving the prosecution's case. And what I think it's important to remember is, whereas we've been having conversations about the case every evening, talking through how the case is going to develop, today is the first day the jury might begin deliberating about everything they've seen. So it's really important to use that video to remind them about that strong emotional content. When you're giving a closing argument like this one, especially when it lasts so long, you want to have what I call sticky communications, things that stick in people's minds that they'll refer back to during jury deliberation. An hour and 40 minutes may not seem like a lot, but when you combine that with the amount of time that Judge Cahill spent giving the instructions, you're approaching the length of a movie. And whenever you talk for that long, past the length, most people can sit through a sermon. You run the risk of people having a really difficult time focusing on what's most important. All right, David Henderson, thank you so much. Stay with us as well. I, I want to bring in Eugene Robinson. He's a Washington Post columnist and NBC News political analyst. Uh, if you've been with us all morning, I, I interrupted you earlier, Eugene. I'm sorry, when we were going to the courtroom. I hope I won't have to do that again. Um, yeah. But but I am so curious about your thoughts as we sit here on a, on a pivotal day for the nation. Well, you know, first of all, live TV is live TV. So if we, if, when the judge comes out, I go. But um, <laughs> appreciate uh, that. Uh, listen, you know, watching the arguments, they're, they're, the moments that really jumped out at me because they just just tugged at, at my insides were when he when um, Prosecutor Schleicher talked about the two men about George Floyd and Derek Chauvin and what was going on in their minds. Um, and, and because I think that's something the jury will want to do. They'll, they'll want to understand how, why George Floyd acted the way he acted. Uh, and as Slicer explained, he, you know, he was feeling claustrophobic. He was, he was being set upon. He didn't quite know what was going on. Um, he, he, was, uh, he was trying to cooperate. He was calling Chauvin, Mr. Officer. And then why did Chauvin do it? Basically, he said, because Chauvin could because he wanted to show everybody he was the we boss. And I think uh, now Eric Nelson is beginning. ...places on your personal and professional lives, especially in a case of this magnitude and duration. And so on behalf of Mr. Chauvin... All right, we're going to listen in now the, as the defense attorney begins his closing argument. ...to this jury. I'm, I'm going to apologize if I get a little long-winded, because I get one bite at the apple here. The state has an opportunity to rebut my statement after this. There's so very much we need to cover. There's so very much we need to talk about. And it is all important. Before I begin my review of the evidence in this case, I would like to address two very crucial points of law. And they were touched on by the state. The presumption of innocence and what proof beyond a reasonable doubt means. The presumption of innocence, the defendant is presumed innocent. That's the starting point. He's presumed innocent of these charges. And this presumption remains with him throughout the course of the trial, the presentation of the evidence, throughout the course of your deliberations, until and unless the state has proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant does not have to prove his innocence. We talked about this in jury selection. We talked about the starting point. The defendant doesn't have to try to catch up. He starts at the presumption of innocence. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Here's the definition that the judge just read you. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is such proof as ordinary prudent men and women would act upon in their most important affairs. A reasonable doubt is a doubt that is based upon reason and common sense. 
it does not mean a fanciful or capricious doubt, nor does it mean beyond all possibility of doubt. The law recognizes three standards of proof. The preponderance of the evidence is the first and lowest standard. Clear and convincing evidence is the next standard. And the third standard is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the way we lawyers sometimes illustrate what these three standards mean is through the scales of justice, right? The scales of justice equally balanced. When you apply the standard of the preponderance of the evidence, it's also called the scintilla of the evidence. A single grain of sand tips the scales in the favor of one party or the other. And this burden of proof is used in many civil cases. Somebody, if the state wants to take away your driver's license, for an example, that is the burden of proof that the state has in that type of a case. They have to just ever so slightly convince the finder of fact that their evidence supports their action. The next standard is clear and convincing evidence. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? It is clear evidence, and it convinces you, the finder of fact, that the action is correct. This is the standard of proof that is used if the state wants to take away your children. Clear and convincing evidence. It tips the scales more in one, the favor of one party over the other. The highest standard in this country is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Essentially, what the state has to convince you is that there, the evidence in this case completely eliminates any reasonable doubt, or in other words, leaving only unreasonable doubt. Capricious, fanciful. Capricious doubt, capricious means unpredictable. Fanciful. Space aliens flew in, inhabited the body of Derek Chauvin, and caused this death. That's fanciful. Beyond the reasonable doubt, it is the highest standard in the law. It doesn't mean beyond all possibility of doubt, because I suppose space aliens may have been inhabiting his body, but that's obviously fanciful and capricious. So this, these two standards, the presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, work in concert with each other. You start with the proposition that Mr. Chauvin is innocent of these charges. The state has to advance substantial evidence to convince you that the only doubts that are remaining are unreasonable doubts. As you analyze the evidence in this case, you would simply have to find that any defense that has been advanced is unreasonable. That's, I mean, that's what this standard is all about. I want to take this opportunity also to talk to you about the importance of reading the entire instruction. Because I've seen you know, and lawyers, and, and I'm going to do it too, right? We pick and choose those things that uh, help us make our case and help us argue our case. That's our job as lawyers, is to point out words and phrases within the instructions that, that make the difference in the case, and to take that evidence and present it to you in such a way that it supports our proposition. That's what we do. That's why you are instructed that if your memories of the evidence is different, that if your 
the, the judge's law is what applies. But take the time to carefully read the entire instructions. Throughout the course of this trial, you've seen us do this, right? Little snippets, a second here, a second there, a screenshot here, a screenshot there. You need to review the entirety of the evidence in this case it, during the course of your deliberations as well. And I can tell you that some of the videos that we've seen, they're much longer than what was presented in court. There's additional information, and you're going to see some of that as we go through this case today. So take the time and conduct an honest assessment of the facts of this case, compare it to the law as the judge instructs you, and the entirety of the law. That's why the instructions tell you, consider the instructions as a whole. I've, I've told you that lawyers like to present evidence that favors them, right? But we have to be intellectually honest about the evidence. We have to present it in an honest and intellectually cohesive and coherent manner. And I have to address something that I think is important. And I think it is a prime example of what I am asking you and what is your obligation to do to look at the evidence in light of all of the other pieces of evidence, right? So you heard during the testimony of Dr. Fowler that one of the things that he considered is the possibility that carbon monoxide was present and could have contributed to an environment that created an oxygen deprivation. You've, you heard that testimony. In rebuttal to that testimony, the state brought Dr. Tobin back in and he told you, we can completely disregard that. We know as a fact, we know conclusively that Mr. Uh, Floyd did not have carbon monoxide because his oxygen was saturated to 98%. And you just heard the state say, just like I am right here, right? So it stands to reason. I could get up in front of you and I could argue to you, we know this wasn't asphyxiation because George Floyd had a 98% oxygen level. How could he have been asphyxiated at the hospital with a 98% oxygen level. But that's not intellectually honest. It doesn't stack up against the rest of the evidence because of what we know, right? We heard the testimony of Seth Bravender and Derek Smith, the paramedics. We heard the testimony of Dr. Langenfeld. They came in and they said, they began resuscitative effort, efforts. They introduced oxygen, an oxygen supply. We, they're, they're manually breathing for him. They're reoxygenating his blood. So when you look at that piece of evidence, when you look at a piece of evidence like that, you have to compare it against all of the other evidence. Because you can't come in and say, George Floyd, on one hand, George Floyd died of asphyxiation, but he has a 98% oxygen level, right? His blood is oxygenated. Then it is, stands to reason the opposite is true as well. You can't come in and say, I can conclusively prove that Mr. Floyd didn't have carbon monoxide in his blood because he had this high oxygen saturation. You test one statement against the evidence of other people and you compare it. That is what you as jurors are obligated to do and what I am asking you to do. Compare the evidence against itself. Test it. Challenge it. Compare it to the law. Read the instructions in their entirety. Start from the point of the presumption of innocence and see how far the state can get. I submit to you that the state has failed 
to meet its burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Mr. Chauvin has been charged, as the state indicated, with these three charges, and the judge has instructed you. Count one is second-degree murder while committing a felony. It's also called the felony murder rule in Minnesota. Kind of the textbook example is I run into a liquor store, I pull a gun, I'm intending to rob the liquor store. My gun goes off, I shoot and kill the teller. I didn't intend to go in and murder that person, but my, the death of that teller occurred while I was committing a felony. That's the felony murder rule. He's been charged with murder in the third degree for, for performing an intentional act that was eminently dangerous. Right? You've seen the instructions, you've heard them. And manslaughter in the second degree. Again, the law has all of the words, it defines the words you need, and the instructions should be considered in their entirety. Whenever I meet with a client, I try to explain what the elements are, and this is the analogy that I use. I say that a criminal case is kind of like baking chocolate chip cookies. You have to have the necessary ingredients. You've got to have flour and sugar and butter and chocolate chips, and whatever else goes into those chocolate chip cookies. If you have all of the ingredients, you can make chocolate chip cookies. But if you're missing any one single ingredient, you can't make chocolate chip cookies. It's a simple kind of analogy. But the criminal law works the same way. We say, the we call the ingredients the elements. The state has the burden of proving each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. Not just some global proposition that they've proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to prove each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you determine that they have done so, you convict. But if they are missing any one single element, any one single element, it is a not guilty verdict. And you saw the spreadsheet that the state put up, right? The elements are a little different in each of these cases. And some of these elements will take less of your consideration. You will have to look at the evidence and you will have to, for example, determine is Cup Foods in the city of Minneapolis, is Minneapolis in the county of Hennepin, is Hennepin County in the state of Minnesota? Did this happen on May 25th, 2020? Right? It's going to take less of your consideration, but nevertheless, you have to do that. You have to go through that process. Two of the elements that I want to focus on during the course of my discussion here today, two of these elements are common throughout, or two of these issues are common and apply to all three counts. And so I want to focus my remarks today on those two issues. The first, were Mr. Chauvin's actions an authorized use of force by a peace officer, right? Because in the instructions, it specifically tells you no crime is committed if it was an authorized use of force, period, end of discussion. The second is an element that is and does appear in all three counts, that is the cause of death. What caused Mr. Floyd's death? And we're going to talk about that second. So, let's start with the concept of reasonable force. As the instructions read in their entirety, no crime is committed if a police officer's actions were justified by the police officer's use of reasonable force in the line of duty in effecting a lawful arrest or preventing an escape from custody. The kind and degree of force a police officer may lawfully use in executing his duties is limited by what a reasonable police officer in the same situation would believe to be necessary. 
any use of force beyond that is not reasonable. To determine if the actions of the police officer were reasonable, you must look at those facts which a reasonable officer in the same situation would have known at the precise moment the officer acted with force. You must decide whether the officer's actions were objectively reasonable in light of the totality of the facts and circumstances confronting the officer and without regard to the officer's own subjective state of mind, intention, or motivations. The defendant is not guilty of a crime if he used force as authorized by law. And to prove guilt, the state must further prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's use of force was not authorized by law. So, if you remember from my opening statements and how I talked about reason and common sense, right? the reasonable police officer standard. I wanna just briefly add one thing here, is the standard is not what should the officer have done in these circumstances. It's not what could the officer have done differently in these circumstances. The standard is what were the facts that were known to this officer at the precise moment he used force and considering all of the totality of circumstances and facts known to the officer, would a reasonable police officer what would a reasonable police officer have done? You have heard from numerous experts, police use of force experts, the training department from the Minneapolis Police Department. You've heard from police officers, street police officers, Sergeant Edwards, Sergeant Pluger, right? So you've heard from these people and they have given you their opinions at various stages as to the reasonableness of the use of force. But one of the things that the state, or excuse me, one of the things that all of these police officers effectively agreed to is that when you look at the question of what would a reasonable police officer do knowing the facts of the case, there are things that a police officer is entitled to take into consideration above and beyond the facts, right? Their training, the training that they receive, their, their experience as a police officer, the department's policies on the use of force. And all of these things kind of lead into the question of, most critically, what are the facts that were known to the police officer, the reasonable police officer, at the precise moment the force was used? So you can start at a very high level, right? What were the reasonable police officer's knowledge of the area be? Is this a high crime location? Is it a low crime area? Those are things, those are facts that a police officer would know. What are the specifics of the location of arrest, right? Am I going into a dense, densely populated urban environment or am I in a kind of a secluded backyard, right? Officer is calculating these pieces of information and assessing the risk, assessing the threats. Officers are entitled to kind of take into consideration things that you and I don't think about. Their tactical advantages, their tactical disadvantages. They can take into consideration the scene security keeping the scene secure and security of the scene, right? Those are two different concepts. So kind of, again, focusing back into what facts were known at the precise moment force is used, you can then take into consideration kind of this mid-range level of, of information. A reasonable officer wants to keep his fellow officers safe. A reasonable police officer takes into consideration the safety of civilians. The reasonable place, the police officer, reasonable police officer takes into account the safety of the person that they are arresting. They take into account 
What resources do I have based upon? How close am I to a hospital? What's the expected time if I call EMS? Because a poli reasonable police officer at times, they got to put the person in their squad car sometimes and take them because they're farther away. Calling for help, bringing help in would take longer than it would simply to take the person directly. And then you look at the direct knowledge that a reasonable police officer would have at the precise moment force was used. That includes information that they gather from dispatch, their direct observations of the scene, the subjects, and the current surroundings. They have to take into consideration whether they suspect the suspect was under the influence of a controlled substance. They can take into consideration because, again, this is a dynamic and ever-changing, just like life. Things change. It's a dynamic situation. It's fluid. They take into account their experience with the subject at the beginning, the middle, the end. They try to, a reasonable police officer tries to predict or is at least cognizant and concerned about future behavior based upon past behavior. But the unpredictability of humans factors into the reasonable police officer's analysis too. Because sometimes people take, reasonable police officers, take someone into custody with no problem and suddenly they become a problem. It can change in an instant. A reasonable police officer will take into consideration his immediate surroundings. Are there bystanders? Are there civilians? A reasonable police officer will take into consideration who he is at the scene with. Are these veteran officers? Are they rookie officers? What do I know about my partners and my partner's abilities? So throughout the course of this trial, the state has focused your attention on nine minutes and 29 seconds. The proper analysis is to take those nine minutes and 29 seconds and put it into the context of the totality of the circumstances that a reasonable police officer would know. And the proper analysis starts with what did the officers, or what would a reasonable officer know at the time of dispatch? Well, these are records that are kept. They've been introduced. You can look at them. This is Exhibit 151. This is the computer-aided dispatch report. You heard the testimony of Jen, uh, Jenna Scurry, the 911 dispatcher. This is information that they are passing out to the officers. you will see that the initial, the initial information that a police officer has in his squad car looking at his computer or hearing over the radio was that on May 25th, 2020, at 20.02.13, so that's 8.02.13, a business, Cup Foods, who police officers have the obligation to respond to these calls, whether it be from a person or a business, but a citizen of the state of Minnesota, Minneapolis, runs a business and they called for assistance. And they told the officers, the reporting party, there is a male who provided a counterfeit bill to the business. He's six feet tall or higher. He's sitting on top of a blue Mercedes ML320 SUV, the license plates, also appears this subject is under the influence. So the analysis of what a reasonable police officer would know in this circumstance is that A, a business is requesting its help, the suspect is still there, he's large, and he's possibly under the influence of alcohol or something else. So the analysis begins at 8.02 and 13 seconds.
You may recall the testimony of Jenna Scurry as well, and it's not reflected in this exhibit pretty well, but in the evidence, uh, exhibit number 10, you can hear the audio recording of the dispatch, Jenna Scurry to the officers. Jenna Scurry informed you that initially Officer Chauvin was assigned to this call on a Code 3 Priority 1 basis. It's Code 3, get their lights and sirens, get there fast, right? It's Priority 1 because the suspect is still on scene. So per the Minneapolis Police Department policy, get there fast, the person is on scene, right? That's what she testified. And then very quickly after that, that occurred at 8.04 and 28 seconds. Then what you see is often, or what she told you, was that the sector car, sector car 320, that's the car that patrols this part of the city, said, hey, we can take this call. And Officer Chauvin and Officer Tao were canceled from the call. Right? So they were canceled from the call. And sector car 320, Officers King and Lane took it. And that occurred at 8.05 and 11 seconds. When Officer King and Lane took it over, you can hear, again, you can go back and you can listen to that audio of that dispatch, and you can hear them talking to each other. Officers King and Lane arrive at the Cup Foods at 8.08 and 20 seconds. So now we see police officers are responding. They're on scene at 8.08. Both Jenna Scurry and Peter Chang described that during the course of the interaction between the initial interaction between officers King and Lane and Mr. Floyd, through dispatch they heard what sounded like the sounds of a struggle. Jenna Scurry described she's trained to listen, she heard these sounds of a, of a struggle, and she aired out on her own, other officers need to respond, code three, to assist officers King and Lane, right? So a reasonable police officer, he's going emergent to a scene, he gets canceled from the scene, he's now being told that other officers need assistance, and step it up, get there fast. So you can see again, based on the records, that at 8 10.08, 20.10.08, backed up 3.20 with 3.30, right? So now 3.30 is Officer Chauvin and Tao. They're backing up Officer King and Lane. And you can see Peter Chang respond at 8, 10, and 21 seconds. You hear 320 taking one out. So they're that means they're removing someone from the vehicle at 8.11.02. The scene is ultimately C4, code four, all clear at 20.12.21. So literally this demonstrates to you a couple of things. How quickly a situation can change from second to second, minute to minute. They went from get there fast, back off. Get there faster because someone needs help, it's clear. The situation is dynamic and it's fluid. They're provided with information that an officer needs assistance. They testified about the sound of a struggle, right? And if you recall, Sergeant Steiger specifically said, all of this information would be known to a reasonable police officer. And it goes into and factors into the reasonableness of the use of force. Ultimately, Officer Chauvin and Officer Tao arrive at Cup Foods. The 
just pause this for one second here. Sorry. When we look at Officer, I just have to, to give you a little piece of information. When we look at Officer Chang's video, Officer Chang arrives first. You see the time is 11633Z Zulu. That's Greenwich Mean Time. Subtract 5 from 1 a.m., get you back to 8. So, Officers King, or excuse me, Officer Chauvin and Officer Lane pull up. 816. Go over there. Okay, just stay put, all right? I don't want anybody near this car. information gathering in terms of this assessment and reassessment of, the, again, the decision-making process of a police officer, right? Don't come over here where I am, Officer Chang says. Go over there. They need your help. Because what, what at that point, at that precise moment, they don't know what's happening over at the squad car. They don't know that officers uh, King and Lane struggled with Mr. Floyd getting him out of the car, that they sat him down, that they stood him up, that they walked over. They haven't seen any of this information and there's no evidence to suggest that they had. So that doesn't factor into the information. It's so again, a reasonable police officer, what do they know? And they don't know that. But they're starting to get some indication, hey, go over there, right? Go over there. You can see right at about 817, and I apologize for the quality of the picture, Officer Chauvin is arriving and walking up to the squad car. So what a reasonable police officer, what would a reasonable police officer see in this instance? What a reasonable police officer would see could be defined, because again, a reasonable police officer has to be aware of his department policies, active aggression or active resistance. Let's call it active resistance. A response to police efforts to bring a person into custody or control for detainment or arrest, a subject engages in active resistance when engaging in physical actions or verbal behavior, reflecting an intention to make it more difficult for officers to achieve actual physical control. So as Derek Chauvin walks up to this scene, he has all of the information from dispatch. He has all of the information from Officer Chang sending him over. He knows his department policy on the difference between active aggression, active resistance, passive resistance, based on policy, training, etc. This is an officer's consideration of, again, the use of force. All of these things factor into it. So what does he see? He sees Officers King and Officers Lane struggling with Mr. Floyd attempting to put him into the car. He hears the words that Mr. Floyd is saying at that point. I'm claustrophobic. I'm a good guy. I'm a good man. I'm claustrophobic. I just had COVID, right? He's hearing this information. He's observing with his eyes. A reasonable police officer is observing this with his eyes and his ears and assessing what he sees pursuant to policy. And what he sees, at a minimum, is active resistance. Mr. Floyd's not just simply getting in the back seat of the car. So let's watch. What does Officer Chauvin see when he walks up? This is from his body camera. From 8, 17, and 21 seconds, 
to 8, 18, and 15 seconds. Just shy of a minute. You can't win. I'm not trying to win. Don't get in the car. Don't get in the car. Don't get in the car. He know it. He know it too, Mr. Officer. Y'all hear me? Don't do me like that, man. Please. Okay, I thought these bleeding. I was car with the car. I am a doctor. I'm the phobie. I'm the phobie, man. Get him, Dr. Phobie. 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 Get him, Dr. Please, no, you're not going to get in the car. I'm not the phone. It's the car. Okay. I'm not a bad guy, man. I'm in the car. I'm not a bad guy. You ain't going to win. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a bad guy. Please, please, please. Please, please. 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 By 8, 18, and 15 seconds, Officer Chauvin has not laid a finger on Mr. Floyd. But he's observing. And a reasonable police officer is doing this. He walks onto a scene. He sees active resistance occurring, potentially active aggression occurring. He has two other officers. He has not intervened. But again, based on the policies and the training that you have seen, what were his options available to him at that time? If a person is actively resisting in the center, distraction techniques, controlled takedowns, conscious neck restraints. Can you clear that? Right. These are options available to Mr. Chauvin at this point. He has, per his training, these techniques at his disposal. A reasonable police officer would be making these observations. He would observe the white foam around Mr. Floyd's mouth. He would consider the possibility that this person was under the, sus or was under the influence of something. Basically, using the information from dispatch, making these observations, how is he analyzing this? How would a reasonable officer analyze this, and what would be known to a reasonable officer? A reasonable officer would look at the size of the person and assess that person's size in relation to his own size because it's a part of the risk-threat analysis, right, that we've heard about so much. A reasonable officer would know that these are two rookies putting this, off, putting this man in the car. In fact, as the evidence established, Mr. Chauvin trained one of the officers. So a reasonable officer may step back at this point to see if these two guys can get this under control. A reasonable officer will hear the words that the suspect is saying. I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy, I'm claustrophobic. And he's going to compare those words to the actions of the individual. right? Because this is part of the analysis. Because I can say, I'm going to cooperate with you, I'm going to do whatever I want. But if my behavior is inconsistent with what I am saying, a reasonable officer takes that into consideration. In fact, a reasonable officer who's aware of his department policies knows the de-escalation policy that is in place. And part of what a reasonable officer has to do is to consider whether a subject's lack of compliance is a deliberate attempt to resist or an inability to comply based on these factors, medical conditions, mental impairment, developmental disability, physical language, language barrier, influence of drugs or alcohol, or behavioral crisis. So an officer, a reasonable officer, has to take the information and assess, is this suspect purposefully or intentionally, deliberately trying to thwart our efforts to take him into custody, or are they experiencing one of these other uh, types of factors. But such consideration 
when time and circumstances reasonably permit, shall then be balanced against the incident facts when deciding which tactical options are the most appropriate to resolve the situation safely. So again, reasonable officer, based on the totality of these circumstances, is going to take all of this information in, all of these policies, all of these training ends, and a reasonable officer at that point would conclude that the amount of force that was being used by officers King and Lane was insufficient, it was not enough use of force to overpower Mr. Floyd's resistance to getting into the car. He's seen it, he's heard it, he's familiar with the policies. And so, at precisely 8, 18, and 15 seconds, Officer Chauvin goes hands-on. Officer King, Officer Lane, and Officer Chauvin struggled, fought, however you, whatever adjective you want to use. They struggled with Mr. Floyd from 818 till 819 and 12 seconds. About a minute, a little over a minute. It doesn't really seem that it's that long of a time, but again, the amount of physical exertion Remember how Jody Steiger, Sergeant Jody Steiger, described this. When the apparent attempts to get him into custody were futile. I wrote his quote down. The futility of their efforts became apparent. They weren't able to get him into the car. Three Minneapolis police officers were not able to get Mr. Floyd into the car. They themselves are experiencing that, that surge of adrenaline. A reasonable police officer will be experiencing that surge of, adren of adrenaline. And again, balancing all of the evidence against each other, right? Let's look at three different angles of this struggle. This is Officer King's body camera. Oh, I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm going down. Get rid of the squad. I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm not going to leave you. Bro, you want that a hard attack, man. I know what he's bringing. Get in the car. 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 Get He's under arrest right now for forgery. I'll tell you. Okay. Tell me what's, what's going on. Forgery for what? Let's take him out. For what? Please, man. I can't fucking breathe. Hey, come on out. Look at you. Thank you. Thank you. Get him down the ground. Ah. Get him on the ground. Ah. On the ground. Ah, my ah. He's under arrest for forgery. Forgery for what? This is the, the video of the same time period from Officer Lane. I'm going down the ground. 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 I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please, man. I need this to me. Do you want to jail this to me? He's under arrest right now for forgery. I can't. I can't. Tell what's going on. What is what? Let's take him out and just. For what? I can't fucking breathe. Yeah, just when you get up the ground. On the ground. I appreciate that. Officer Tao. Okay. I'm there with Bell. 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 Okay, breathe. You're talking to me. Ah, ah, oxygen, 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 
A reasonable police officer understands the intensity of the struggle. You can see at points when Mr. Floyd's legs kick back, it actually almost knocks Officer Lane over. Right? It knocks off the body-worn camera and the badge of Officer Chauvin in this struggle. A reasonable police officer would understand this situation, that Mr. Floyd was over, able to overcome the efforts of three police officers while handcuffed with his legs and his body strength. A reasonable police officer standard can be seen in another way, from the milestone camera. And this is what caught the attention of the 911 dispatcher, Jenna Scurry. She said she observed the struggle and the vehicle rocking back and forth, back and forth. Watch the vehicle. Reasonable police officers will consider their training, right? And before we talk about the training again, there's something that I think is really important to understand, two things actually, at this moment. Not a single use of force expert that testified, not a single police officer who testified said that anything up until this point was unlawful or unreasonable. It was reasonable for these officers to put them into the, Mr. Floyd into the squad car. It was reasonable, the efforts that they took to overcome his resistance were reasonable. Every single expert agrees that to this point, nothing is contrary to policy, training, defensive tactics, crisis intervention, all reasonable. It's at the point that Mr. Floyd is brought to the ground that there becomes dispute about the reasonableness of the use of force and what a reasonable officer would know. It was Seth Stoughton, the law professor, who said at the point Mr. Floyd came out of the car, 
putting him on the ground was unreasonable. So, was it reasonable for Officer Chauvin or a reasonable police officer to put Mr. Floyd on the ground in that instant? So a reasonable police officer is going to rely on his training and information, his evidence, what he knows, all of the information he's built up to this point. You heard Lieutenant Mercer testify about how about 15 years ago, the Minneapolis Police Department went to ground defense tactics, getting people on the ground to control them, control the head, control the body, different types of moves that, a per, that the police use to create and eliminate space. Escape versus control. Those are two different things. These are the tactics that have been employed by the Minneapolis Police Department for 15 years. Why? Because it's safer for the officers and it's safer for the suspects. It keeps people contained, controlled, and confined until they no longer are resisting. A reasonable police officer would also consider his department's policies, including the use of non-deadly force policy. Force that does not have the reasonable likelihood of causing or creating a substantial risk of death or great bodily harm this includes, but is not limited to, physically subduing, controlling, capturing, restraining, or physically managing a person. This is the policy, 5-302 of the Minneapolis Police Department, that non-deadly force can be used to physically manage a person. And again, every single person has agreed that the use of force up to this point is reasonable, lawful, and meets the reasonable officer standard. And so we get into the 9 minutes and 29 seconds at this point. And the state has really focused on the 9 minutes and 29 seconds. 9 minutes, 29 seconds. 9 minutes, 29 seconds. It's not the proper analysis because the nine minutes and 29 seconds ignores the previous 16 minutes and 59 seconds. It completely disregards it. It says, in that moment, at that point, nothing else that happened before should be taken into consideration by a reasonable police officer. It tries to reframe the issue of what a reasonable police officer would do. A reasonable police officer would, in fact, take into consideration the previous 16 minutes and 59 seconds. Their experience with the subject, the struggle that they had, the comparison of the words to actions, it all comes into play. Why? Because human behavior is unpredictable. Human behavior is unpredictable, and nobody knows it better than a police officer. Someone can be compliant one second and fighting the next. Someone can be fighting and then compliant. Nobody knows it better. But reasonable police officers continue to assess and reevaluate. This is the critical decision making po policy, right, or model. You gather information, you assess the threat versus the risk. Do we have an authority to act? What are our goals and actions? Review and assess. Start over. Because this is not a singular cycle. This is a cycle that humans, as humans, we literally make millions of decisions in a day, right? Do I go this way? Do I go that way? Do I go up? Do I go down? I mean, we are constantly doing this. This is just human behavior. But in the policing context, you have to Gather the information, assess the risk, assess the threat. Do I have authority to act? What are my goals and actions? Review and assess. And it's constantly rotating. At the precise moment that Mr. Floyd was laid on the ground, a reasonable police officer would know about those previous 17 minutes. 
A reasonable police officer would know about the struggle. He would con a reasonable police officer would consider the suspect's reactions to the previous use of force. A reasonable police officer would continue this process of reassessment. And a reasonable police officer would consider whether to use an additional force to overcome the suspect's level of resistance, right? So nine minutes and 29 seconds. I appreciate that, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Continuing to assess the risk and the threat. The first 29 seconds, 20 seconds, continued resistance is what a reasonable police officer would interpret that to be. Jesus Christ, the kicking. A reasonable police officer would con consider, should we elevate the use of force as we meet this threat? And that's precisely what these officers did. They discussed using the MRT, the hobble. Oh, there you go. Mama, I love you. We call it for you. I can't do nothing. Yeah, yeah. on the way. My face is gone. Well, do you want to hobble uh -huh. at this point then? Uh -huh. uh, well, uh, please, please, man. Please, let me stay in. No, please, man, can't breathe. Uh -huh. They're discussing, should we use the hobble? Should we elevate our use of force? A reasonable officer would continue to evaluate whether the suspect is under the influence, precisely what these officers did in nine minutes, in this nine minutes and 29 seconds. So reasonable police officers discuss the scene. The first clip, they're talking about the two other people that are over at the car. Right? What's going on here? What are we dealing with? Is this person under the influence of a controlled substance? These are the actions of a reasonable police officer. A reasonable police officer would rely on his training and experience. Call EMS. The possibility that a suspect who was struggling with us will begin to struggle again. You've heard this testimony from multiple police officers. The risk that the suspect would present to himself if he's not continued to be controlled. And the risk that the suspect presents to other officers or citizens if not continued to be controlled, if he's not continued to be controlled, right? These are things that all of the police officers have testified about. These are what a reasonable police officer should do. A reasonable police officer in this situation would call EMS. 2020-11, 8-20-11. Within a minute of the struggle, EMS Code two for a mouth injury, right? Because they are not observing life-threatening. A reasonable officer is not observing life-threatening injuries at this point. They just fought with the man for a minute. He continued to kick at them when they got him on the ground. They see he's got a mouth injury. We need EMS. So a reasonable police officer would evaluate the injuries of the suspect compare words and actions, and respond 
by calling EMS, non-emergency. But again, reasonable police officers evaluate, reevaluate. 2021, 821, one minute and 24 seconds later. We need EMS here faster. Code three, 330, we need them here faster. A reasonable police officer would take into consideration the anticipated time of a emergent response. You heard from Genevieve Hansen, there's a firehouse a few blocks away, and she would have expected EMS to be there within minutes, three minutes, is what she said. A reasonable police officer, based on his training and experience, is going to have and take that into consideration. I put this person in a prone position on the ground, I'm holding them for my safety and their safety. I'm expecting someone to be here within three minutes to help this person. I have called for that help. A reasonable police officer will take into consideration, again, his training, his experience, right? Lieutenant Mercil talked about, and, and many people talked about, many of the officers talked about how it is not uncommon for suspects to feign or pretend to have a medical emergency to avoid being arrested. Unfortunately, that is the reality. Nobody likes to get arrested, and reasonable police officers know that. How many times does someone, oh, my heart hurts, or I'm having a medical emergency, insert whatever emergency, right? Simply because they don't want to go to jail. A reasonable police officer will take his training into, ex into experience. And you heard Lieutenant Mercil specifically say that when someone says that they can't breathe, but they are talking, if they're talking, it means they're breathing, right? If they're talking, it means they're breathing. And again, compare that to the testimony of Dr. Tobin, who told you that same thing. That is true. If you are talking, you are breathing. It doesn't mean effectively. And Dr. Tobin described how even medical doctors have problems sometimes assessing the, the legitimacy of a patient's needs relevant to their respiratory processes because they're saying, I can't breathe, and some doctors confuse it for just anxiety or this or that. So if medical doctors make these mistakes, Dr. Tobin told you it provides a false sense of security, right? Lieutenant Mercil told you that that is what is said among police officers. He's the trainer. So how many times do we hear an officer say, based on his training and experience, if you can breathe, you can talk. If you can talk, you can breathe. Excuse me. I counted seven. Please, man. Please. Oh, no. I can't do it. I can't do I can't do it. I can't do it. Please. You're talking. Please. Please. Sit down. Ah. It's fine. Ah. My wrist. I know I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You're talking to me. Ah. Reasonable police officers, again, are trained and take into consideration a person's actions relevant to their words, their training, their experience. It takes a lot of oxygen to talk. 
takes a lot of oxygen. You're breathing fine if you can talk. I can breathe. Wow. 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 He's, he's talking, so he's fine. Wow. Okay. Wow. We tried that for 10 Reasonable police officers will take into consideration their training and experience on excited delirium, and they will analyze it within the context of this case. I just worry about the excited delirium or whatever. I worry about the excited or delirium or whatever. That's why we have EMS coming. It's not just leave them here. It's we have EMS coming, and this is why we have EMS coming. Reasonable police officers throughout the course of a control technique will continue to assess the level of resistance. Remember what Sergeant, excuse me, Lieutenant Johnny Mercil said. Simply because a person isn't kicking at you or punching at you or biting at you, it does not mean that you can't control them physically with your body weight. This is at 8:24. This is the point where Dr. Tobin testified that Mr. Floyd had an anoxic seizure, right? But it's not, we're not analyzing the use of force from the perspective of a doctor with 46 years of medical experience who had 150 hours of time to watch an event from multiple perspectives over and over and over and over again. It's a reasonable police officer standard. How would a reasonable police officer interpret this? Does a reasonable police officer even know what an anoxic seizure is? A reasonable police officer will interpret this as at least some form of minimal resistance. Reasonable police officers, again, are continuing to monitor. They're expecting EMS to arrive. Non-deadly force is included, it includes, but it is not limited to physically subduing, controlling, capturing, restraining, or physically managing a person. These are the policies of the Minneapolis Police Department. Reasonable police officers, again, continue to monitor, see if he's breathing. Yeah, I mean, my knee might be a little scratched, but I'll survive. I think he's passing out, but he's breathing, right? The synopsic seizure occurs. Reasonable police officers are building and basing their decisions based on all of these factors coming in at multiple times, including the bystanders. Right? 
call them a crowd, call them onlookers, call them bystanders. It doesn't matter what term you use for the people that gather to watch what police do. Reasonable police officers are cognizant of and aware of their surroundings. And before I really kind of start talking about the crowd in uh, some de limited detail, I have thought a lot during the course of this trial about the difference between perspective and perception. Perspective and perception are two distinct concepts. Perspective is the angle at which you see something. It's your perspective. Perception is how you interpret what it is that you see. I've thought about this a lot during the course of this trial because this uh, situation here in the courtroom is incredibly unique, right? It's not the normal setup for a jury trial. So my perspective through the course of this trial, sitting in this chair, is that I cannot see four of the jurors. Very limited opportunity to observe the jurors. They probably can't see me either. Several of the jurors I have a very good view of. Four of the jurors I don't, and obstructed views of others. My perspective sitting in this chair when witnesses, there's a camera blocking the head. So in order for me to see the witness, I have to roll all the way over to the other side. Then I have to look through the plexiglass that has these large reflecting lights. Right? Things block your perspective. Things can affect your perspective. But your perception is how you interpret what it is you see and what it is you experience. And that is our life, right? This is our experiences. These are the things that make us who we are. Three people in this trial went to the same high school. Me, Darnella Frazier, and Chief Arredondo. We all went to the same high school, obviously at different times. My experience, Chief Arredondo's experience, Darnella Frazier's experience, all based on, went to the, we had the same perspective, sat in the same classrooms, saw the same chalkboards or whiteboards, the same perspective. But our perception of our experiences there is going to be much different. Ultimately, at the end of the case, when we're done with these arguments, the court will instruct you on how to deal with these biases and the perception issues. The court's final instructions will guide you to try to recognize your biases, recognize them, what we bring to the table, and analyze the evidence from the perspective of the evidence itself. So let's look at this incident on May 25th from the perspectives and perceptions of simply just four of the bystanders. Right? Charles McMillan, 61 years old, third grade in education, grew up in the South. He described himself as a curious guy. He likes to know what's going on in his neighborhood. So he stops and he checks things out, right? His perspective, he's the first one who's dealing with these guys. He has more information because he sees the entirety of the situation. But his perception of the event is affected by his life's experiences. At the end of the night, ultimately what he said to Officer Chauvin was, I hope you get home safely, because that's what he says to police officers every night. <laughs> Can you advise the fire department if they're still with you? They need to go to 36 Park to assist with the CDC. But I fear respect. That's one person's opinion. But no, no, I got to get. I got to get. We got to. We got to. Of course, got to control this guy because he's a sizable guy. Yeah, and I got. I got to get in the car. Looks like he's coming on something. But I'm just saying, you know, I'm just fired. But no, I got nothing bad to say about it because you think you respect me, I'm gonna keep respecting you. You have a good night. You go home safe with your family. Darnella Frazier. She's a 17-year-old high school student who, upon seeing the restraint of George Floyd, 
Her response was to pull out the cell phone and start recording, and then subsequently upload it to Facebook, right? Her perception of the event and her perspective of the event. She's looking, she didn't even know that officers Lane and King were there because her perspective was blocked by the squad car. But her perception, her response to the situation was to record it, and that's perfectly fine. But she began her recording at 8.20 and 51 seconds. Donald Williams, he's a 33-year-old professional mixed martial artist who arrived at 8.22 and 39. He had spent the day fishing with his son, stopping for a drink when he became aware of the incident. He described his view of this based upon his perception as a mixed martial artist, right? He has a set of experiences that caused him to react in a different way. What he perceived was happening was that Mr. Floyd was being choked with a blood choke. I think we're past this at this point. The paramedic reached in, touched the carotid artery. To have a person rendered unconscious through a choke requires the, the blockage of both carotid arteries. This was not a neck restraint. This was not a choke hold. He was upset. And that, again, is okay because his perception affected what he was seeing. Genevieve Hansen, right? 27-year-old female firefighter for the city of Minneapolis. She testified that when she walked into the scene, she described the crowd as upset. She said, I walked into an upset crowd. She said that the other voices distracted me from getting the officer's attention. And she testified, again, based on her perspective, that Officer Chauvin appeared to have his hand in his pocket, she observed what she believed to be blood on the, uh, from Mr. Floyd's face being pressed into the pavement. She observed fluid coming from Mr. Floyd's body that she presumed to be urine. She testified that nobody ever told her that EMS or an ambulance was on the way. She asked about, when I asked her about the response time she would have expected, three minutes. When I told her, that paramedics had been called about five minutes prior to her arriving on scene. No way, because her perception is three minutes. But when you look at the things that Ms. Hansen saw, whether it be from her perspective or her perception, there can always be more to the story. The blood coming from Mr. Floyd's nose was why they called EMS in the first place. You've seen the pictures. He injured his nose during the struggle, or his face during the struggle in the squad car. The fluid that she described as potentially being urine, we know that that's fluid coming from the underside carriage of the squad car. Officer Chauvin specifically told her an ambulance was coming when she first came on scene. Don't come over here. Don't come over here. I'm on the sidewalk. Yeah, we need you to keep some distance. Yeah, the ambulance is coming. Yep, we got an ambulance coming. The computer aided dispatch reports clearly show what time EMS was called. So Genevieve Hansen has a perspective and a perception. And what she observed was not consistent with the actual evidence. But remember, we don't look at this incident from the perspective of a bystander. We do not look at this incident from the perspective of the people who were upset by it. We look at it from the perspective of a reasonable police officer. A reasonable police officer, when confronted with these bystanders, would know everything that had occurred up to that point. 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. They know all of that information. 
The bystanders do not. A reasonable police officer would understand that his actions were actually being recorded. Take the bystanders out of it. Officers wear cameras for a very specific reason, to record their actions, so they know they're being recorded. Officers are aware of the placement of city cameras. You're in a high retail, you've got gas stations, restaurants, uh, convenience store, high surveillance. Right? Reasonable police officers know this. They would know if citizens take out their cell phones and start filming. This is the point at 8.20 and 49 seconds when Ms. Frazier starts recording. Reasonable police officers are aware when they're using force that sometimes what they are doing does not look good to the general public. A reasonable police officer will hear the frustration growing. Right? A reasonable police officer will hear the increase in the volume of the voices. A reasonable police officer will hear the name calling, right? Chomp, whatever, whatever names are being called. They'll hear the cursing. They're, they're, it does, they'll hear this, and they'll take that into their consideration. A reasonable police officer will rely on his recent training. A reasonable police officer will hear what an, I'll come back to the training. A reasonable police officer will hear what the crowd is, is saying. He will compare his actions to what they are saying. And he will determine, I know I'm being recorded, right? I know I'm being recorded. They're saying that I'm doing something that's awful looking. Am I going, am I doing this? Bro, he ain't crying, bro. You you circle it like in a jiu-jitsu move, bro. You try you trapped in his breathing right there, bro. Like you Bro, but you could get him off the ground. You've been a bum right now. You could get him off the ground, bro. You could get him off the ground. You've been a bum. You You can see Officer Chauvin's body language tells us a lot, right? That's what we just heard. Looking down, looking up, looking around, looking down, looking over, looking around. He's comparing a reasonable police officer. He's doing what a reasonable police officer would do. He's comparing his actions, his own actions, in response to what the crowd is saying. A reasonable police officer, again, will rely on his training. 2020, March of 2020, tactics of a crowd. Never underestimate a crowd's potential. Most crowds are compliant. Crowds are very dynamic creatures and can change rapidly. A crowd may contain elements of several types of groups. Now, I acknowledge that this is in dealing with massive crowds, protests and things of that nature. These are the tactics, but you never underestimate a crowd's potential because a reasonable police officer has to be aware and alert to his surroundings. A reasonable police officer will consider his department's policies on crisis and what is defined as a crisis. Crisis, an event or situation where an individual's safety and health are threatened by behavioral challenges to include mental illness, developmental disabilities, substance abuse, or overwhelming stressors. A crisis can involve an individual's perception or experience of an event or situation as an intolerable difficulty that exceeds the individual's current resources and coping mechanisms and may include unusual stress in his or her life 
that renders him or her unable to function as he or she normally would. The crisis may not necessarily res- may, but may not necessarily result in an upward trajectory or intensity culminating culminating in thoughts or acts that are possibly dangerous to himself, herself, or others. Right? A reasonable police officer is recognizing that the crowd is in crisis. That all of these things, the members, the bystanders, the citizens, whatever you want to call them, they are in crisis. So a reasonable police officer considers his department's training. What are these potential signs of aggression that I may be confronted with? Somebody standing tall, somebody red in their face, raised voice, heavy breathing, tense muscles, pacing, right? This is from the crisis intervention training. This is what Kerr Yang testified to. These are signs that police officers are trained to look for in a crisis as potential signs of aggression. How do you respond to those? You appear confident in your actions. You stay calm. You maintain space. You speak slowly and softly, and you avoid staring and eye contact. Again, these are things that Kerr Yang discussed in terms of how to deal with a crisis. As this crowd grew more and more upset or deeper into crisis, a very critical thing happens at a very precise moment. And I cannot, in my opinion, understate the importance of this moment, the critical moment in this case. If you recall from Dr. Tobin's testimony, nobody disagreed, that Mr. Floyd took his last breath at 825.16. What is happening at the very precise moment that Mr. Floyd takes his last breath? You're taking one piece of evidence and you're comparing it against the rest. This moment, 825.16, as Mr. Floyd is taking his last breath. Three things happen. Mr. Floyd takes his last breath. You see Officer Chauvin's reaction to the crowd is to pull his mace and shake it. He's threatening the use of force as is permitted by the Minneapolis Police Department policy. And Genevieve Hansen walks in at that time from behind him, startling him. All of these facts and circumstances simultaneously occur at a critical moment. And that changed Officer Chauvin's perception of what was happening. After this point, the crowd grows louder and louder, right? And at this point now, Mr. Floyd has taken his last breath. And the question is the rendering of medical aid. When do we stop CPR according to the Minneapolis Police Department's policy? When it's not safe. You heard Lieutenant Mercer talk about this, and you also heard um, Nicole McKenzie talk about this. Consider Nicole McKenzie's testimony. As far as the reasonable police officer, which would include Nicole McKenzie, she discussed at length the difficulty of performing CPR in what she would describe as, or she did describe as, a hostile environment. You miss signs. 
you agonal breathing can be confused for effective breathing. As she testified, people in the area can affect the decision to treat a subject at the scene. She described how it is incredibly difficult to perform EMS efforts in a loud crowd, difficult to focus when you don't feel safe, makes it more difficult to assess a patient, makes it more likely that you can miss signs that a patient is experiencing something. So the distraction, she said, can actually do harm to a patient. When we're talking about this critical decision-making model, right? As Lieutenant Mercil said, he testified, sometimes you have to take into consideration whether it is worth the risk to remove the handcuffs and render medical aid because it's unpredictable, right? All of this information is coming at a reasonable officer. The reasonable police officer standard can also be extended to Officer Chang, right? What is his perception of the crowd? You heard him testify, but you can also look at what his body, what was he doing during, his, during this time? got officer Chang pacing, turning around 360 degrees, right? His attention is focused on what's happening with the crowd, but he also has another job, right? Reasonable police officers and how they interact with the crowd is a consideration. You can also take into consideration the reactions of Shawanda Hill and Maury's Hall. police officer and their reactions to what's happening, but also consider the paramedics, right? The paramedics, they did the load and go, right? As Derek Smith testified, he got out of the ambulance, he checked all four corners to gauge what was happening and determined in his words that it was an unwelcoming environment. And he told his partner they needed to move to a different location, a more safe and secure location. Remember Nicole McKenzie's testimony too. As unreasonable as it sounds, paramedics get attacked too. We have all of these different opinions in terms of the use of force, right? We have all of the opinions of Seth Stoughton, Jody Steiger, Barry Broad, Zimmerman, Arredondo, David Pluger, Lieutenant Mercil, and they all reach very different conclusions about when the force became unreasonable. All you have to know about Barry Broad is what he was talking about is this physically managing any person. His opinion was you can use non-deadly force to physically manage a person. It's all within the model of the MPD decision-making model. I found the most interesting person to be 
relevant to the use of force, Lieutenant Johnny Mercy. Considering that he is Derek Chauvin's actual use of force trainer. So the best glimpse that we're going to get into the training of a Minneapolis police officer comes from the trainer who conducts the trainings. He's conducted hundreds of trainings over the years. He corrected the st state at certain times in terms of how strike charts don't apply to restraint techniques. He said the knee on the neck is not an unauthorized move, and it can be utilized in certain circumstances. He described using a knee on the neck and back and stated that it can be there for an extended period of time, depending on the level of resistance you get. He said that once the suspect is handcuffed, it does not necessarily mean that it is time to move your leg because when people are handcuffed, they can thrash around and continue to be dangerous to themselves and others. He talked about the ground defense program because it's safer for both the suspect and the officer. He talked about ground defense as a form of using your weight to control a subject without, and, and therefore replacing the need to punch or strike them. He said there's no strict techniques. You need to be fluid and adapt to the circumstances. That he personally trains officers to put a knee over the shoulder, up to the base, base of the, deck, the neck, and he described this maneuver as routinely trained by the Minneapolis Police Department. He testified that there are circumstances that an officer would need to use his weight to continue to control a subject. He recognized the concept of awful but lawful, right? Sometimes the use of force is just not that attractive. He's experienced himself arresting people who have claimed to have a medical emergency. He explained how one way people can resist is through their words. He described how someone resisting can become passive and then become resistant again and vice versa. He discussed how officers are trained not just to focus on the subject, but also the bystanders. He trains officers that if you're fighting with a suspect and that person then becomes compliant, it is a legitimate consideration for the continued use of force to control a subject. That if a subject overpowers more than one officer at a time, that is a legitimate consideration in the continuation of the use of force. He talked about substance abuse and how that officers are trained Right? I understand that superhuman strength is not a, a real phenomenon. I know there are no supermen or spidermen, right? But officers are specifically trained that someone under the influence of certain types of, of controlled substances exhibit this behavior. They become stronger than they normally would. We've all heard the anecdotal stories of the pregnant mom lifting the car off of a, of a someone, right? It's not literally describing a superhero. It's simply describing that someone is more exhibiting a greater strength. And the Minneapolis Police Department specifically trains that. He trains on neck restraints. Minneapolis Police Department has a specific written policy on the use of neck restraints, and it was permitted, even though this wasn't a neck restraint or a chokehold. He talked about how you need to cut off the blood supply for this for a neck restraint to both sides of the neck. He talked about how someone whose heart rate is beating faster, they go unconscious quicker, less than 10 seconds. He described the human factors of force. That is, how does the use of force affect the officer himself, his cognition, his abilities, his mental and physical uh, state? He agreed that not using the MRT is a form of de-escalation. He described that sometimes you have to use your body weight to control a subject until the scene is code four. He said that Minneapolis will train officers that under certain circumstances, an officer can hold a person in the prone position until the scene is safe. And he's done it himself at times. You have to take into consideration the presence of bystanders, where officers are located, and the environment that they're in. Lieutenant Mercil agreed that there are circumstances where you, this I talked about this a little earlier ago, where you have to make a decision, is it worth the risk to take the handcuffs off to perform medical aid? He said there are circumstances where you wouldn't 
put someone in a recovery position. Depending upon the, sa the safety of people, including the crowd, while awaiting EMS, he described how crowds can make situations chaotic. He said, simply because a person is not actively resisting, that does not mean that you cannot use force. Right? Doesn't mean that you cannot use force. Simply because someone isn't stabbing you, or punching you, or shooting at you, it doesn't mean that you can't use force. And that is specifically in the Minneapolis Police Department policy on the non-deadly use of force that we've looked at a couple of times. The use of force is an incredibly difficult analysis. You can't limit it to 9 minutes and 29 seconds. It started 17 minutes before that 9 minutes and 29 seconds. All of this information has to be taken. You have to look at it from the totality of the circumstances. You have to look at it from the reasonable police officer standpoint. You have to take into account that officers are human beings capable of making mistakes in highly stressful situations. In this case, the totality of the circumstances that were known to a reasonable police officer in the precise moment the force was used demonstrates that this was an authorized use of force, as unattractive as it may be. And this is reasonable doubt. Steiger talked about being on the panel, right? They have five officers on a panel to assess whether uses of force are reasonable. Sometimes it's four to one, sometimes it's three to two, sometimes it's five to zero, because the reasonableness of the use of force is not an easy, easy thing to consider. I'm, I know, again, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm long-winded, there are a couple of other things I need to talk about very briefly. I promise I'll be as brief as I can before I get to the cause of death. First is that concept of intent. As the state showed you, with respect, respect to counts one and two, you have to address Mr. Chauvin's intent. Pay careful attention again to the instructions. Words have meaning. Intentionally or intentional, means that the defendant either has the purpose to do the thing or cause the result specified or believes that the act, if successful, will cause the result. In addition, the defendant must have knowledge of those facts that are necessary to make his conduct criminal and that are set forth after the word intentionally, intentional. It's the same, same you'll see a very similar uh, instruction. You'll see this very similar instruction twice. Intent. Did Officer Chauvin intentionally apply unlawful force? That's what you're being asked to decide. Did he purposefully, purposefully apply unlawful force to another person? In count two, you have to decide, did he purposely perform an act? Did he intentionally perform an act that was eminently dangerous? Right? What considerations do you have to, at your disposal? What pieces of evidence do you have? I'm going to try to go through these quickly. What evidence is there? What evidence is inconsistent with intent? Some facts and circumstances that are important for you to decide in terms of his intent is within the context of aiding and abetting other people. First, officers know that they are being videotaped. They know they're being videotaped by themselves. They know they're being videotaped by bystanders. They know they're being surveilled by the Minneapolis Police Department milestone camera. Right? They know these things. Do you do something 
purposefully that you know is an unlawful use of force when you have four body-worn cameras immediately in the area where you have multiple civilians videotaping you, where you know your actions are being reviewed through a city-owned camera, where there are surveillance cameras? Do people do things intentionally and purposefully when they know they're being watched? Remember, Officer Lane offered to have, when they were putting Mr. Floyd into the squad car, he said, I'll sit with you. I'll put the window down. I'll turn on the air conditioner. Please, please, please. I'm just that's the phobic. That's me. Well, you're still going in the car. <laughs> Anything sharp on you? I won't do it in the air child. No, sir. No, sir. Nothing. Why are y'all doing me like that? Because I was a please crack it for me and stuff, man. Yeah, I am not the phobic for real, but I was a. You got him? Can you please crack it for me? Please. Yes, I'm crack it. Stay I with will. Me, man. I will. Please stay with me, man. Thank you. <laughs> Roll the window down three times. I'll turn on the air conditioning. Is that evidence of intent to apply unlawful force? Officer Chauvin confirms that Mr. Floyd is under arrest. Take a seat. Leave, man. Leave this to me. Is he going to jail? Leave this to me. He's under arrest right now for forgery. I'll tell you. Don't you know what's going on? Floyd, for what? Let's take him out. For what? Leave, man. Officer Chauvin made a decision not to use higher levels of force when he would have been authorized to do that, including punches, kicks, elbows, right? All of these tools were available to Officer Chauvin. That is not an intent to purposefully use unlawful force. They call for EMS within one minute of putting him on the ground. They step it up within another minute and a half. He believes that his, Officer Chauvin believes that Mr. Floyd's ability to speak means he can breathe and they say it repeatedly, remember? Oh, oh, excuse me. They tell him to relax. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. All right. All right. Oh my God. Sorry, Officer Chauvin is never swearing at him. He's not calling him names. All of this stuff that we've already talked about, and I don't, I don't need to go through this again. All of this stuff that we've talked about throughout the entirety of this circumstance does not reflect an intent to purposefully, intentionally commit an unlawful use of force. All of the evidence shows that Mr. Chauvin thought he was following his training. He was, in fact, following his training. He was following Minneapolis Police Department policies. He was trained this way. It all demonstrates a lack of intent. There is absolutely no evidence that Officer Chauvin intentionally purposefully applied on you unlawful force <laughs> officer chauvin is also refocusing the other officers telling them they need to do things to pay attention to mr floyd 
Should I put his stuff in the car? No, we need to get him in the ambulance. Let's refocus, all right? Officer Chauvin had no intent to purposefully use, or he did not purposefully use unlawful force. It's, it's, these are officers doing their job in a highly stressful situation. According to their training, according to the policies of the Minneapolis Police Department, and it is, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic. They go to the hospital. They perform CPR. They call their supervisors. Was this an eminently dangerous act? Was putting Mr. Floyd an eminently dangerous act? We've heard a lot about the prone position. Consider just the basic prone position. People sleep in the prone position. People suntan in the prone position. People get massages in the prone position. The prone position in and of itself is not an inherently dangerous act. It is not an inherently dangerous act. A prone position during restraint is not an inherently dangerous act. It is routinely trained and used by the Minneapolis Police Department. The studies show, right? The Canadian studies that were referenced by Dr. Fowler. 1,269 cases, use of force, one death of a person not in the prone possession. Right? These are people, they're looking at people in the prone position. 4,828 consecutive force events. No significant clinical effects on the subject's physiology. Right? We can look at all of the other studies. Trying to determine this question is, is putting a subject in the prone position, even with officers on top, even with weight on top of the person, is that inherently dangerous? And the research says no. The practical experience says yeah, that says no. The prone position, when applied through a use of force, is not an eminently dangerous act because there is no evidence to support the notion that it was highly likely, that's the standard, highly likely to cause death. There's reasonable doubt about that. So let's talk about the cause of death. And I, again, I'm sorry to, to be long-winded, but I have to address the cause of death. Because the state neglected to read perhaps one of the most important sentences from the instruction and why you must read the instruction carefully. Yes, the defendant is criminally liable for all of the consequences of his actions that occur in the ordinary and natural course of events, including those consequences brought about by one or more intervening causes. If such intervening causes were the natural result of the defendant's act. Okay? So if the intervening causes were the natural consequences of the defendant's acts, he's liable. So think about it in this example. Police officer arrests somebody. He puts that person on a hot August afternoon in the back seat of a squad car, rolls up the window, turns on the heat, and leaves the person in there, right? Person dies of a heat stroke. Officer put him in there, and is responsible for the natural consequences of his actions. But consider the situation where a police officer arrests someone, they're compliant, they go into the back seat of the squad car, they're sitting in the back seat of the squad car, and they have a heart attack. 
they have a pulmonary embolism, they have a brain aneurysm, something happens to that person that was not the natural consequence of being arrested. It was just a physiological something that happened to that individual. The officer is not liable because it's not in the natural course of events. And it's not the result, the natural result of the defendant's act. Right? So again, read the entire instruction. The significance of this instruction, again, is that it goes through all of the three charges. You have to be convinced that the defendant's actions caused the death of Mr. Floyd. And throughout the course of this trial, the state has tried and called numerous witnesses to try to convince you that asphyxiation is the singular cause of death. The singular cause of death. And why is that? It's because actions that happened before Mr. Floyd was arrested that had nothing to do with Officer Chauvin's activities are not the natural consequences of the defendant's actions. You have to focus on the consequence of the defendant's acts. And so the state has tried to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that the stress of being arrested and the adrenaline produced as a result of Mr. Floyd's physical resistance played no role. This is what they have to try to convince you. There's no role of that physical exertion played no role in this death. They're trying to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd's heart disease played no role in this case. The state must try to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd's history of hypertension played absolutely no role in the cause of Mr. Floyd's death. The state must convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd was not experiencing excited delirium that contributed to the cause of his death. The state has to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd's paraganglioma was not contributing to the cause of death. The state must convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd's toxicology played no role in his death. Right? The state would have to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that a combination of these pre-existing issues did not contribute to Mr. Floyd's death. That is why the state has brought in expert after expert after expert to testify that the singular cause of death, the singular cause of death here is asphyxiation. Because if Mr. Floyd was asphyxiated as a result of the police restraint, he is liable for the natural consequences of that restraint, of his actions. But if any of these other factors come into it, they, if any of these other factors were substantial contributing factors of Mr. Floyd's death, because they were not the natural result of the restraint. If a person has drugs in their system and that drug causes an overdose in the context of the police restraint, it's not the natural consequence of the restraint, it's the natural consequence of the deceased's actions. So the state has called six experts, really five, but I'll include Dr. Baker. The, the state first called Dr. Tobin, a pulmonologist. Dr. Tobin said that you need to apply common sense to the evaluation of the medical testimony. He testified that Mr. Floyd died exclusively from positional asphyxia, coronary artery disease, hypertension, controlled substances. They played absolutely no role in the death, according to Dr. Tobin. The state called Dr. Eisenschmidt, a toxicologist, to explain to you that Mr. Floyd's toxicological levels 
were somehow more consistent with a DWI case than a whole bunch of other cases that may or may not have involved an overdose, right? Remember the ratio where you said, well, no, these are cases, they may have died of something else. They may have died of a gunshot wound, but they had fentanyl in their system. So he gave you these strange statistics, but essentially attempting to try to convince you that, he, that these levels are insignificant. People drive their cars around, right? And that therefore the drugs played no role in the death of Mr. Floyd. Third, the state called Dr. Smock, an emergency room physician, right? To explain to you that Mr. Floyd was not experiencing any symptoms of excited delirium. And that coronary artery disease, hypertension, controlled substances, none of that comes into play. He called Dr. Thomas, a pathologist, to testify how she interpreted what Dr. Baker meant. How she concluded that Dr. Baker simply said that the cardiopulmonary arrest is the basic way everybody dies. And she interpreted the reason why Dr. Baker put those factors on his autopsy or on the death certificate were merely for statistical purposes. You put stuff, we just, the CDC requires us to put that stuff on there. And it was an asphyxial death, controlled substances played no role, hypertension played no role, coronary artery disease played no role. They did call Dr. Baker. We'll talk about Dr. Baker in a minute. And finally, the state called Dr. Rich, a cardiologist who concluded that despite a 90% narrowing of the right coronary artery and a 75% narrowing in the left anterior descending artery, despite an enlarged heart and a history of hypertension, that Floyd, Mr. Floyd had a strong heart and that none of those pre-existing and coexisting conditions in any way contributed to the death of Mr. Floyd. I submit to you that the testimonies of Dr. Tobin, Eisenschmidt, Schmack, Thomas, and Rich, it flies in the absolute face of reason and common sense. It, it's, it's astounding, especially when you consider the actual findings of Dr. Baker. Right? Because Dr. Baker is the only person who actually performed the autopsy in this case. He's the only person who performed the actual autopsy. He told you that he specifically avoided watching the video because he didn't want to bias or influence his uh, autopsy. He specifically testified that there was no evidence of asphyxia. There were no evidence of petechial hemorrhaging. There was no bruising to the neck or back above the skin, under the skin, or into the subcutaneous muscles of the neck and back. And he would expect to see those things in a case like this. There was no finding that pressure was applied to the point to, of Mr. Back to cause these injuries. There were no injuries to the structures of his neck and that when he finally did review the video, it didn't appear that the placement of the knee affected the structures of the neck because Mr. Floyd could lift up his head, turn his head, move it around. He saw no fractures to the structures of the neck, including the hyoid bone. There were no soft tissue injuries to the sides of Mr. Floyd's neck. There was no hemorrhaging or injury to the hypopharynx. No evidence of life-threatening injury to the neck or spinal column of Mr. Floyd. There was pulmonary edema, which is the swelling of the lungs, which could, could be caused by the resuscitative efforts or fentanyl. There's no evidence of hypoxic changes to the brain. There's no evidence of any brain injury consistent with an asphyx asphyxia death. He found a paraganglioma, and he said it was an incidental a finding. He said his heart was enlarged. Mr. Floyd's heart was enlarged, right? Dr. Baker, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Rich, and Dr. Fowler all agreed. 
he found narrowing of the right coronary artery, 90% narrowing. He found 75% narrowing of the left anterior descending artery. He's the person who did the talk. He sent out the toxicology samples. Fentanyl level at 11 nanograms per milliliter. Methamphetamine at 0.19 per milliliter. All of these findings that are ultimately relied upon by all of these other experts were done by Dr. Baker. He determined that the manner of death was a homicide, right? Homicide, homicide, homicide. But read the definition again of the medical definition of homicide. It is to be emphasized that the classification of homicide for the purposes of the death certificate is a neutral term and neither indicates nor implies criminal intent, which remains a determination of within the province of the legal processes. Right? The fact that he found this a homicide is a medical term. Dr. Fowler talked about the undetermined manner. Could not be determined is a classification used when the information pointing to one manner of death is no more compelling than one or more other competing manners of death in or through consideration of all available information. Dr. Uh, Baker found the immediate cause of death and the other contributing factors. Cardiopulmonary arrests, complicating law enforcement, subdual neck restraint and neck compression. Other contributing factors are arteriosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease, fentanyl intoxication, and recent methamphetamine use. The term complicating in this is important because Dr. Baker is, was able to give you what he said his actual intent was, right? Dr. Thomas speculated about what she thought Dr. Baker meant. Dr. Baker was able to tell you what he meant. He defined complicating as an intervention that occurred, an intervention occurred and there was an untoward outcome on the heels of that intervention. And he gave you a specific example. He described a person having a hip surgery and a blood clot comes loose and that blood clot causes a death. The hip surgery didn't cause the death. The death was caused by the blood clot that complicated the surgery. So as I understand his testimony, what Dr. Baker was saying was that there was an unexpected result, the death of Mr. Floyd, occurred during an event where you would not generally expect such a complication, subdual and restraint. He specifically testified, Dr. Basic Baker specifically testified that if he put it on the death certificate, it played a role in the death. If something is insignificant to death, you don't put it on the death certificate. So Dr. Baker's conclusions that Mr. Floyd's arteriosclerotic and hypertensive disease played a role in the death of Mr. Floyd. Dr. Baker concluded that Mr. Floyd's fentanyl intoxication played a role. Dr. Floyd's, excuse me, Dr. Baker concluded that Mr. Floyd's recent methamphetamine use played a role. Right? Dr. Baker described that this death of Mr. Floyd was a multifactorial process. A multifactorial process is how he defined it. No single factor, one over the other, played any more of a result, played any more of a role resulting in Mr. Floyd's death. He said his heart simply couldn't handle within the context of the subdual and restraint. Apparently, the state, as they just argued, wants you to believe what you see. And they did not like Dr. Baker's conclusions. And you can see the process Dr. Baker talked about when he had several meetings, right? 
This happened in March. This episode happened in May, June, July. By August, talk to a pulmonologist. Talk to an emergency room doctor. Not within my area of expertise. Talk to a cardiologist. Right? He, his findings didn't support the notion that what you see is what you should believe. And so the state did that. They went and hired Dr. Tobin, right? a pulmonologist. Now, despite all of the information that Dr. Baker has concluded or found during the actual autopsy, Dr. Tobin concluded emphatically that Mr. Floyd's death was the result of positional asphyxia, right? The pressure of the, of the asphalt, the pressure of the, of the weight of the officers, the positions, all of this resulted in hypoxia, low oxygen to the brain. Mr. Floyd was asphyxiated through positional asphyxia. Remember at the beginning of my remarks, I asked you to perform an honest assessment of all of the evidence in the case. And I'm going to submit to you that with no other witness should this be more carefully analyzed. I want to illustrate two brief things that Dr. Tobin testified about. And I want to illustrate how I think that these demonstrate a bias. Because you still have to consider an expert witness in the context of bias. I'm going to call it the finger and knuckle testimony and the toe lifting testimony. You may remember this slide, right? That this slide shows George Floyd pushing his fingers against the street to lift his shoulder off the street. That he was pushing his knuckles against the tire. Right? He described what he interpreted this was basically Mr. Floyd trying to push himself up into Onto his, left, onto his left side to free the right lung to help him breathe. Look at the timestamp of the photos taken from the body-worn camera here. They were taken at 8.19.35, 15 seconds after Mr. Floyd was placed on the ground. Yet Dr. Tobin that he also explained that Mr. Floyd went on to breathe for an additional five minutes and 51 seconds until he took his last breath at 8.25. He neglects the fact that at this point, this is the point we just saw, when Mr. Floyd is taken out of the car and he is actually in the side recovery position for about the first two minutes of this nine minutes and 29 seconds. <coughs> Stop moving. Mm. Mom up. Mom up. Mom up. Yeah, Mom up. Mom up. One of the front pouches. Mom up. On my right side bed. Mom up. Mom up. Ah. 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 Mom, I love you. Reese, I love you. You got hobble? Yeah, but he's a little one. I'm dead. My side is listed. It's uh, like, it's uh, it's like I can't top. breathe for nothing, man. It's so good, man. Ah, 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 Mama, I love you. you I can't do nothing. Yeah, your mess is on the way. My face is gone. Do you want to hobble? Uh -huh. um, I can't breathe, man. Please. Please, right. please let me stay in. No. Please, man, I can't breathe. Can you get up on the sidewalk, please? One side or the other, please. My face getting up bad. Here, should we get his legs up? Oh, my God. Right. Nope, just leave him. Just leave him. Just leave him. Yep, just leave him. All right. I'm dead. Hopefully, the park's still sitting on the car. Oh. Look at my face, man. How can... You take, this illustrates how you can take a single nanosecond of time in this arrest. You can have this testimony 
that he's pushing his body up to try to breathe, right? But when you look at the evidence compared to the rest of the evidence, what do you really see? You see a person who is on his side, being held in the side recovery position, whose hand is touching the ground and the tire at times. You cannot take a single isolated frame and reach any conclusions because much like the use of force, the cause of death has to be considered within the totality of the circumstances. And then you may remember, you may remember this testimony. This is Officer Chauvin's foot off the ground. And he described how at this precise moment, Officer Chauvin was applying 91.5 pounds of pressure to the neck of Mr. Floyd. So let's look at this time in the context of the other evidence. How long I gotta hold him down? Why do drugs, kids? about drugs, bro. You understand did anybody even see the toe come up off the ground? I mean, was it half a second, a quarter of a second? Right? But when you take a single incident, a frame, a single frame, and you add the drama, and you make all of the assumptions, right? Officer Chauvin's body weight. Mr. Floyd's EELV, he's the only person who calculated the EELV based upon the presumptions of health, based upon studies, based upon theory. All of this information, you can, you can put this into a single frame, but you have to analyze the evidence in the broader context. You can also see during the clip that Officer Chauvin actually Re, is sort of adjusted forward and touches this car, right? You can make a lot of in, informed decisions about what, how is he shifted. If I'm shifting my weight this way, majority of my weight is shifting on my left foot. If I'm this way, it's on my right foot. You watch this video and you can see the dynamic shifting. And you can see the placement of the toes, right? The toe tucked under helps an officer maintain his weight or helps any person maintain their weight. But a toe flopped over to the side, it's a little harder to balance. You cannot take a single frame and draw conclusions. You have to look at the totality. And remember, he said he spent 150 hours analyzing this thing. His entire testimony is filled with theory, speculation, assumption. Do not let yourselves be misled by a single still frame image. Put the evidence in its proper context. We have to talk about the toxicology. Again, we're not suggesting that this was an overdose death, right? It's a multifactorial process, as Dr. Baker said. So we have to look at what role does the toxicology play in this case. And you need, because again, we had Dr. Eisenschmidt who testified that he found that the levels of uh, fentanyl and methamphetamine were more consistent with this DUI population. But what do we know about the actual toxicology? There were 11 nanograms per milliliter of fentanyl and 0.19 nanograms of methamphetamine. Those are the principal two findings. And additionally, what we know is that the byproduct of methamphetamine, which is amphetamine, was not reported at the levels. Doesn't mean it wasn't technically there, but it was not reported, so it's below threshold reporting values. 
which, signif which signifies that the, the methamphetamine use was recent. Hence, in Dr. Baker's death certificate, he included the recent methamphetamine use because there was no amphetamine. The history of Mr. Floyd's use of controlled substances, it's, it is significant. It's, it's not a character problem. Millions of Americans suffer from opioid, the opioid crisis, right? I mean, it is, a, it is a true crisis that this country is facing. But it is significant to understand the history, not just as much as the long-term history, but his long-term history provides us with insight on how his body physically reacts to methamphetamine or or opioid use, I should say, opioid use within the context of a law enforcement encounter. We know from the testimony of Courtney Ross that Mr. Floyd struggled. We know he had been using controlled substances habitually for some time. We know that on May 6th of 2019, during an encounter with the police, Mr. Floyd ingested some controlled substances, said they were Percocets. He was startled by the police, like he was in this case. Officer drew his gun in that case, too. And that resulted in a blood pressure of 216 over 160. I mean, that's not just high. That is skyrocketing high. We know from Ms. Ross that in March of 2020, they purchased some pills that were supposed to be Percocets, an opioid. But they were clearly knockoffs, she described that. They were clearly knockoffs. She described how those pills made her feel. They kept her up all night, right? The introduction of the methamphetamine. We know from Ms. Ross that in March of 2020, Mr. Floyd was seen for a drug overdose. She described how he felt in that instance. She said his whole body hurt, his stomach hurt. We know, based on again from Ms. Ross, that he was clean and sober for some time while they were in quarantine. We know that Ms. Ross again described taking about a week before a similar pill to the one that they had back in March. Kept her up again all night, right? She said she felt like she was going to die. We know, again, from Ms. Ross, that those pills were purchased from Maury's Hall. She described going to a hotel while Mr. Floyd went into the hotel. She was on the phone with him. She heard Maury's Hall's voice. We know Mr. Floyd was with Maury's Hall on May 25, 2020. We heard from the store clerk, Christopher Martin. He described Mr. Floyd as being high. His responses were delayed, right? He may have been, you know, standing around. He may have been standing up. He may have been able to have communications. But Mr. Martin clearly described him as being high. We heard from Shawanda Hill that when they got back into the car, right, they had a conversation for a few minutes, and suddenly Mr. Floyd fell asleep. All of these things become important, that he had trouble, they had trouble waking him up. She called her daughter for a ride because they couldn't wake her up, wake Mr. Floyd up. They couldn't keep him awake. We heard how Mr. Martin described Mr. Floyd when he went to back to the car and how he was, oh, no, and he wasn't speaking, right? But he kept putting his head back and shaking his head. We know from Peter Chang's body-worn camera that Maurice Hall also described that Mr. Floyd was dozing off. He got to him to see because he was falling asleep a little bit, and then when he woke up, they was up at the door. Right? We know that whether Mr. Floyd was chewing gum while he was in the, the store, 
we can also see he was eating a banana. Right, he bought a banana. So we know when we look at this picture, right, there's something in Mr. Floyd's mouth. Is it gum? Is it banana? Is it drugs? Nobody knows. Right? But regardless of whether it's drugs, bananas, or gum in this incident, we know that there were pills in the car. Right? We know that there were drugs in the car. We know those pills were later tested to be a combination of methamphetamine and fentanyl. That's what was in Mr. Floyd's system. It's relevant because it's what was in his system. These are the pills that were found. We know at some point Mr. Floyd was handcuffed. His hands were behind his back. It would have been physically impossible to put anything in his mouth at that point. And we know that in the squad car, 320 were pills. We know those pills were analyzed. We know those pills consisted of fentanyl and methamphetamine. We know that Mr. Floyd's salivary DNA was found on those pills. How much fentanyl does it take to kill? This is from the Minneapolis Police Department's training. Approximately two to three milligrams. Smaller than a penny. This is from the squad car. You can look at these pictures closely during the course of your evidence. There is a video of Mr. Floyd, when Mr. Floyd is, is being subdued by and restrained by the police Mr. Maurice Hall reaches into his bag. He's looking through the windows. We watch it. And then he throws something. All right? We know that Mr. Floyd had drugs in his mouth. We know that some percentage of that would have been consumed and absorbed into his system. We don't know how much he took before. Right? We don't know when he took an earlier dose in relation because fentanyl had actually started to metabolize in his, so fentanyl was longer before. For the medical experts to minimize the timing and the amount of illicit drugs that were found in Mr. Floyd's bloodstream, it is just simply incredible to me. It is incredible to me. Every single doctor testified that relevant to the, that the absence of signs of fentanyl uh, overdose weren't present because he was alert, he was talking. But it ignores what Shawanda Hill and Maurice Hall says, right? That he was all of a sudden asleep and difficult to wake up. It ignores the fact that the combination of these two drugs, methamphetamine is a powerful stimulant. Fentanyl is a powerful sedative. They use it for surgeries. 
every single doctor dismissed outright. No, no, nothing about this case. Well, it was only 0.19 grams, nanograms per milliliter. It's such a small amount of methamphetamine in his system. It's a vasoconstrictor. It causes the heart's arteries to constrict even tighter. Doesn't matter. Every single doctor just brushed it aside, said it would have no effect. I ask, would any of those doctors prescribe illicit methamphetamine to their patients? Would they give it to their children? Would they give it to their elderly parents with a 90% blockage of the coronary artery, the right coronary artery? I guarantee you the answer is no. Dr. Rich is the only one who said, I would never recommend to my patients that they take any amount of illicit methamphetamine. It is preposterous that it is a preposterous notion that this did not come into play here. A half hour break for lunch. Oh, I, I don't want to interrupt your argument, but Thank you. I apologize. It's members of the jury, thirty minutes for lunch, please. Thank you. All right, this is Kate Snow with you in New York. We have been listening for more than two hours now to the closing arguments uh, from the defense attorney. We've been hearing there from Eric Nelson laying out his perspective on this case. This is the Derek Chauvin trial on charges of murder and manslaughter. We have a, a number of people with us. The judge just said he'll take 30 minutes for a lunch break, uh, and then the defense will continue, presumably, because that attorney was not quite done uh, with his closing arguments yet. Let's start with NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. He's been following the trial all the way through. He joins us from outside Hennepin County Courthouse, where everything has been underway. Uh, Gabe, I thought there were a number of interesting things. Um, number one, the overall point that he seemed to make was that don't just pay attention to the nine minutes and 29 seconds uh, when Derek Chauvin's knee was on George Floyd's neck and he was on the ground. Don't just look at that. Look at the totality of the scene and what those officers were confronting. Uh, yeah, that's right, Kate, and that is something that defense attorney Eric Nelson has said since the beginning of this trial. During opening statements, urging that same thing from jurors to not just pay attention to that nine minutes and 20 second and 29 second uh, period that was in that viral cell phone video uh, that was watched around the world. But in this closing argument, Eric Nelson also played snippets from the body camera videos of those other officers. And he said the nine minutes and 29 seconds ignores the previous 16 minutes and 59 seconds, essentially arguing uh, or wanting jurors to look at the totality of the situation that was unfolding. He also uh, mentioned several uh, other things, Kate, including talking about that this was an unauthorized use of force, as unattractive as it may be, and that these were officers doing their jobs in a highly stressful situation. It's traffic. It, it's tragic, he said. But Kate, this is a, a very long, a lengthy uh, closing argument from Eric Nelson's now, now clocking in uh, at around two and a half hours and now uh, this break for lunch. But he is trying to shift the focus away from that video, uh, Kate. And during uh, that closing uh, argument, you saw um, Derek Chauvin during a rare part in this trial actually viewing his attorney speaking with his mask off. Uh, of course, Derek Chauvin did not testify uh, during this trial, so this may be uh, some attempt on the part of the defense to try and humanize him a bit. But again, this ongoing uh, closing argument where Eric Nelson is trying to shift the focus away from that nine minutes and 29 seconds, arguing, as you just heard there, uh, about the cause of death and trying to throw some reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury, Kate. Yeah, Gabe, we were showing a picture there, a side-by-side -side of Derek Chauvin with the mask on for COVID reasons. That's how he's been throughout much of this trial. And then without it on, he took it off. We went back and looked. He took it off just as his attorney began presenting closing arguments. Let's turn to criminal defense attorney, NBC News legal analyst uh, Danny Savalos is with us. 
Danny, we talked about what we were anticipating. He certainly tried at every turn to create reasonable doubt in what the prosecutors have presented. I have to wonder, and we'll never know the answer for sure, but I suspect the prosecutors are sitting during the break looking at each other and saying, can you believe he played all that video? Uh, they must be thinking that helped them because however much the defense needed whatever evidence was in that video to play it for the jury in closing, it acquired risk in that the jury is again hearing uh, George Floyd plead for his life, say he can't breathe, hear bystanders uh, tell the police to lay off because George Floyd can't breathe. You know, the defense is in a tough position here. They have certain evidence in those videos that they must have felt they needed the jury to hear again in closing. But, of course, by playing that video again, the jury is seeing that video again. And the video has always been the very best evidence in the possession of the prosecution. Yeah, it was interesting how much he relied on video. And Danny, I noticed that it wasn't, it was almost never video from the perspective of Derek Chauvin. It was never video of right. Chauvin with his knee uh, on George Floyd. It was always from the other officers on the scene to try to, to, to show, as he would say, more context. That's right, exactly. But that video has an audio component, and you can hear George Floyd throughout that video. And you even hear sometimes Derek Chauvin, Chauvin saying some of the things that the prosecution felt was helpful to their case. So, uh, yes, you're absolutely right in that the defense carefully cherry-picked the video that would be helpful and avoiding showing a knee and avoiding showing a neck whenever possible. But some of that audio filtered in, and it's, again, that repetition. And repetition is something that gets emblazoned in jurors' heads. And if they hear this pleading for the life over and over again, it might mm -hmm. just sink in. And don't forget, the prosecution has another shot to come back in. And usually this last word is where they really go all out and they get very dramatic and have a lot of flair, flair that they may not have had on the front end for their first go around. Danny, thank you. And we're going to hear from, we suspect, we're going to hear from a different attorney for the prosecution once they get that rebuttal. But first, we're taking a lunch break per the judge. The jury is taking a lunch break. After that, we expect that the attorney uh, for Derek Chauvin will continue and finish his closing arguments before we get to that prosecution rebuttal, which will be the last word before the jury gets the case. I want to bring in Mary Moriarty. She's the former chief public defender for Hennepin County, Minnesota, so right there in Minneapolis. Um, one of the other things that you heard the attorney for Derek Chauvin repeating over and over again is what would a reasonable police officer do? He must have said that a hundred times, a reasonable police officer. Walk us through what he's trying to get those jurors to think. Well, it's it's kind of like during his cross-examination where he would come up with hypotheticals where he would say, you know, wouldn't it be reasonable for a police officer to seek cover if shots were being fired at them before rendering care? And it came across like that because he started talking about what a reasonable police officer would do before Officer Chauvin even arrived at the scene. And he spent a lot of time talking about what happened before the nine minutes and 29 seconds. Uh, which I think is problematic because the critical point here is the nine minutes and 29 seconds. I can also tell you this is the longest closing argument I have ever heard here. I can tell you I have never seen a judge interrupt a defense closing uh, to take a break like this. I think the judge is really annoyed by it. Uh, and he took a half hour break to give the jurors lunch because uh, the, the defense closing argument was going on so long. Yeah, that, that is very interesting. Just as a practical matter, it is 2.17 right now in Minneapolis. It's well past when they would normally take that, that lunch break. Thank you so much for, for staying with us for this. Let me go over to Joyce Vance, NBC legal analyst who's back with us. If you've been with us all day, she's been with us all day as well. Um, Joyce, what do you think prosecutors will have to do when they get that rebuttal after this lengthy uh, defense closing argument? The most important things that the prosecution can do is obliterate any notion that there is reasonable doubt and then leave the jury with a moral certainty that justice can only be achieved if they return a verdict of guilty. Those are your jobs in closing argument as a prosecutor. 
And I, I was listening to Danny's comments earlier, his concern that prosecutors would be really happy that the defense played the videotape over and over during its closing argument. I think Danny is absolutely right here. The defense took some gambles in trying to create reasonable doubt. I don't know if they will pay off for them, particularly replaying that video. And this notion that the defendant was behaving reasonably, that his use of force was not excessive, which would be a good defense. But one of the things that they said was police officers are trained to know that if someone can talk, they can breathe. That leaves an opening for the prosecution to come back in closing and look the jury in the eye and say, at some point, George Floyd was no longer speaking and Derek Chauvin's knee was still on his neck. It feels like the defense has left the prosecution too many opportunities like that to remove the sense that there's reasonable doubt. Maybe there's speculative doubt, but that's not what reasonable doubt needs. And the prosecution will hammer home the need to achieve justice here on behalf of George Floyd. Joyce, thank you. I'd like to get the perspective of a former police chief of Seattle, NBC News law enforcement analyst Carmen Best is still with us as well. Um, Carmen, one of the things that struck me was that they were talking about um, the question of why an officer would use unreasonable force if he knew that all these bystanders were around taking video. Um, and, and, and just your perspective also on the question of how hard it is, how difficult it is to be a police officer. That was raised again and again. We don't necessarily know all the facts was what that lawyer was trying to suggest. Yeah, it was very interesting to listen to the defense. He kept going on about what a reasonable officer would do. A reasonable officer would look around the area. A reasonable officer would pay attention to the crowd. A reasonable officer would modulate, um, you know, the force and and the you know taking uh, Mr. Floyd's hands. He's absolutely right. A reasonable officer would do that. But a reasonable officer also would stop at the point that they were not meeting resistance. I mean, so he gave part of the answer, but because we all can agree reasonable officers would do these things. And also, based on the testimony of all the officers from Minneapolis that came forward, as well as the chief, a reasonable officer would make the, um, would make the decision to discontinue that level of force under those circumstances. So he cut that sentence short, in my view, uh, trying to portray what reasonable reasonableness is, when in fact a reasonable officer, a reasonable human being, would not continue to with those actions with the person uh, begging for their life and saying that they couldn't breathe. So I, I thought that was interesting that he would bring up that point. Uh, but he really didn't finish, uh, you know, finish the thought um, that that would go along with it. And I'm sure that the prosecutors will and pick the, up the on idea, those pieces as well. What about the idea, though, that there were bystanders all around videotaping um, and the argument from the defense that why would he use unreasonable force if he knew he was being videotaped? Well, I mean, that, that is an interesting question, but quite frankly, from my opinion, I, I've been a chief, I've issued a lot of discipline. You know, the arrogance on his face as he was, on uh, uh, Chauvin's face, as he uh, sat there with his knee on the, Mr. Floyd, looking arrogantly out at the crowd, um, you know, basically showing them, you know, he's not going to listen and he's boss. These are my opinions. I've looked at, you know, dozens of cases. Um, and I absolutely think that that had a highly contributing factor to why he um, continued, uh, even with all the cameras out there. Look, we have seen case after case where things haven't gone right uh, in interactions and they're on video and the officers are wearing body worn camera. So that is not unusual. Uh, for something to be um, caught on camera uh, in one of these types of incidents. Yeah, we've certainly seen many just in the last week. Uh, Carmen, thank you so much. Let's go to NBC News contributor Eddie Gloud. He's an NBC. He's excuse me. He's an NBC News contributor, and then we also have NBC News political analyst Eugene Robinson with me, uh, joining me now. Appreciate both of your perspectives on all of this. Uh, I think about where the nation is at at this moment. Uh, the White House this afternoon has said that they're preparing potentially a statement for whatever this verdict will be. The nation is really on standby, on hold, uh, waiting for this. Um, what are your, what's your perspective on how significant this moment could be? Which one of us? <laughs> 
Eddie, I'll put that to you. Sorry. Um, sure. I, I, you know, it's, it's, policing has always been at the center of the question of race in this country. Uh, it has everything to do with the generalized sense of disregard that many black folk feel, black people feel in this country. And what was striking about the defense is that, you know, he says, you know, remember the prosecution said what, hap what you saw happened, happened. Believe your eyes. And then the defense said, don't believe what you see, right? Don't believe what you saw. Right. And then the next thing he said is that the natural consequences that, that George Floyd died of the natural consequences of the deceased. He was the reason why he died. And those sorts of justifications carry with them the burden of history, right? The burden of history of race and policing in this country. So in some ways, the trial represents the American tragedy because police takes, policing takes us to the heart of this generalized sense of disregard that has defined this place for generations. And Professor Gloud, uh, are you, as we sit here, are you concerned about what may happen? Are you, uh, you know, we're, we're hearing reports this afternoon that Facebook, for example, is monitoring and trying to make sure that they don't allow, uh, you know, dissemination of, of posts about violence. Are, are you concerned about the country? Well, I've, yes, absolutely. I'm not the only one concerned. You see National Guard activated. Mm -hmm. You see police on alert. Uh, there's a sense in which we should not only be concerned about the nature of protest, but we should be concerned about the systemic practices that generate the protest. Since Obama's commission in 08, since the Obama commission uh, during the 08 and, and, and his two administrations to now, think about all the bodies. Think about all the parents who had to bury their dead. So we have to finally resolve this issue. So, of course, I'm worried, but we need fundamental change here. Fundamental. Eugene Robinson, a uh, uh, last comment from you. Uh, what are you looking to this afternoon? Well, um, first of all, the, the defense attorney Nelson's closing uh, being so long and taking so many risks, frankly, in airing all that videotape had the air to me or the sense of almost a Hail Mary. I mean, that that um, you sort of pulling out all the stops and going so far as, as Eddie Gloud uh, um, noted to say, don't believe what you see. Don't believe what you saw, which is an, which was an astounding thing uh, to ask the jury to do, particularly a jury on an empty stomach, a jury that's getting hungry sitting there uh, waiting for him to, to, to conclude uh, as they sort of plow through the lunch hour. So to, to do that, I mean, he, he, he seems to be Throwing a Hail Mary, uh, the Hail Marys sometimes do connect, but um, but that's what it, it looked and sounded like to me. And I think this afternoon, um, the, the prosecution, which gets a rebuttal, um, uh, can hit some of the points that um, specific points that that uh, attorney Nelson uh, has highlighted, but but also uh, do what he did play the videotape, show the jurors again, reinforce what they do in fact see and tell them to believe their eyes. Uh, and I, I think that's always been the most effective uh, evidence in this case. And I expect the prosecution uh, to present it uh, in, a, in, a, in a passionate way in their rebuttal this afternoon. It's, it's disturbing even just to see all this video over and over again played out before us. Um, thank you to Eddie Gloud, chairman of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton, and thank you to Eugene Robinson. We're going to take a brief break. The judge has granted a lunch break right now in the closing arguments in the trial of Derek Chauvin. The proceedings should resume within the next half hour or so, so please stay close. We'll return to our live coverage at that time. For now, I'm Kate Snow, and we'll see you back soon.
This is an NBC News special report. Here's Kate Snow. Good afternoon. We're returning to our NBC News special coverage of closing arguments in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. He, of course, accused of murder and manslaughter for the death of George Floyd last May. Earlier, we heard from the prosecution, and then the defense was in the midst of presenting its comments, its closing arguments, when the judge called for a break. We'll resume now with the defense attorney and the final closing arguments. We'll just go off notes <laughs> instead of the PowerPoint. Before the break, we were talking about the controlled substances and the role that they uh, were, were, the levels that they were found in, the role that they may have applied or, or uh, contributed to Mr. Floyd's death. And I was suggesting to you that it is, again, this death needs to be looked at. Mr. Floyd's death needs to be looked at, as Dr. Baker describes, a multifactorial process. This is the way the human body works. The heart beats, the lung breathes, the blood circulates, the brain thinks, the brain controls all of our movements, right? All of this. And to simply come in and say, this particular substance, or these combinations of substances, when taken in con combination with each other, when taken in combination with a, of a person who has blockage in the heart, substantial, significant blockage in the heart, when we know that these drugs play a particular role in, the, in, in how the blood circulates, to just poo-poo it and say it has nothing to do with anything is just really a preposterous notion. Yet Dr. Baker, Dr. Fowler, and Dr. Thomas have all certified deaths at levels less than 11 nanograms per milliliter or 19 nanograms or combination, right? These deaths have been certified on that basis alone, and it didn't necessarily contain any of the other issues that were confronting Mr. Floyd on that day. Likewise, again, every other doctor that has testified has gone to great lengths to dismiss the role of Mr. Floyd's heart disease and hypertension in this case. Forensic pathologists define coronary artery disease resulting in death. It can, death can occur with 70 to 75 percent blockage. That is sufficient to cause the, a person's death. Every pathologist who testified in this case has indicated likewise that they have certified deaths with those types of blockage and attributed it to the coronary artery disease. Yet here again, this has played zero role. Dr. Rich testified Mr. Floyd had a healthy heart. Coronary heart disease, not relevant, according to the state. Hypertensive disease, not relevant. Drugs acting to further constrict an already heart, diseased heart, not relevant. Adrenaline coursing through Mr. Floyd's body, not relevant. What does adrenaline do? It further constricts the arteries, right? Adrenaline from the paraganglioma wasn't there, didn't happen, played no, no role. They just want you to ignore significant medical issues that presented to Mr. Floyd. And the failure of the state's experts to acknowledge any possibility, any possibility at all, that any of these other factors in any way contributed to Mr. Floyd's death defies medical science and it defies common sense and reason. Now, Dr. Tobin describes the death of Mr. Floyd essentially, as I understand again, to hypoxia, 
low oxygen, resulting uh, in brain, going to the brain, low oxygen to the brain. Dr. Fowler also ascribes the death to a hypoxic death, but that the heart was the, was the muscle that did not get the oxygen, resulting in a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. The reasons that Dr. Fowler dismissed the notion of brain hypoxia are because, number one, hypoxia of the brain results in certain observable symptoms. The brain demands more oxygen, right? It takes 20% of our oxygen to function the brain, even though it's one of the, it's, it's a smaller percentage of our body. It is the most sensitive to the loss of oxygen, and it reveals a progressive set of symptoms. Confusion, which was not exhibited, right? Because if you compare the if you compare the testimony about how whether Mr. Floyd was intoxicated, well, he didn't exhibit any confusion, right? Restlessness, not exhibited. Shortness of breath, it was complained of, but that is also a sensation that can be caused by a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. Visual changes, not complained of. Incoherent speaking, not complained of. When someone is experiencing hypoxia to the brain, as Dr. Tobin stated, you would see an increased ventilation or respiratory rate. But Dr. Tobin said it is a completely normal respiratory rate, 22 breaths per minute. The timeline in this case is consistent with a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. At 8.23 and 58 seconds, Mr. Floyd speaks. I really can't breathe. You can speak, you have oxygen in your brain. At 8.24.09, he again verbalizes, please, I can't breathe, indicating at 8.24.09 that his brain has oxygen and there is no impairment to his airway. 39 seconds later, Mr. Floyd goes limp at 8.24 and 48. A person can hold their breath for 39 seconds, right? That does not result in hypoxia in 39 seconds. 27 seconds later, according to Dr. Tobin, Mr. Floyd takes his last breath. It's a total of 66 seconds, one minute and six seconds from the time that we know there's enough oxygen in his brain to speak, no occlusion to the airway at that point, 66 seconds to his, from his last word to his last breath. This timeline is consistent with a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. It is not consistent with the longer process of brain hypoxia. Dr. Fowler's final analysis was that Mr. Floyd died from a cardiac arrhythmia due to atherosclerotic and hypertensive cardiovascular disease during restraint by police. Other significant factors, fentanyl intoxication, methamphetamine intoxication, possible CO, carbon monoxide exposure, and the paraganglioma. What role did Mr. carbon monoxide play in Mr. Floyd's death? We don't know. No, nothing was ever tested as far as the vehicle is concerned. We don't know if a car was emitting carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, we don't know. One thing we do know is that it was running. And how can we tell that it was running? Because in the video we watched earlier, when Thomas Lane pulls in that squad car at Cup Foods, he puts it in gear, he takes it out of gear, he puts it in park, he never touches the keys of that vehicle, and he gets out. The car was running. I have one last point to make, and I should be fa fairly quick with this. The superseding cause that was discussed. A superseding cause is, an, is a cause that comes after the defendant's acts, alters the natural sequence of events, and is the sole cause of a result that would not have otherwise occurred. Now, let's look at the medical timeline. We know that EMS was called initially at code two at 8.20 and 11 seconds. 
We know that EMS was stepped up to code 3 at 8.21 and 35 seconds. We know that EMS responded to Cub Foods based on uh, the videos at 8.27 and 27 seconds. We know that EMS called for fire at 20, 30, 8, 36. It takes approximately three minutes for EMS and the arresting officers to put Mr. Floyd into the ambulance and the ambulance pulls away from Cup Foods at 8.30 and 17 seconds. Fire responds to Cup Foods at 8.32.59. That's four minutes and 15 seconds after they were called. That's pretty close in consideration to the three minute expectation of Ms. Hansen. But the ambulance had driven several blocks away to 36 and Park arriving sometime between 8.31 and 8.33. That's one and a half, and we know that because there are two exhibits, 62 and 63, that were introduced. 62 shows one paramedic and officer Lane in the back. 63 shows two paramedics and officer Lane in the back. So somewhere between a minute and a half to three minutes to get to 36 and Park where they began the resuscitative efforts. The first air is pumped into Mr. Floyd per Dr. Tobin at 20.35.06. That is 10 minutes after Mr. Floyd went unconscious per Dr. Tobin, but it is 7 minutes and 46 seconds after EMS responded to cut foods. We ultimately know that the ambulance left uh, 36 and Park at 8.48 and 23 minutes. It arrived at HCMC at 8.53, shortly after 8.53. So it took about five minutes to get from 36 and Park to HCMC. What if you, what would have happened if EMS had started resuscitative efforts right away? What would have happened if rather than driving to 36 and Park, they went to the hospital? They would have been there in that time. I am not suggesting to you, I am not suggesting to you that the ambulance paramedics did anything wrong. But it raises the prospect of that continued delay in resuscitation. What if EMS had administered Narcan? We heard that it would not have hurt him, and it could have helped him. I'm not blaming the paramedics. More importantly than this analysis, in this analysis is, it shows that human beings make decisions in highly stressful situations that they believe to be right in the very moment it is occurring. There's lots of what ifs that could have happened, what could have happened, what should have happened. Lots of them in lots of regards. But we have to analyze this case from the perspective of a reasonable police officer at the precise moment with the totality of the circumstances when it comes to the use of force. We have to look at the cause of death to determine did Mr. Floyd die exclusively of asphyxia or were there other contributing factors that were not the natural result of Mr. Chauvin's acts? Right? Things that happened that were set in motion before Mr. Chauvin ever arrived. The drug ingestion, right? the bad heart, the diseased heart, the hypertension. All of these things existed before Mr. Chauvin arrived. The struggle, what role did the struggle play? We know, based on a prior incident, that Mr. Floyd's heart was beating at 219 over 160 in a, in a situation where he was confronted by police and had ingested drugs. He didn't die that day. All of this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, all of this, when you take into consideration the presumption of innocence, the presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, 
I would submit to you that it is nonsense to suggest that none of these other factors had any, any role. That is not reasonable. And when you, as members of the jury, conclude your analysis of the evidence, when you review the entirety of the evidence, when you review the, the law as written, and you conclude it all within this, all within a, a thorough, honest analysis, the state has failed to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, Mr. Chauvin should be found not guilty of all counts. Thank you. Members of the jury, there's an issue I need to discuss with the lawyers, so we're going to send you back to your room for probably about five minutes. All right, Kate Snow with you here in New York. We've been watching the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer accused of uh, accused of uh, homicide, accused of manslaughter and murder, I should say, to be specific, uh, in trial in Hennepin County, Minnesota. That's the Minneapolis area. During nearly three hours addressing the court, his attorney uh, just now painted a picture of reasonable doubt. Let's go to Danny Sir. Uh, Let's go to Danny Savalos, who's with us, who's been following all of this. Uh, Danny, one of the things that he said had to do with looking at the full picture, and I think we have some sound that we can play for those who are just joining us, sort of a, a, a okay, we don't have the sound, but, but the idea was it is not just about nine minutes and 29 seconds. It's actually about all the time that happened before that, when the police first arrived on scene. He also was just now trying to paint a picture of the cause of death and, and saying that there are many factors. He kept saying it's a multi-factor situation. How do you feel, in, now that we're done, how do you feel the defense did in wrapping up its case? I think the defense took a few risks in their closing. Number one, making it just so long and pushing into the jurors' lunch. It may sound like a, a minor detail, but you know, hungry jurors are something you do want to avoid. Uh, it, was, it was so long that the judge had to interrupt and go to a break when, in fact, uh, Nelson was pretty close to being finished. Another risk was showing any part of the video, of course, you didn't always see Derek Chauvin's knee in the video, but you heard what was going on, including George Floyd pleading for his life. Uh, but in this situation, the defense did stick to its major themes. Attack causation, uh, prove that, show that the prosecution didn't meet its burden, that Derek Chauvin was a substantial cause of George Floyd's death. And then part two being that the, uh, the knee restraint, the uh, neck compression, was not uh, imminently dangerous and that it's something that is essentially taught and acceptable and using the prosecution's own experts against them. Uh, the lieutenant that they called, in addition to the medical examiner, the only person who put hands on George Floyd, using the prosecution's own evidence against them. Uh, yes, it was a very long closing. I thought it came on stronger in the end because he focused on his major themes. But you did hear him arguing reasonable doubt right from the get-go. That was the theme here, just the, a point to the burden, and it's reasonable doubt all the way. And Danny, to state the obvious, it takes one juror to, to not convict on any of these three charges. It takes one juror, yes, but uh, it also creates the potential for a hung jury. And that's something that maybe the defense doesn't want. If you're a, pri a defendant paying for private counsel, the, no the idea of having to go through another trial and paying counsel again doesn't make a mistrial feel so much like a victory as it may feel to the defense attorney. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. It really, in defense, it only takes one juror to hold up a jury. You need unanimity from those jurors. Uh, and one holdout can totally change uh, the outcome. But then it may become a waiting game, mm -hmm. and you might have a jury that is deadlocked first, uh, only partially, but then maybe possibly hopelessly deadlocked, which would lead to a hung jury. Danny Savalas, thank you. Let's bring in civil rights lawyer, former prosecutor David Henderson is with us. You're a former prosecutor. So up next, we've got the prosecution coming back for a rebuttal. What do we expect? Well, Kate, I think what you're going to see are fireworks in the rebuttal. I think that they've probably saved Jerry Blackwell, who's one of the strongest prosecutors. In fact, 
He's my favorite lawyer among the prosecutor team that's on the case. And this isn't uncommon at all. If you give a prosecution team 45 minutes in a normal case, it, they'll typically reserve 30 minutes or more for rebuttal. The initial closing argument is nothing special. You normally let the defense get up, do their thing, and then you close the case out. There are some confusing legal principles that need to be explained, like what substantial causal factor means. Jerry Blackwell is more than equipped to handle those. He handles asbestos cases where these core themes come up often. And this could, I'm not positive, but it could explain part of what we saw from the defense. What you don't want to do is give a lawyer like Jerry Blackwell time to come back and rebut you immediately after lunch once the jury has been fed and they're now rested. What we might have seen here was a deliberate attempt to wear the jury down before they hear from him. And the judge, just to be clear, said, I think the, I think he said would take five minutes right now. Um, we had earlier anticipated there would be big breaks in between each of these sections, but now I think we're down to just a few minutes. So in the time we have until we see uh, folks come back into the courtroom, we have, I haven't been able to talk to you about your assessment of where things are right now in terms of both the presentation from the prosecution and from the defense. If, if you're on that jury, what are you thinking? If you're in that jury right now, Kate, you're wondering how much longer this is going to go on. <laughs> We're talking about these lawyers talking for a long time individually. And let's just be real. People don't listen to their preachers for 45 minutes, let alone speeches from lawyers that go on for hours. At this point, we're talking about, what, over four hours of listening to people speak. So I think what needs to happen here is this, each side needs to wrap it up, try to keep things tight. I think the defense has not done a great job. But remember, they don't have to do a great job. They just have to appeal to one juror who will hold things up. I think that's what they are trying to do. And I don't think that their strategy so much is focusing on authorized use of force or cause of death so much as it is dog whistling, thing, saying things that are inflammatory enough to get that unreasonable person that you might have missed during jury selection to gum up the entire process. All right, David Henderson, thank you. I think we'll go back now to Hennepin County. We'll listen to what the judge is saying. They were doing some sidebar business for a moment there. Uh, but let's listen in. Principal argument um, in terms of contradicting the uh, the defense argument. I mean, the state made comments about the essentially about the nonsense of the defense in this case, and it is improper. I know what you're going to say. We'll hold that thought. Mr. Blackwell, you may, you may get the state's rebuttal. Members of the jury, before Mr. Blackwell begins, I'm going to reread one of the instructions. And that is specifically. that attorneys are officers of the court and it is their duty to make objections they think proper and to argue their client's cause. However, the arguments or other remarks of an attorney are not evidence. If the attorneys or I have made or should make any statement as to what the evidence is that differs from your recollection of the evidence, you should disregard that statement and rely solely on your own memory. If an attorney's argument contains any statement of the law that differs from the law I give you, disregard the attorney's statement. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, last uh, lawyer, I think, talking to you uh, with closings will be me, and I uh, won't be too long. I'm going to start talking to you about uh, what I call the 46th witness. Uh, you actually have heard from 45 witnesses on the stand, but there is a 46th witness. And this witness was testifying to you before you got here to the courtroom. Uh, they testified over everybody else's testimony on the stand. It's the only witness that will be talking to you when you're back in deliberations. And that witness, ladies and gentlemen, is common sense. Common sense. We'll continue talking with you uh, all the while. Because while you've heard hours and hours and hours uh, of discussions here in the closing, ultimately it really isn't that complicated. 
uh, in, in what it is you have to decide with respect to the excessive use of force and uh, the issue of causation. The fact that it's so simple that a child could understand it. In fact, a child did understand it when the nine-year-old girl said, get off of him. That's how simple it was. Get off of him. Common sense. Why is it necessary to continue applying deadly restraint to a man who is defenseless, who is handcuffed, who is not resisting, who is not breathing, who doesn't have a pulse, and to go on and do that for another three plus minutes before the ambulance shows up and then to continue doing it. How is that a reasonable exercise in the use of force? You can believe your eyes, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it was what you thought it was. It was what you saw. Uh, it was homicide. Now, Mr. Nelson spent quite a bit of time saying to you, perform an honest assessment. Look at all the evidence. Consider all of it. Reasonable officer. Reasonable officer is not magic words that you simply apply to Mr. Chauvin, and then he becomes a reasonable officer because you applied those words. Reasonable is as reasonable does. And here, what you saw wasn't reasonable, and you didn't get the whole truth. Notice how when you had the discussion about reasonable officer Mr. Chauvin, the whole narrative cut off before we got to the point that Mr. Floyd was not moving, that he was not conscious, that he didn't have a pulse, and that Mr. Chauvin was still on top of him even when the EMTs showed up, and he still didn't get off of him. How is that what a reasonable officer does? And then if you look at the totality of the circumstances, which you heard so much about, why doesn't that tell you exactly where he was coming from? If we're talking about reasonable officer. Now, you heard any number of other things that, in looking at the totality of circumstances and trying to do an honest assessment, you didn't get the whole story either. You got bits and pieces and parts. And I call them a story, ladies and gentlemen, because it's either completely not true or the facts have been altered in order to make a point to you, which also makes it a story. What you're going to reach when you all deliberate is a verdict. Verdict is a Latin word that means the truth. You're not going to reach a story and when all is said and done. You'll be getting at the truth. Why are we engaged in telling stories when we've heard evidence, facts from the stand? Why is that? But you just heard a number of them. I'll give you a few examples of the stories. You were just uh, talked to about how safe the prone position is. And you've heard this in the trial. The prone position is safe. Here are the Canadian studies. After everything you've heard, you already know now that not a single one of those studies ever examined anybody who had a knee on the neck. You know that. You also know that about these so-called prone studies, none of them actually measured what was the oxygen reserve. That is, how is the oxygen actually being affected by putting somebody in the prone position and any amount of weight on them? They never even measured it. You know that too, although that wasn't brought up when you've been told about the studies to show that the prone position is safe. You heard again about excited delirium. There was not a single witness who sat in that chair and gave you testimony under oath who told you that they felt that Mr. George Floyd suffered from excited delirium. Not one. One of the criteria for excited delirium is the person's impervious to pain. They don't feel pain. They're not people saying, my neck hurts. My knee hurts. Everything hurts. They're not grimacing because the wrist hurt for excited delirium. That's a fact. If that's a fact, why are we talking about it? Why isn't that said if you're going to be hearing about excited delirium? Then we turn to Dr. Baker, for example, where there's a discussion of homicide, and you were told that homicide was a medical term. That's not what Dr. Baker said. Dr. Baker said homicide means killed at the hands of another. It means at the hands of another is what homicide means. At the hands of another. And he was pretty clear in discussing the cause of death. He said it was cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, so dual restraint and neck compression. And he did explain what complicating means. He said it means in the environment of. So it reads as though it's called cardiopulmonary arrest in the environment of law enforcement, so dual restraint and neck compression. 
what you were just told, and that was attributed to Dr. Baker, is that somehow he meant that this was an unexpected result. It was an unexpected re result of the law enforcement so dual restraint and neck, uh, so dual restraint and neck compression. Dr. Baker didn't come in to talk to any of us about use of force by police officers. He's, he's not in the mind of any police officer. It is not what he said. It was simply words that were put into his mouth, but you check your notes on what his testimony actually was, and you'll see that that wasn't it. You've heard now for the umpteenth time in this trial, what is the evidence on autopsy for asphyxia? If you're looking at the body tissues, You've heard it from witness after witness on the stand. I even pulled out big, giant, thick textbooks that even Dr. Fowler, the defense own expert, says these are reliable authorities on it. Every one of them says that in half or better of the cases where somebody has clearly died from insufficient oxygen, you don't see any evidence in the body tissues. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a fact. Now, if this is supposed to be about performing an honest assessment, looking at the totality of the evidence, how is that not mentioned to you in summarizing the evidence? How is it not mentioned to you? And I can't even stop there because you were also told about the law that applies to this. You first told by Judge Cahill, and no question that was accurate, but then you were told by Mr. Nelson, no question that was not accurate. I'll tell you what I mean. When he was talking about causation, and he talks about fentanyl, heart failure, hypertension, and he said that we have to show beyond a reasonable doubt that none of these other factors played a role. That's not the law. And, and you don't have to believe me. You'll be able to read it yourself. You'll have the instructions there and see if Mr. Black will isn't telling you the truth. Uh, that what we need to show is that the defendant's actions were a substantial causal factor in his death. Doesn't have to be the only causal factor. Doesn't have to be the biggest substantial factor. It just has to be one of them. A substantial factor in the cause of death. And uh, the instruction will say that the fact that other causes contribute to the death does not relieve the defendant of criminal liability. There can be other factors. In fact, Dr. Baker had a section, I think that was called other factors, and he was clear. Those other factors are not direct causes of the death. The direct cause was cardiopulmonary arrest that was in the environment of the police, so dual restraint and neck compression. Point blank. When I got back uh, and got him to question him again after Mr. Nelson was finished, all I did was ask him about what he had written in his certificate on the case. Cause of death, cardiopulmonary arrest, manner of death, homicide, at the hands of another. He was crystal clear on it. Uh, he did not uh, equivocate. But what you have gotten here is uh, a number of what I'd call stories. Um, that once you uh, analyze them uh, and you... Uh, once you analyze them, uh, and uh, against the facts and the evidence that you've heard, you'll see what I mean. Take, for example, the notion that Mr. Floyd dying of cardiopulmonary arrest, dying from low oxygen, was just coincidental. He just happened to die at the same time in the same place of factors completely unrelated to what Mr. Chauvin was doing with his subdual restraint and neck compression. That's a story, ladies and gentlemen, and defies common sense. I'll show you what I mean. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we, uh, if we just treat each day that Mr. Floyd lived, he was born October 14, 1973, and just made it a dot on a page. And we looked at over his lifetime. You'll see here, if we uh, look over 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years, 
up to uh, May 25th of 2020. That means that Mr. Floyd would have lived up to that day 17,026 days. Now, only one of these dots corresponds to May 25th. <clears throat> only one of them. All the rest of these days, all the rest of these dots represent days that Mr. Floyd was living. He was breathing. He had a being. He was living. He was breathing and had a being with every single disorder that Mr. Nelson has chronicled each and every day, you know, with his struggles with opioid addiction, uh, with his high blood pressure, et cetera, every single day, except the one day. May 25th, that tiny little speck of a dot, and not even that whole day. Because as we know, there was a 10 minute segment, nine minutes and 29 seconds that he didn't survive. So in a, one day's time, there are 144 of those, 10 minute seconds. And only one of them was the reason that Mr. Floyd uh, failed to survive. And what happened in that space? Well, you know what happened, ladies and gentlemen. That's where there was deadly force applied by Mr. Chauvin. We know it was deadly force because we heard from Officer Zimmerman on the stand who told us it was deadly force. He said it's deadly force because it's force capable of killing a person, which makes it deadly force. Now, deadly force, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once you see what Mr. Floyd was subjected to with this deadly force in the prone position, uh, there are certain consequences or the risks that come with the prone position and the use of this kind of deadly force. And that primary risk is it affects your breathing. You heard that from witness after witness after witness. It affects your breathing, makes it harder to breathe. You put the subject into the prone recovery position as soon as possible because you don't want to affect their breathing, low oxygen. Do you have evidence of low oxygen here? There is evidence of low oxygen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is medically uh, unassailable, medically. Take, for example, the fact that Mr. Floyd uh, had an anoxic seizure. That is, he's already unconscious, not breathing, and the body is simply having a twitching reflex. That anoxic seizure represents low oxygen to the brain, and that is what causes the anoxic seizure. But not only that, he suffered from, remember, PEA. Um, and you remember we talked about the, the PEA, the pulseless electrical activity, PEA? The common cause of PEA is low oxygen. You can't fake it. You can't make that up. There's evidence of the low oxygen, and it would have been what preceded, what would have proceeded from the use of this very kind of, a, of deadly force. And this deadly force took place, as we know, within the nine minutes and uh, 29 seconds. Now, you heard the statement that the state is seeking to ignore uh, significant uh, medical issues, uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. What you heard from doctor after doctor, whether it's Dr. Langenfeld, the ER physician, Dr. Rich, the cardiologist, Dr. Tobin that you've heard so much about, Dr. Smock, um, so many of the doctors you heard, that, that here's, and Dr. Dr. Baker also, but and Dr. Thomas, here's where they all converge, is that they recognize first and foremost uh, that there was a use of force by Mr. Chauvin that set off a number of things medically for Mr. Floyd that culminated in his death. Remember, he died of cardiopulmonary arrest. That means the heart has stopped and he's no longer breathing. Now, Dr. Baker will tell you uh, that, that this stress to which Mr. Floyd was subjected in the subdual and the restraint by Mr. Chauvin and others was enough in, of, and by itself to explain Mr. Floyd's demise. When asked the question, what about his oxygen levels? Did he have insufficient oxygen? That's not something I can calculate as a forensic pathologist, said Dr. Baker. That's not something I can calculate as a forensic pathologist, said Dr. Fowler. And Dr. Thomas said the same thing. But the doctor, they said they would defer to pulmonologists in every case, which is who and what we have in Dr. Dr. Uh, Tobin, who did the calculations. 
um, who could tell you how much oxygen was in Mr. Floyd's body. And not only that, he could tell you that when he's put into the prone position, that his oxygen would have decreased by 24%. He can tell you that when weight was put on Mr. Floyd's back, the oxygen diminished, diminished to 43%. He can tell you that uh, with the weight on his back, that the hypopharynx would have narrowed to 15% or lower, making it difficult for anyone to breathe through. He was able to tell you medically, scientifically, not only could Mr. Floyd not have survived this diminution in oxygen reserves and supply, but no human being could have survived, based on the science, based on the science. Now, if it's dismissed as theoretical, which is a word I think I heard, theoretical, well, it's the same theoretical that Dr. Fowler said that he would defer to someone else to create because he can't do it. And that's exactly what Dr. Tobin did. And so here, ladies and gentlemen, we're only required to show you that Mr. Chauvin's conduct was a substantial cause, a substantial factor in Mr. Floyd's death. Did he simply die automatically from, uh, and exclusively from the low oxygen? Ultimately, the low oxygen translates into not breathing and the heart stopping because we have cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, did it first impact the heart, then the heart stopped first? Ultimately, they both stop because we have cardiopulmonary arrest all stemming back to the subdual restraint and neck compression uh, from Mr. Chauvin. They all agree that that was the precipitating point. And then from there, the stresses, the strains on Mr. Floyd's body, the low oxygen culminated in, in his uh, ultimate uh, demise and his passing away. So I want to uh, address kind of several other points on the heading of what I think uh, are stories that you've heard versus, uh, I think, the, uh, the truths uh, here. Um, you know, when the case started, I think you all were asked and talked to about there being two sides to every story, two sides to every story, which is one of the most dangerous things, I think, about the process of truth because it suggests that everything is simply reduced to a story. And if it is a story, uh, that means there can be two multiple sides to a story and they can never be a truth or reality, except that what we're about here is getting to the truth um, and not simply um, stories. Now, it is most certainly right, for example, for a police officer to take seriously uh, this overarching mission of the police department, embracing the sanctity of, sanctity of life and protection of the public as the highest values. But it is equally wrong. It is equally wrong to take this badge, which is a symbol of a commitment to a higher calling to serve the people, to use this badge as a license to abuse the public, to mistreat the public, to not follow uh, proper procedures, to not render aid when you should administer aid. That's, that's wrong, that's not a story, that's simply wrong. And the only two sides to that would be the W and the G uh, for that being wrong. Now, you have heard uh, statements to the effect of Mr. Chauvin being concerned about uh, the bystanders and about others. Well, if you are looking at the totality of the evidence, you have to bear in mind that at, at, at all relevant times here, there were five grown men police officers right there. And uh, four right there on the scene. And then you got Officer Chang who was there too. There's a radio uh, to call for backup if they felt it was needed. Um, you didn't hear any evidence about any call for backup uh, at all. Now. There was concern here that, uh, that Mr. Chauvin uh, was concerned. And I won't say much more about body language than has already been discussed. And you'll decide for yourself whether that was the face of one who was afraid at the time. Because he had all of the power at this point. 
He had the bullets, guns, he had the mace that he uh, threatened uh, the bystanders with, he had backup, he had the badge, uh, and uh, he had all of it. And, uh, and, and what was there to be afraid of here, particularly at this scene? There were three high school juniors there and a second grader who was going to the store to, uh, to get candy. There was a high school senior who was taking her cousin uh, to the store, a first responder on the scene. And there was Donald Williams, um, who wanted nothing more than to try to intervene to try to save Mr. Floyd's life. Mr. Charles McMillan, a 61-year-old uh, man, uh, that if I gave him a name, I would call him the mayor of the neighborhood. Uh, he just likes to see what's going on and, uh, and to look out for things, but he was simply there to try to also to intervene to try to save Mr. Floyd's life. So this wasn't the face of fear or concern or worry. You've seen what the face of fear and worry looked like uh, that day at that time. That's what fear and worry uh, looked like. When Mr. George Floyd was well aware that with one wrong move of his hand, one turn in the wrong direction, and it could be his last turn that he could be shot to death over an investigation around a fake $20 bill. Um, that's fear. Now you're told some stories about the, uh, the bystanders uh, and uh, the suggestion that they were an unruly crowd. You've gotten to meet them now. Uh, you've uh, gotten to meet uh, two thirds of ones who were there that, uh, at that time. I described them earlier as a bouquet of humanity. And I call them that because they came at different ages, uh, different genders, different races, and they all came together focused on the one thing, uh, which was they saw that a human being they did not know was suffering, and they wanted to try to intervene to stop the suffering. And uh, in that sense, uh, they were not only symbols of the love and caring we want to encourage, but they were also something more than that. They were also symbols of what it means to respect this badge because they were in a very difficult spot then. You saw them on the stand almost to the last one in tears. Uh, you felt the anguish even a year after the fact. Uh, they felt torn between their love for the sanctity of life itself that had them wanting to intervene to try to save Mr. Floyd's life and on the other hand, their respect for the authority that the badge represents, for the city, for the state. They were torn between it. Now, the ultimate proof of this is if those bystanders did not respect this badge, they could very easily have taken the law into their own hands and simply have removed Mr. Chauvin. Then we wouldn't have to have any discussions about how reasonable it was for him to stay on a man's neck who wasn't even breathing. Uh, we wouldn't have to have any of these kinds of discussions at all. But none of them did that. None of them did that because they respected this badge even if it tore them up inside. None of them did that. Instead, they called the police on the police. Instead, they picked up their phones to memorialize what they were seeing so that it could not be forgotten and so that it could not be misrepresented. Instead, they waited for their day to come in and, uh, and talk with you. Not, ladies and gentlemen, to tell their story, but to tell the truth about what they experienced. They didn't deserve to be called unruly because they weren't. And you will hear time and again, oh, the crowd was getting louder. Oh, the crowd was getting more agitated. Earlier in the trial, you hear, oh, they were getting angrier and angrier. And so we, we can't see somehow what it is they're getting upset around. The fact that a defenseless, helpless man is literally losing his life one breath at a time right in front of them, and there's nothing that they can do. If you love life, you get excited when you see life being taken, when that's your perception. That's what they were excited about. And if they all just simply wanted a donut in watching this, you might wonder what's wrong with them. That's why they were upset. So you felt their pain, you felt their sense of helplessness. What you heard about them was a story, ladies and gentlemen. And stories really are just excuses that get told. Can you object to that statement? Do you the use of the word stories? 
The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, that there can be no excuse for police abuse. And, uh, and, and I'll be clear, ladies and gentlemen, um, I will tell you, if I think there's a fact that's been altered, I will tell you what it is. And, uh, and that's all I ever mean when I say story. But there is no excuse, ladies and gentlemen, for police abuse. And, uh, and you've heard any number of these. Uh, so let me, let me walk through some of them. Um, you've heard uh, accounts that, that the traffic was distracting uh, to Mr. Chauvin. Well, the fact was that you heard from the 911 dispatcher, Jenna Scurry, who was watching the scene. And she said that the officers remained in the same place, in the same positions for so long on top of the body of Mr. Floyd that she thought the camera was broken and frozen. They weren't distracted. They weren't looking around because they were concerned about uh, being disturbed by the traffic or anything else. They had an officer there, Officer Tao, whose job it was just to fend off and keep away distractions and could have called others uh, if needed. You've also uh, heard about the paramedics uh, taking, took too long. The paramed paramedics took longer to get there than was planned. Uh, should have been there within three minutes. And your common sense will tell you that the mere fact that the paramedics took longer than Mr. Chauvin and me have thought is certainly not a reason uh, to either use excessive force or to abuse, or to be indifferent to the fact that somebody is no longer breathing and doesn't have a pulse, uh, that the paramedics took too long. You heard about the, uh, the paraganglioma. The paraganglioma, which was also referred to as an incidentaloma, uh, because that's how rare it is and insignificant it is. Uh, the hallmark of a paraganglioma, headaches. Mr. Floyd wasn't reporting headaches. So if you're going to talk about a paraganglioma, why don't you talk about the fact that you know the hallmark is headaches and he didn't have them? If this is about getting at the truth and as well um, performing an honest assessment, if that's what we're doing. The fact of the matter is the paragangliomas, there have been six cases in reported history, all of reported history, where somebody had a sudden death from a paraganglioma, ever, period. Carbon monoxide. Now, other than Mr. Nelson saying that the car was turned on at the time, nobody from that witness stand, from the evidence in this case, said the police car was on. You did hear it was a hybrid vehicle. You know, how are we talking about carbon monoxide with a car that there's no evidence from the stand that the car was even on? If we're going to talk about carbon monoxide and give this a reasonable, honest assessment. But even more to the point about carbon monoxide that you just can't lose sight of. Whose car was it, ladies and gentlemen, that if Mr. Floyd is being subdued on the ground by Mr. Chauvin, and if he puts his face on the spewing out carbon monoxide, why isn't that an unreasonable use of force by an officer? In your custody is in your care. It's not in your custody, I don't care. In your custody is in your care. What reasonable police officer would apprehend someone on the ground to do them and put their face in front of a tailpipe of a car and then think that's a defense. Here, not particularly fair, there's no evidence the car was ever even on. And, and you learned all you need to know, which was if he was suffering from carbon monoxide, as Dr. Tobin told you, you wouldn't be able to get a 98% oxygen saturation from the oxygen they gave him artificially. You heard about the, uh, the fentanyl overdose. And with this one, you were just told, oh, earlier, earlier that afternoon, he was asleep in the car. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not the hallmark of somebody who dies from a fentanyl overdose. It isn't just that you took a nap and dozed off. If you, are, if you pass away from a fentanyl overdose, you cannot be awakened. You are in a coma. Uh, if people are shaking you, it is to no avail. If we're doing an honest assessment of the facts, looking at the totality of the circumstances, if we're going to talk about fentanyl, death by fentanyl or an overdose, why is it that said? He does not 
fit the description of anyone who dies from a fentanyl overdose, and even Dr. Fowler conceded it from the stand in terms of what a fentanyl overdose looks like. It does not look like somebody who's saying, I can't breathe, my neck hurts, my, my back hurts, everything hurts. You know, you can't win. I'm not trying to win. That's not what happens when somebody uh, is, is suffering or dying from a fentanyl overdose. They are completely non-responsive and not reactive at all. Methamphetamine. Ladies and gentlemen, what meth? There was so little of it that it was below uh, the uh, therapeutic levels that are given. You heard that from the toxicologist from NMS, the laboratory that Hennepin County sends off, the medical examiner pathology, uh, not pathology, but uh, blood samples to, to test for, for tox. He told you it was a minuscule amount of meth that was in his blood. And then we heard about the pills. Now, on cross-examination, uh, on the pills, I brought out the fact that what they were saying was a pill that he was taking in the car was just as likely chewing gum and showed you just before he was in the car, he was chewing gum in the store, opened his mouth, he saw the same like substance in his mouth. But here's the deal about the pills. If we're really going to give this an honest assessment of the evidence, why are we talking about pills that are not in the system? We know what's in his bloodstream already. We know he struggles with the opioid addiction. Why are we talking about pills that we know were not in George Floyd? Why? You have to decide that for yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Why is that even being brought up when we know what's in his bloodstream? What is the point? And you keep hearing drugs in the car, drugs in the car. And the drugs were one pill. One. One pill that was not in George Floyd. And then the suggestion that he was somehow taking it in handcuffs in the police car, which makes no sense. Uh, there was no evidence of George Floyd taking any pills in the police car at, at all. There was a pill found there um, only. Uh, you heard uh, references in talking about Dr. Tobin and his 46 years of experience studying the way people breathe. But, you know, Mr. Chauvin's not a medical doctor. He doesn't have... Uh, these years of experience and hours to pull over records. He didn't need it, ladies and gentlemen, because you know who else is not a medical doctor? Nine-year-old girl is also not a medical doctor. You didn't need to be a medical doctor uh, to understand that when somebody's saying, I can't breathe, and not just saying it, everything about them is showing that they can't breathe, and when that ends, they just are passed out. You don't need uh, a, a Ph.D., you don't need an MD uh, to understand how fundamental breathing is to life. And when somebody's saying, I cannot breathe, and they have passed out, and you're aware that they don't even have a pulse, even a nine-year-old little girl knows it. Get off of them. That's all you needed to know uh, in that case. You, um, just a couple more of these, because I can't even uh, do them all, because there were so many. This concern that George Floyd would somehow come to again. He would come back around again. And they'll say, not with, we didn't really mean superhuman strength, except maybe we really did mean superhuman strength, because he's got all this extra strength now, and he's going to do dastardly things. Now, we heard from three medical examiners, ladies and gentlemen, three of them. Between the three of them, they probably have done close to 15,000 autopsies. And not a single one of them testified about one instance ever where somebody who didn't even have a pulse somehow spontaneously came back to life, broke handcuffs, and rampaged the city. It's the facts of this case, not some other thing. Mr. Floyd didn't even have a pulse. That didn't justify keeping your knee on his neck when you should have been administering CPR when you could have brought him back to life again because you're afraid that he would come to with no pulse and rampage the city. That's the sort of thing you see in Halloween movies ladies and gentlemen, not in real life, not in real life. The idea that Mr. Floyd uh, suffered from a sudden death, which is what Dr. Fowler was saying. Now he'll say that Mr. Floyd had a fatal arrhythmia in the end. That's misleading in a way because as you've heard from doctor after doctor, ultimately everybody dies in the end of a fatal arrhythmia. 
Everybody dies of cardiopulmonary arrest, the heart stops and the lung stops. And then the last thing that happens is, bloop, you get an arrhythmia and then that's it. Now, is there any evidence that there was an arrhythmia as the primary cause of his death, unrelated to the subdual restraint and neck compression on the ground? Zero. There was zero evidence that he had a heart attack. Zero. In fact, his heart was in such normal condition that Dr. Baker, during the autopsy, didn't even have a need to photograph it intact uh, because it was so normal. Now, Dr. Rich um, did not say uh, anything akin to George Floyd having a normal heart. That's not what he said. What he said was that he had a strong heart. He had a strong heart. And what he meant by that is that he sees uh, patients all the time who may be uh, in need of transplants, who have serious cardiac disease, and they can't even get a normal blood pressure. And he talked to you about how uh, George Floyd, having lived with this for some time, explains how it is that his body and its, uh, the uh, arteries that serve the heart um, were able to uh, compensate uh, in the case of Mr. Floyd, and uh, such that uh, he did not die of a fatal arrhythmia, and there's no evidence that he died of any, any kind of a heart abnormality. Just uh, two more of these are things I just want to clarify. There was a lot of uh, discussion uh, during the, about the police conduct. The situations can change rapidly from moment to moment. And, and on this, I don't want you at all to lose sight of, again, the facts here. Uh, that for the nine minutes and 29 seconds, the problem was there was nothing moving or changing, no matter what. Whether Mr. Floyd was calling out for his life, whether he was motionless uh, with an anoxic seizure, um, whether he had no pulse. There was no movement, no split second decisions, no moment to moment. Um, to the extent you're hearing that as representative of this case, it is not representative of this case, does not meet the facts of this case um, at all. So the fact of the matter is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Use of unreasonable force, the unreasonable use of force, is an assault. Uh, here it was an assault and it contributed to the death of, uh, of Mr. Floyd. Now you were told with respect to the law that the state needs to show that Mr. Chauvin intended to act unlawfully or to break the law. Look at your instructions, that's not accurate. Uh, we will, in fact, and we own our burden of showing that he, in fact, acted unlawfully, but not having to prove that he intended to act unlawfully. We need only to show that he intended to do what he did, which was to put the knee on the neck, the knee on the back, and against the shoulder, that it wasn't an accident, and that we will show. Um, and we own that burden. So there really aren't two sides to the story about whether this use of force was unreasonable. It was not authorized by uh, the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, the pressure on Mr. Floyd's uh, neck uh, did affect his ability to breathe. And I know that you were told when Mr. Nelson was just here that this was not a, a choke, uh, it was not a chokehold, and that uh, Donald Williams had uh, suggested or so testified. And if you remember that testimony, Donald Williams disagreed with him every time and said that was in fact a chokehold, uh, even on the one side, and he explained how that even works. And, uh, and while Mr. Nelson quibbled with him, Donald Williams never gave that up uh, in his testimony. So there aren't two sides to the story as to the, unus uh, the unreasonable use of force. And when Mr. Floyd is saying, please, please, I can't breathe 27 times, in just a few minutes. You saw it when Mr. Chauvin did not let up and we didn't get up. Even when he, when he passed out, not breathing anymore, he doesn't let up or get up. 
When he knows he doesn't have a pulse, he doesn't let up or get up. Even when the ambulance comes, he doesn't let up or get up even then. They have to come up and tap him before he will let up and get up off the body of Mr. George Floyd. And they try to resuscitate him uh, in, the, in the ambulance, and they never do. Uh, he never regains consciousness. He never breathes again. His heart never pumps again. And uh, Mr. George Floyd was uh, deceased. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, I will sit down in a minute, but I wanted to save till the end what I thought was the biggest shading of the truth or what I call story. You'll disregard the phrase shading the truth. Well, here's what I thought then was the largest de de departure from here are the evidence. I'll show it to you. You were told, um, for example, that Mr. Floyd died, that Mr. Floyd died because his heart was too big. You heard that testimony. And now having seen all the evidence, having heard all the evidence, you know the truth. And the truth of the matter is that the reason George Floyd is dead is because Mr. Chauvin's heart was too small. The jury could grab your instructions again and turn to page 11. Members of the jury, if you have any question about any part of the testimony or any legal question after you have retired for your deliberation, please address it to me in writing and give it to the sheriff's deputy with the juror number of your foreperson on the note. It will take some time to answer any questions because I will have to consult with the lawyers and receive their input before answering your question. I do not say this to discourage questions, but only to advise you that it will take some time to provide you with an answer. As I told you, you will take with you into the jury room copies of the instructions that I am reading to you. The lawyers and I have determined that these instructions contain all the laws that are necessary for you to know in order to decide the case. I cannot give you a trial transcript. No such transcript exists. We count on the jury to rely on its collective memory. You have been allowed to take notes during the trial, and you may take those notes with you into the jury room. You should not consider those notes binding or conclusive, whether they are your notes or those of another juror. The notes should be used as an aid to your memory and not as a substitute for it. It is your recollection of the evidence that should control. You should disregard anything contrary to your recollection that may appear from your own notes or those of another juror. You should not give any greater weight to a particular piece of evidence solely because it is referred to in a note taken by a juror. Now, we all have feelings, assumptions, perceptions, fears, and stereotypes about others. Some biases we are aware of, and others we might not be fully aware, aware of, which is why they are called implicit or unconscious biases. No matter how unbiased we think we are, our brains are hardwired to make unconscious decisions. We look at others and filter what they say through the lens of our own personal experience and background. Because we all do this, we often see life and evaluate evidence in a way that tends to favor people who are like ourselves or who have had life experiences like our own. We can also have biases about people like ourselves. One common example is the automatic association of male with career and female with family. Bias can affect our thoughts, how we remember what we see and hear, whom we believe or disbelieve, and how we make important decisions. As jurors, you are being asked to make an important decision in this case. You must, one, take the time you need to reflect carefully and thoughtfully about the evidence. Two, think about why you are making the decision you are making and examine it for bias. Reconsider your first impressions of the people and the evidence in this case. If the people involved in this case were from different backgrounds, for example, richer or poorer, more or less educated, older or younger, or of a different gender, gender identity, race, 
religion or sexual orientation, would you still view them and the evidence the same way? Three, listen to one another. You must carefully evaluate the evidence and resist and help each other resist any urge to reach a verdict influenced by bias for or against any party or witness. Each of you have different backgrounds and will be viewing this case in light of your own insights, assumptions, and biases. Listening to different perspectives may help you to better identify the possible effects these hidden biases may have on decision making. And four, resist, re resist jumping to conclusions based on personal likes or dislikes, generalizations, gut feelings, prejudices, sympathies, stereotypes, or unconscious biases. The law demands that you make a fair decision based solely on the evidence, your individual evaluations of that evidence, your reason and common sense, and these instructions. When you return to the jury room to discuss this case, you must select a jury member to be foreperson. That person will lead your deliberations. In order for you to return a verdict, whether guilty or not guilty, each juror must agree with that verdict. Your verdict must be unanimous. You should discuss this case with one another and deliberate with a view towards reaching agreement if you, can, if you can do so without violating your individual judgment. You should decide the case for yourself, but only after you have discussed the case with your fellow jurors and have carefully considered their views. You should not hesitate to re-examine your views and change your opinion if you become convinced they are erroneous. But you should not surrender your honest opinion simply because other jurors disagree or merely, or merely to reach a verdict. Now, a single verdict form for each count has been prepared for you, your use, and when you have finished your deliberations and have reached a verdict as to a specific count, the foreperson should mark the appropriate choice on the form with an X and then date and sign the verdict form, filling in the foreperson's juror number on the indicated line and then signing the foreperson's name on the second line. And just so you know, the forms look like this. <laughs> So there's very little to add, just an X, your juror number of the foreperson, and the foreperson signature. The order in which the guilty and not guilty choices appear on the verdict forms is strictly alphabetical and should not in any way be considered as indicating which choice is the correct choice. When all the verdict forms are completed, the forms should be placed in the provided envelope, sealed and given to the deputy who will convey the verdicts to the court. At a time designated by the court, your verdict will be read out loud in the courtroom in your presence. During your deliberations, you must not let bias, prejudice, passion, sympathy, or public opinion influence your decision. You must not consider any consequences or penalties that might follow from your verdict. You must not be biased in favor of or against any party or witness. All right, we've been listening to because Judge Peter K. Hill in Hennepin County, gender, Minneapolis race, religion, courtroom there, uh, the trial of Derek Chauvin. If you've been watching, we were listening before that to Jerry Blackwell with his final rebuttal to the defense. He's a prosecution attorney uh, rebutting the defense. Uh, he argued essentially that Chauvin's actions were a substantial cause of George Floyd's death. Let's bring in civil rights lawyer and former prosecutor David Henderson, who's been with us watching all of this. Uh, the prosecution gets the last word here. Absolutely, Kate. And I think what you said is exactly right. They get the chance to remind the jurors what they're here to do. You typically want to realize jurors have their minds made up by this point in the trial. You're just trying to arm those who are on your side with what they need to go back there and fight for you in the jury room. And the most important thing the prosecutor reassured the jury is that whereas all the bystanders were helpless, even hopeless, they have the ability to enact positive change. And that's what's needed with the outcome in this trial. Danny Savalas is with us as well. Uh, from a defense point of view, what are you hoping happens in that jury room now? If you're the defendant, you're hoping that there, you have at least one juror who's going to act as your advocate, who's going to go into that room and, and likely is not defense counsel. We can't see that, but 
throughout the trial, defense counsel may have already picked out one or two jurors to essentially present his case to, hoping they will go in and have the courage to act as advocates for his position, keeping in mind that as long as that person stays steadfast, they may be able to get one juror, and even if only one, that could be enough. Danny, thank you. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has been following this trial all along. He joins us from outside the county courthouse, Hennepin County. Uh, Gabe, this is such an anticipated day. Uh, we have no sense how long this jury will deliberate, right? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right, Kate. And within the past few seconds, two jurors have now just been dismissed. Those were the two alternates. So now 12 jurors will decide Derek Chauvin's fate. And as you mentioned, Kate, this is very highly anticipated here in Minneapolis. Already I can see some demonstrators beginning to gather here. There is another demonstration scheduled here for later on this evening. And Minneapolis, as well as many other cities across the country, are watching this very closely. Some 3,000 National Guard troops are activated here in Minnesota. It has been eerie to drive around the downtown area here in Minneapolis with businesses boarded up, police precincts uh, in razor wire, certainly something that this entire city and the entire country is watching, Kate. Indeed, the entire world. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. That concludes our NBC News special coverage of the closing arguments of the trial of Derek Chauvin. The case now in the hands of the jury, which must sequester during deliberations. We will have much more this evening on NBC Nightly News. I'm Kate Snow. Thank you for watching.